Flatlantis by Eric Dubé. From the beginning of recorded history, and for thousands upon thousands of years, cultures across the entire world all believed the Earth was flat. Their various cosmologies and cosmogenies differed in slight ways, but their overall geographies and astronomies were incredibly consistent and in fact virtually identical. The Earth was a stationary plane, void of any motion or curvature, flat across its entire expanse, except of course for hills, mountains, and valleys. The North Pole was the magnetic monopole center point of the flat Earth, with Polaris, the North Pole Star, situated directly above. Polaris was the only motionless star in the heavens, with all the other constellations revolving perfect circles over the Earth every night. The stars were divided into two categories, known as the fixed stars and the wandering stars. The fixed stars were so-called because they were observed then, as we can observe today, to stay fixed in their constellation patterns night after night, year after year, century after century, never changing their relative positions. The wandering stars, what are today referred to as planets, were so called because they were observed then, as we can observe today, to wander the heavens, taking their own unique spirograph-like patterns, making both forward and retrograde motions over and around the Earth during their cycles. The sun and moon were both of equal size, and they too revolved over and around the motionless earth, as immortalized in the Chinese yin-yang symbol. The sun and moon were much closer to earth than supposed nowadays, and each shined with their own unique opposite lights, the suns being warm, golden, drying, preservative, and antiseptic, and the moon's light being cold, silver, damp, putrefying, and septic. The sun and moon, as though connected to a magnetic maypole, made alternating spiral journeys over and around the Earth every year. The sun began its journey at the Tropic of Capricorn, at the winter solstice, where it made its fastest and largest circle over the Earth. For the next three months, every day the sun slightly narrowed its path and slowed its speed until by the spring equinox the sun had spiraled its way from the Tropic of Capricorn to the equator. Then for the next three months, again, every day, the sun continued to slightly narrow its path and slow its speed until the summer solstice, when the sun made its smallest, slowest circle around the Tropic of Cancer. Once the sun reached this innermost circle, like the ribbons and dancers around the maypole, the sun would then begin its opposing, widening, quickening journey back to the Tropic of Capricorn. For the next three months, Every day, the sun slightly widened its path and hastened its speed until the autumnal equinox, the sun had spiraled its way from the Tropic of Cancer back to the equator. Then for the next three months again, every day, the sun continued to slightly widen its path and hasten its speed until the winter solstice, when the sun made its largest, fastest circle around the Tropic of Capricorn, and the annual journey began again. The moon had a similar yearly path revolving over and around the earth, but unlike the sun, which constantly changed its speed to keep a consistent 24-hour day, the moon's speed never changed, so depending on its latitude, the moon was observed then, as we can observe today, to take approximately 24.7 to 25 hours per cycle. This is why at different times and places during each month, we can see the moon in the morning, afternoon, or night. This is also the origin of old fairy tales, such as the hare and the hedgehog, or the tortoise and the hare. The hare, like the sun, begins the annual race full of energy, excitement, and ego, declaring himself the definite winner, and gets off to an immediate head start. Meanwhile, equally confident in his seemingly lesser abilities, the humble, slow, and steady tortoise moon begins as well, allowing the hare to lead. As the race carries on, the cocky hare tires and slows down, or takes a nap, at which point the tortoise overtakes him. This is analogous to the moon reaching the Tropic of Cancer before the sun each year, and beginning its return journey. When the hare reaches this halfway point of the race, he realizes his lackluster attitude has resulted in being overtaken by the slower tortoise, and begins to speed up again. Then, for the remainder of the race, the sun picks up speed day by day, gaining on the moon, 
but ultimately losing as the slow and steady tortoise reaches the finish line before the hare and wins. So for ancient man, Earth and Polaris were the two immovable center points of the universe around which the sun, moon, and other stars all revolved in a dome-like shape. Some cultures believed in a literal, physical, solid dome or firmament to which the fixed stars were bound. Other cultures mythologized the Axis Mundi as the world tree with Polaris at the center and all the other constellations forming the branches. In these flat earth depictions, the North Pole occupied the center point, and south was all straight lines extending outwards from there. East and west were not straight lines, as is assumed nowadays, but were in fact circles, just like all lines of latitude and the paths of the celestial bodies. The southern circumference of Earth was surrounded by a gigantic wall of ice, 150 to 200 feet above sea level, holding the interconnected oceans in like a world cup. Beyond the ice wall, some cultures claimed a firm barrier existed through which no human could penetrate. Other cultures believed there were entire worlds and other civilizations existing beyond the Antarctic ice. Currently, and for the past half century, there has existed an international Antarctic treaty preventing all independent exploration of Antarctica. Pre-approved guided tours exist which take visitors to a few coastal regions of Antarctica, but no independent exploration of the continent is allowed. Sailors like Jarl Andhoy have been caught attempting to explore Antarctica and threatened, turned around at gunpoint, fined, and jailed for violating this militarily enforced international treaty. As a result, the public currently has no way to confirm or deny the seemingly fantastical claims of ancient man concerning what may or may not exist at the southernmost extremities of the earth. We can, however, confirm that this 200-foot ice wall surrounding the southern circumference of the Earth most certainly exists. We can confirm that Polaris is indeed the only non-moving star in the sky. All the fixed stars indeed rotate perfect circles around Polaris while remaining stuck in their relative constellations night after night, year after year, century after century. The wandering stars, or planets, do indeed wander the heavens, taking their own unique spirograph-like paths when charted from a geocentric perspective. The sun and moon are indeed observably of equal size and revolve over and around us in daily cycles. Just as the ancients observed, the sun's annual path does indeed travel from the Tropic of Capricorn at the winter solstice to the equator at spring equinox, to the Tropic of Cancer at the summer solstice, back to the equator at autumnal equinox, and finally, back to the Tropic of Cancer at winter solstice. The sun's light is indeed warm, golden, drying, preservative, and antiseptic, while the moon's light is indeed cold, silver, damp, putrefying, and septic. A thermometer placed in the sun's light will always read warmer than a thermometer placed in the sun's shade, while a thermometer placed in the moon's light will always read cooler than a thermometer placed in the moon's shade. Plant and animal substances exposed to sunlight quickly dry, shrink, coagulate, and lose their tendency to decompose and putrefy, whereas plant and animal substances exposed to moonlight will quickly show symptoms of putrefaction and decay. Last but not least, just as the ancients espoused, the earth is observably motionless to all our senses, and the horizon remains perfectly flat as far as the eye can see. Not only does the horizon remain perfectly flat, 360 degrees around the observer, but whether at sea level, the top of Mount Everest, 35,000 feet high in an airplane, or even at over 100,000 feet high, the highest any amateur hot air balloon has ever flown, the flat horizon actually rises to the eye level of the observer all the way up. On a globular Earth, no matter how large it is assumed to be, the horizon would remain where it was, and the rising observer would have to tilt his head downwards further and further the higher they rose to see the steadily falling horizon. Many people will be shocked to know that to this day, every single scientific experiment ever devised to show the alleged motion of the earth has failed to do so, or, given evidence of the opposite, that the earth is indeed motionless, and every attempt ever made to measure the alleged curvature of the earth has failed to do so, or, given evidence of the opposite, that the Earth is indeed flat. 
The first person in recorded history to ever claim that Earth was anything but the flat, motionless center of the universe was a Greek mathematician and philosopher named Pythagoras of Samos, around 500 BC. Interestingly enough, Pythagoras has also been touted by Freemasonic historians such as Albert Mackey, James Anderson, William Hutchinson, and William Preston as being the very first Freemason. Presented more as a thought experiment than a complete cosmology, Pythagoras posited that if the Earth were a spherical globe turning on its vertical axis once per day while revolving annually around a stationary sun, that this model could also equally explain the cyclical motions of the heavenly bodies. This heliocentric model was taught to initiates at Pythagoras's Cretona school, but never became popular or had an influence outside of Greece for another 2,000 years. A century later, another Greek mathematician and philosopher named Plato also espoused a spherical Earth cosmology, except he claimed the Earth globe to be the motionless center of the universe, with the sun, moon, and stars revolving around. His most famous student, Aristotle, also wrote about this geocentric globe-Earth cosmology in his book On the Heavens, offering three main points of evidence for his theory. Firstly, Aristotle noted that when sailing away from an observer on shore, ships approaching the horizon disappeared from view hull before masthead, and he postulated that this occurrence was due to the curvature of the Earth. Aristotle argued that the hull disappeared first because beyond the horizon, the globe Earth curved downwards, causing the hull and eventually the masthead and entire ship to drop below the curvature. Today, we can easily prove that Aristotle was incorrect in his assumption by using telescopes, binoculars, and zoom cameras. Once a ship has completely disappeared beyond the horizon, modern technology allows us to zoom in and bring the entire vessel, hull and all, back into full view. This proves that ships do not disappear hull first due to the alleged curvature of the Earth, and that the horizon line is in fact merely the vanishing point of perspective from a given observer's point of view, and not, as Aristotle supposed, the beginning of the Earth's curvature. The horizon is subjective, and varies in distance depending on the weather, the observer's height, and the strength of his eyesight or instruments. As noted previously, the horizon actually rises to the eye of the observer no matter how high he climbs, which also proves that the horizon line is not some objective point of curvature on a convex earth, but rather the subjective vanishing point of perspective from a given observer's point of view. Aristotle's second point of evidence offered for his spherical earth theory was the earth's round shadow cast on the moon during lunar eclipses. To this day, heliocentrists still offer this argument as proof of a spherical Earth, claiming that during lunar eclipses, the Sun, Earth, and Moon align in a perfect 180-degree syzygy like three billiard balls, causing the Sun to cast the Earth's shadow onto the Moon. This clever but faulty assumption is rendered completely invalid, however, due to the fact that lunar eclipses have happened and continue to happen regularly when both the Sun and Moon are still visible together above the horizon. As early as the time of Pliny the Elder, there are records of eclipses happening while both the Sun and Moon were visible in the sky and continue to be recorded by the Royal Astronomical Society today. Obviously, if the sun and moon are both observable simultaneously during an eclipse, then they are not aligned in a 180-degree syzygy, and it is therefore impossible that the sun could be casting Earth's shadow on the moon, and some other explanation must be sought. Another explanation, in fact, already existed in many cultures around the world, who posited that a third celestial body known as Rahu, or the black sun, also existed equal in size to the sun and moon. This translucent dark body passed affront the sun and moon during solar and lunar eclipses, causing their lights to dim. Aristotle's final point of evidence offered for his spherical Earth theory was the appearance of Polaris and other stars to gradually decline overhead as an observer travels southwards. He argued that the gradual declination and eventual disappearance beyond the horizon of certain stars and constellations as one traveled southwards was evidence that the observer was traveling over a convex curved surface. Similar to the ships disappearing over the horizon argument, Aristotle posited that the horizon line was the literal curvature of his spherical Earth, and the stars which declined and disappeared beyond it became invisible because a mass of curved earth existed between them and the observer. 
In actual fact, however, the gradual declination of objects in the sky towards the horizon is merely a product of the law of perspective on plane surfaces. As any art student of point perspective knows, the human eye views the world in a pyramidal shape so that when looking down a long hallway, the floor appears to rise, the ceiling appears to sink, and the walls appear to narrow into a point at the center of the observer's view. Of course, the dimensions of the hallway remain constant for its entire length. The floor does not actually rise, the ceiling does not actually sink, nor do the walls actually close in, but to the human eye, everything is perceived this way. Similarly, when the sun, moon, airplanes, or clouds appear to sink towards the horizon as they move away from us, they are not actually losing altitude and slowly approaching sea level. They are in fact maintaining the same altitude, except they are moving away from you, and so the law of perspective makes them appear to sink. A century after Aristotle, around 250 BC, yet another Greek mathematician and philosopher named Eratosthenes made his claim to fame with a new alleged proof of the spherical earth. Eratosthenes noted that at noon during the summer solstice at Sayen, the sun cast no shadow and the rays could reach straight to the bottom of his well. Yet meanwhile, in Alexandria, a vertically standing metal rod cast a significant shadow. By factoring the length of the shadow with his assumed distance to the sun, Eratosthenes recorded a measurement of Earth's circumference close to what heliocentrist astronomers still use today. The fact of the matter is, however, that Eratosthenes' calculations were made assuming the sun to be millions of miles away so that its rays would fall perfectly parallel even in points as divergent as Cyan and Alexandria. This faulty premise led to his faulty conclusion, which was eventually exposed upon the invention of the nautical sextant. Using sextants and plane trigonometry, by measuring the sun's angle at two points on Earth simultaneously and factoring their distance from each other, the Pythagorean theorem reveals both the height and dimensions of the sun. Using this method, the sun and moon have repeatedly been calculated to be approximately 32 miles in diameter, 3,000 miles from the surface of the Earth. High-altitude balloon footage has also filmed lighting hotspots on clouds, proving the sun to be local and acting as a spotlight, and not a burning ball of gas millions of miles away, as supposed by heliocentrists. After Eratosthenes, the globe-earth theory completely disappeared from philosophical thought and recorded history for almost two millennia. Geocentric flat-earth cosmologies continued to reign supreme, with even Eratosthenes himself touted as the father of geography, depicting the earth as flat in his famous 194 BC map of the world. Crates of Malice invented the first model globe-earth around this time as well, but it failed to have any effect on the world at large. Fast forward to 1522 AD, Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan became the first person in known history to successfully sail around the world. This circumnavigation of Earth soon became and continues to be touted today as absolute proof of the spherical Earth theory. If Magellan was able to sail east to west around the entire world and return to his original starting point, surely the Earth cannot be flat and must be a globe, right? Wrong. Just as a compass can place its center point on a flat piece of paper, trace a circle either way around, and return to its original starting point, so can a ship or plane circumnavigate a flat earth. The only kind of circumnavigation which could not happen on a flat earth is north-south bound, which to this day has still never been done. Both the North Pole and Antarctica are military-enforced no-fly and no-sail zones due to restrictions originating from none other than the United Nations, the same United Nations that haughtily uses a flat Earth map in their official logo and flag. In 1543, just days before his death, Freemason and Jesuit Nicholas Copernicus published his book On the Revolutions of the Celestial Spheres, which revived the old heliocentric cosmology of Pythagoras and began the so-called Copernican Revolution away from a flat geocentric model and towards a global heliocentric model. Since his book claimed Earth to be a tilting, wobbling, spinning sphere revolving at breakneck speeds around a stationary sun, it was initially met with due incredulity. Copernicus always countered this by claiming his theories were merely hypotheses and shouldn't be considered truth. In his book, he even wrote, quote, 
The Pythagorean teaching was founded upon hypothesis, and it is not necessary that the hypothesis should be true, or even probable. The hypothesis of the movement of the earth is only one which is useful to explain phenomena, but it should not be considered as an absolute truth. Contemporaries of Copernicus, such as Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe, famously argued against his heliocentric model, positing that if the Earth revolved in an orbit around the Sun, the change in relative position of the stars after six months of orbital motion could not fail to be seen. Brahe wrote that the stars should seem to separate as we approach and come together as we recede. In actual fact, however, after millions of miles of supposed orbit around the sun, not a single inch of parallax could be detected in the stars. As even Wikipedia notes, quote, the lack of any observable parallax was considered a fatal flaw in any non-geocentric theory. Copernicus's answer to this obvious problem was simple. He moved the stars so ridiculously far away from the Earth that even after millions of miles of supposed orbit around the sun, no appreciable parallax could be detected. Copernicus simply needed to claim that the stars were trillions upon trillions of miles away, so then, mathematically speaking, it would indeed be impossible to detect such slight parallax. Again, contemporaries of Copernicus argued against this convenient correction of his, arguing, quite rightly, that if the stars were trillions of miles away, then there is no way we could see them. Backpedaling once again, Copernicus claimed the reason we could still see stars trillions of miles away was because they were not mere tiny points of translucent light in the night sky, but that stars were in fact gigantic gas balls billions of times larger than our sun. So first, Copernicus had to move the stars trillions of miles from Earth to explain away lack of parallax, and then he had to make the stars billions of times larger to account for why we should see them at all from such fantastical distances. Lastly, he offered very specific distances and mathematical equations to solidify his theory, claiming, for instance, that he had accurately calculated the sun's distance from Earth to be exactly 3,391,200 miles. At the turn of the 17th century, Tycho Brahe, under the patronage of Emperor Rudolf II, began construction of the largest, most state-of-the-art astronomical observatory ever built. Upon hearing this, German astronomer and Freemason Johannes Kepler was determined to apprentice under Brahe. Even though Kepler championed Copernicus's widely disputed heliocentric globe-earth theory, Brahe begrudgingly accepted Kepler as his apprentice based on his merit as an astute astronomer and mathematician. Brahe allowed Kepler access to the observatory, but guarded his data and findings from him completely, which frustrated and angered Kepler to the point of eventually culminating in a heated argument between the two of them, resulting in Brahe kicking Kepler out. After much amends and apologizing, a year later, Brahe finally forgave Kepler and accepted him back as apprentice. This time, however, Kepler was not content with his role as mere apprentice, and soon proposed and secured a commissioned position on Brahe and Emperor Rudolf's new project, the Rudolphine Astronomical Tables. Less than a month later, Tycho Brahe mysteriously dropped dead, and Johannes Kepler was given access to all of Brahe's coveted data, free reign of the observatory, and became Emperor Rudolf's new official astronomer. Abundant circumstantial evidence and obvious motive have long fed speculation that Kepler actually murdered Brahe. Brahe was only 54 years old and in fine health when suddenly he became deathly ill and passed away. His official cause of death was reported as a bladder infection, but subsequent autopsies of his body revealed toxic quantities of mercury present on his mustache hairs, which has led many researchers to conclude he was poisoned. The 2004 book, Heavenly Intrigue, suggested that Kepler had indeed murdered Brahe to gain access to his data. Kepler himself never denied this, and he actually wrote, quote, I confess that when Tycho died, I quickly took advantage of the absence, or lack of circumspection, of the heirs by taking the observations under my care, or perhaps usurping them. And so, for the remainder of his life, Kepler worked at Brahe's observatory for Brahe's employer, using Brahe's data to further his Copernican theories, which Brahe had always criticized. He modified Copernicus's calculations of celestial motions, changing them from perfect circles to irregular ellipses, and even formulated a new, updated distance of the sun from Earth. 
while Copernicus had claimed positively the sun to be 3,391,200 miles from Earth, Kepler assured the astronomical community that his new figure of 12,376,800 miles was the true distance. A few years later, in 1608, the first telescope was invented, and by 1609, the next champion of Copernicanism, Italian astronomer, Freemason, and probable Jesuit Galileo Galilei, had purchased and built several of them. Galileo improved upon the telescope's design, boosting the zoom capabilities from the original three times up to thirty times magnification, and in 1610 made the most important alleged discovery of his career. With his thirty-time zoom telescope, Galileo claimed to have seen what he described as, quote, three fixed stars, totally invisible by their smallness, all close to Jupiter, and lying on a straight line through it. After tracking these invisible stars for a while, and noticing they appeared sometimes but not others, Galileo concluded that when he could not find them, they must be hiding behind Jupiter, and therefore they must not be invisible stars at all, but rather invisible moons orbiting Jupiter. His alleged discovery of moons orbiting Jupiter was then touted as proof of the Copernican system, claiming that Earth must be a planet like Jupiter since both have orbiting moons. To this day, NASA claims to have special telescopes which can, on occasion, see these moons of Jupiter, just as Galileo claimed in his day to see, on occasion, with his special telescopes. Nowadays, with modern telescopes and zoom technology, we can see the celestial bodies far closer and with far more clarity than Galileo could have ever hoped for. A 2016 Nikon P900 has 83 times optical zoom and 332 times digital capabilities, which put Galilean telescopes to shame. Yet even with this level of magnification, Galileo's alleged invisible stars orbiting Jupiter are nowhere to be found. Galileo and his fellow Mason predecessors, acting more like true believers of their heliocentric faith than legitimate scientists, were constantly guilty of inventing elaborate theories to support their foregone conclusion. This was never more evident than when Galileo presented his theory on the cause of tides in 1616. Cardinal Bellarmine had written Galileo the year before, stating that, quote, the Copernican system could not be defended without a true physical demonstration that the sun does not circle the earth, but the earth circles the sun. Taking this to heart, Galileo hoped to show that the earth's tides were caused by the sloshing back and forth of water as a point on earth's surface sped up and slowed down due to earth's alleged rotation on axis and revolution around the sun. He argued that these hypothetical motions of his globular earth were the cause of tides, and therefore the tides themselves were proof of Earth's motion. Unfortunately for Galileo, his ideas were not accepted and easily proven wrong by his contemporaries, who rightly pointed out that if his theory were correct, there would only be one high tide per day. Not only this, but if tides were caused by Earth's alleged motion, all lakes, ponds, and other inland bodies of water should be similarly affected, yet they are not. The next champion of heliocentricism was English mathematician and astronomer, knighted Freemason and Royal Society President Sir Isaac Newton. In 1687, Newton published his famous Principia Mathematica, which presented his idea of gravity to the world. The globe earth theory had long faced criticism for being impractical due to the natural physics of spinning spherical objects, namely that anything placed on their surface should immediately fall or fly off. How could people, buildings, and the great oceans remain perfectly stuck to a ball earth spinning faster than the speed of sound? The globe earth theory needed a force that could keep everything in place somehow, a force strong enough to keep the oceans stuck to the earth, but weak enough not to sink a sailboat, a force strong enough to drag the entire atmosphere along with earth's breakneck speed, but weak enough to allow birds and bugs to travel freely and unabated in all directions. A force so strong it could make rain fall upwards and plants grow upside down, but yet so weak that it could not be detected by any contemporary methods. Newton's postulate of, quote, an invisible force able to act over vast distances led to him being heavily criticized for, quote, introducing occult agencies into the field of science. Previous to Newton's theory of universal gravitation, 
The natural laws of density and buoyancy already perfectly and adequately explained the world around us. For example, the reason a balloon filled with helium rises into the sky while a balloon filled with air drops to the ground is not because Newton's mystical pulling force has an aversion to helium, but rather simply because helium is lighter and less dense than the nitrogen, oxygen, and other elements which compose the air around it, so it floats up. And conversely, a balloon filled with your carbon dioxide exhalation is heavier and denser than the air around it, so it falls down to the ground. If you blow a dandelion seed out of your hands, a substance just barely heavier than the air, it will float away and slowly but eventually fall to the ground. If you drop an anvil from your hands, something much heavier than the air, it will quickly and directly fall straight to the ground. This is not because gravity prefers anvils to dandelion seeds, but rather because it is the natural physics of buoyancy for objects less dense than the medium surrounding them to rise, while objects denser than the medium surrounding them to sink. This is the reason raindrops fall down through the air, and air bubbles rise up through the water, because of their relative densities. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the mystical pulling force of spinning balls from Newton's imagination. Newton's theory allegedly began when, upon seeing an apple fall from a tree at Woolsthorpe, as though no one in the history of humanity up to that point had ever seen a falling object and wondered why it fell, he had a veritable scientific epiphany. The apple fell not because it was heavier and denser than the air around it, but rather because a force at the center of the spinning ball earth pulled it to the ground. Newton quickly got to work formulating his theory of universal gravitation, which he used to explain not only falling objects, but also orbiting celestial bodies. Newton claimed that the sun, moon, earth, planets, and stars, gravity, caused them to all orbit around the most massive nearby bodies. So not only was gravity fickle and selective about which objects it caused to fall and which it allowed to rise, gravity was also able to perform different functions on different scales. At the human scale, gravity allegedly caused people, buildings, and oceans to stick to the Earth, while at the planetary scale, gravity allegedly caused moons to orbit around planets, and planets to orbit around stars. Unfortunately, Newton never addressed this, but the question remains, how and why would gravity cause both planets to orbit the Sun and people to stick to the Earth? Gravity should either cause people to float around in suspended circular orbits around the Earth, or it should cause the Earth, Moon, and planets to all be pulled and crash into the Sun. The two effects are very different, yet the same cause is attributed to both. Furthermore, this magnetic-like attraction of massive objects gravity is purported to have can be found nowhere in the natural world. There is no example in nature of a massive sphere or any other shaped object which, by virtue of its mass alone, causes smaller objects to stick to or orbit around it. There is nothing on Earth massive enough that it can be shown to cause even a dust bunny to stick to or orbit around it. Try spinning a wet tennis ball or any other spherical object with smaller things placed on its surface, and you will find that everything falls or flies off, and nothing sticks to or orbits around it. To claim the existence of a physical law without a single practical evidential example is hearsay, not science. By now, however, you are likely beginning to see that these Freemasonic heliocentric priests are less interested in science and truth than they are in propagating contrived evidences for their foregone conclusions. In like manner, as Copernicus had claimed positively the sun to be 3,391,200 miles away, and Kepler had calculated it to be positively 12,376,800 miles away, Newton was quoted as remarking, it matters not whether we reckon it 28 or 54 million miles distant, for either would do just as well. It appears he was correct, because the alleged distance to the heliocentrist sun has continued to increase by the millions until today, where we stand with NASA's current official figure of 93 million miles. In 1773, Captain Cook became the first modern explorer known to have breached the Antarctic Circle and reached the ice barrier. This expedition offered an exciting chance to find proof of either the flat or globe earth models because Captain Cook intended to sail completely around Antarctica looking for inlets through the ice wall. If the earth was indeed a globe 25,000 miles in equatorial circumference, as the heliocentrists claimed, then a complete circumnavigation of Antarctica would be approximately 12,000 miles. 
and, if the Earth was flat, with Antarctica surrounding the entire circumference, a complete circumnavigation of Antarctica would have to take over 50,000 miles. During three voyages lasting three years and eight days, Captain Cook and his crew sailed a total of 60,000 miles along the Antarctic coastline, never once finding an inlet or path through or beyond the massive glacial wall. Captain Cook wrote, The ice extended east and west far beyond the reach of our sight, while the southern half of the ocean was illuminated by rays of light which were reflected from the ice to a considerable height. Later voyages by Captain James Clark Ross and Captain George Nares in the 19th century further confirmed Cook's findings. Ross's expedition spent four years and five months in heavily armored warships failing to find an entry point beyond the southern glacial wall, and Nares spent over three years circumnavigating Antarctica, taking an admittedly indirect course, but clocking in nearly 69,000 miles total. If Antarctica truly was the tiny ice continent claimed by globe Earth proponents, all of these expeditions would have ended years sooner. In addition to this, many Antarctic explorers, including Captain James Clark Ross and Lieutenant Charles Wilkes, using globe Earth projection maps, wrote in their journals perplexed at how they routinely found themselves out of accordance with their charts, stating that they found themselves an average of 12 to 16 miles outside their reckoning every day later on further south, increasing to as much as 29 miles per day. These huge discrepancies experienced by explorers the further south traveled are usually attributed to increasingly strong storms, winds, and currents, but if that were the case, they should have just as often found themselves ahead of their reckoning, which they never did. In 1783, the hot air balloon was invented, and for the first time in recorded history, people were able to float miles above the Earth's surface and see for themselves once and for all whether or not the Earth was flat or a globe. To many people's astonishment, as high as they rose, the horizon remained perfectly flat 360 degrees around them and rose to the level of their eyes all the way up. J. Glacier wrote in his Travels in the Air that, quote, on looking over the top of the car, the horizon appeared to be on level with the eye, and taking a grand view of the whole visible area beneath, I was struck with its great regularity. All was dwarfed to one plane. It seemed too flat. M. Victor Emmanuel, another hot air balloonist, wrote that, quote, Instead of the earth declining from the view on either side, and the higher part being under the car as is popularly supposed, it was the exact opposite the lowest part like a huge basin being immediately under the car, and the horizon on all sides rising to the level of the eye. As stated previously, this is only possible on a flat plane. It would be an entire century after Newton published his theories on gravitation before any scientific experiment was devised to attempt to prove its existence. In 1797, Henry Cavendish, the British scientist, Freemason, and wealthy grandson of the Duke of Devonshire, created an experiment which he claimed successfully proved the existence of gravity, measured its constant, and provided accurate figures for the exact masses of the Earth, Sun, Moon, and planets. How did Cavendish achieve this quantum leap for heliocentric pseudoscience? He fixed two large lead balls on opposite ends of a torsion balance and hung them from the roof of his shed. By watching and recording slight motions of the contraption via telescope through his shed window so his mass would not affect the reading, Cavendish claimed to have proven gravity. Two small lead balls were hung near the large ones, and any motion observed towards one another was touted as being the influence of gravity. Now, the Cavendish experiment has been widely criticized by the scientific community because never in over two centuries since its creation has anyone been able to replicate it. Firstly, the balls simply do not always attract one another as they must for the so-called gravitational constant to be constant at all. Sometimes the torsion balance turns towards the balls and sometimes away as it is impossible not to give some slight tremulous motion when interacting with it. Henry even complained in his notes how often as he was performing the measurement the contraption was still in oscillation. Secondly, since his calculated force of gravity was 10 to the 39th power weaker than the force of electromagnetism from which all material objects are composed, there is no control for the experiment which can factor out and positively differentiate the alleged gravitational force from the known stronger electromagnetic force. In other words, the balls could simply be attracting each other through static electricity, a known force existing in all things, 
billions of times stronger than gravity and impossible to control for the experiment. Even though no one could replicate Cavendish's findings, the experiment went down in history as a great success and is still taught as veritable proof of universal gravitation in science textbooks today. Half a century later, in 1851, a French scientist named Leon Foucault performed a similar experiment to Cavendish, but this time hanging a single ball from the ceiling, swinging it, and claiming all lateral motion observed to be proof that the Earth was turning beneath the pendulum. Since Foucault's original demonstration, these pendulums have regularly been swinging at museums and exhibition halls worldwide, purporting to provide everlasting perpetual proof of the heliocentric spinning ball Earth theory. The truth is, however, unbeknownst to most of the duped public, that Foucault's pendulum is a failed experiment which proves nothing but how easy it is for pseudoscience to deceive the malleable masses. To begin with, Foucault's pendulums do not uniformly swing in any one direction. Sometimes they rotate clockwise, and sometimes counterclockwise. Sometimes they fail to rotate, and sometimes they rotate far too much. Just like the Cavendish experiment, scientists who have attempted to replicate Foucault's findings have conceded time and again that, quote, it was difficult to avoid giving the pendulum some slight lateral bias at starting. In truth, the behavior of the pendulum actually depends on, one, the initial force beginning its swing, and two, the ball and socket joint used, which most readily facilitates circular motion over any other. The supposed rotation of the Earth is completely inconsequential and irrelevant to the pendulum swing. If the alleged constant rotation of the Earth affected pendulums in any way, then there should be no need to manually start pendulums in motion. If the Earth's diurnal rotation caused the 360-degree uniform diurnal rotation of pendulums, then there should not exist a stationary pendulum anywhere on Earth. Also in the mid-19th century, another Frenchman named Gaspard Gustave Coriolis performed several experiments showing the effect of kinetic energy on rotating systems, which have ever since become mythologized as proof of the heliocentric theory. His Coriolis effect is often said to cause sinks and toilet bowls in the northern hemisphere to drain spinning in one direction, while in the southern hemisphere causing them to spin the opposite way, thus providing proof of the spinning ball earth. Once again, however, just like Foucault's swinging pendulums and Cavendish's hanging balls, sinks and toilets in northern and southern hemispheres do not consistently spin in any one direction. Sinks and toilets in the very same household are often found to spin opposite directions, depending entirely upon the shape of the basin and the angle of the water's entry, not the supposed rotation of the earth. The Coriolis effect is also said to affect bullet trajectories and weather patterns as well supposedly causing most storms in the northern hemisphere to rotate counterclockwise, and most storms in the southern hemisphere to rotate clockwise, to cause bullets from long-range guns to tend towards the right of the target in the northern hemisphere, and to the left in the southern hemisphere. Again, however, the same problems remain. Not every bullet and not every storm consistently displays the behavior, and therefore cannot reasonably be used as proof of anything. In the late 19th century, mostly thanks to the experiments, books, and lectures of an English inventor and author named Dr. Samuel Robotham, a flat-earth renaissance began sweeping the world. Robotham's findings, beginning with his 1864 book, Earth Not a Globe, an experimental inquiry into the true figure of the Earth, proving it a plane without axial or orbital motion and the only material world in the universe, caused quite a stir in the scientific community, and thanks to three decades of his effort, the shape of the Earth became a hot topic of debate around the turn of the 19th century. Dr. Robotham conducted several experiments using telescopes, spirit levels, and theodolites, special precision instruments used for measuring angles in horizontal or vertical planes. By positioning them at equal heights aimed at each other successively, he proved over and over the Earth to be perfectly flat for miles without a single inch of curvature. In his most famous series of experiments, Robotham traveled to Cambridge, England, where there is a 20-mile canal called the Old Bedford which passes in a straight line through the Fenlands, known as the Bedford Level. The water has no interruption from locks or water gates of any kind, and remains stationary, making it perfectly suitable for determining whether any amount of convexity or curvature actually exists. If we were living on a ball earth, every pond, lake, marsh, canal, and other large body of standing water, each part would have to comprise a slight arc or semicircle curving downwards from the central summit. 
If the ball Earth were truly 25,000 miles in circumference, as claimed by heliocentrists, then spherical trigonometry dictates the surface of all standing water must curve downwards an easily measurable 8 inches per mile, multiplied by the square of the distance. This means along a 6-mile channel of standing water, the Earth would have to curve 16 feet 8 inches downwards from one end to the other, and or dip 6 feet on either end from the central peak, depending where the measurement is taken. Robotham tested first by standing in the water holding a telescope eight inches above the surface, while his partner rowed away from him in a small boat with a five-foot-tall flag attached. If the Earth was indeed a globe 25,000 miles in circumference, by the time the boat reached Welney Bridge six miles away, the entire boat and flag should have been completely invisible, hidden behind a six-foot-tall mass of curved water. In reality, however, every time tested, the entire boat and flag remained visible from start to finish. In a second experiment, Dr. Robotham placed seven flags along the edge of the water, each one mile distant from the next, with their tops positioned five feet above the surface, and stood with his telescope behind the first. If the Earth was a globe 25,000 miles in circumference, each successive flag would have to decline a definite and determined amount below the last. The first and second flags establish the line of sight, then the third should fall 8 inches below the second, the fourth flag 32 inches below, the fifth 6 feet, the sixth 10 feet 8 inches, and the seventh flag should be a clear 16 feet 8 inches below the line of sight. Even if the earth was a globe of 100,000 miles, an amount of easily measurable curvature should and would still be evident in this experiment. But the reality is, not a single inch of curvature was detected, and the flags all lined up perfectly as consistent with a flat plane. In 1870, one of Robotham's supporters, an English scientist of the Royal Academy named John Hampton, offered a public wager of 500 pounds to anyone who thought they could prove the Earth spherical by repeating the Bedford Level experiment. Alfred Russell Wallace, a fellow English scientist, ardent evolutionist and personal friend of Charles Darwin, accepted Hampton's wager, and the two met with referees to decide the matter at the Bedford level. The original plan was to repeat Robotham's flag experiment, but after hours of attempting to align them one on each mile marker, upon looking through the telescope, quote, they could not even judge which was which, let alone decide whether the line of sight along them was flat or curved. Heated debate ensued, an angry quarrel followed, and the experiment descended into a farce. They called it a day, but a week later reconvened, this time Wallace setting new parameters for the experiment, which had never been tested or approved by Robotham or Hampton. Wallace hung a large calico sheet from the old Bedford Bridge, with a thick black line painted across its center, and positioned his telescope six miles south at Welney Bridge at the same elevation. Then halfway between these two points, Wallace placed a long red pole topped with a marker disc designed to fall in line with the black painted marker and telescope. All of these he placed at a masonically significant 13 feet 3 inches above the water. Wallace's plan was to view the marker disc and black line through the telescope, and if the middle marker appeared below the line of sight, this would be taken as proof of the water's flat surface and if the middle marker appeared above the line of sight, it would be taken as proof of Earth's curvature. Hampton immediately took issue with this new method of allegedly determining curvature, but begrudgingly accepted to continue. When viewed through the telescope, the center marker fell a tiny bit below the telescope crosshair, and the far marker on the bridge fell a tiny bit below that. This result was not expected by either party, but Wallace quickly claimed it proof that the Earth was curving downwards, while Hampton claimed the results to be in accordance with the law of perspective over flat surfaces. This time an even more heated debate ensued, until Wallace refused to speak another word with Hampton, gave him the silent treatment, and even had the police escort Hampton from his hotel room before leaving town the following day. The referees for the wager decided in favor of Wallace, and the money was given to him. In response, Hampton immediately published a 16-page pamphlet denouncing Wallace as a liar and cheat, called Is Water Level or Convex After All? The Bedford Canal Swindle Detected and Exposed. Another fellow English author and flat earther, William Carpenter, also present during the experiment, wrote his equally scathing 30-page review of the swindle entitled Water Not Convex, The Earth Not a Globe, demonstrated by Alfred Russell Wallace on the 5th of March, 1870. Hampton later took Wallace to trial and sued him for his 500 pounds. 
the court formally decided in favor of Hampton that the bet was invalid and returned his money in full. Next, Hampton immediately reissued his challenge to Wallace, increasing the wager to a thousand pounds and inviting Dr. Robotham to attend. This time, the experiment would be conducted as Robotham had originally done, standing in the water with telescope held eight inches above the water, observing a boat with a five-foot flag attached sailing six miles away from Welch's Dam to Wellney Bridge. When the day of the wager came, poor weather prevented them from completing the experiment, so they postponed, meant more bad weather, and postponed again. On their third and final attempt, before heading home with the weather still overcast, they attempted the experiment. Unfortunately, shortly after reaching the halfway point, the boat became indistinguishable beyond the haze, and the bet was called off. The boat and flag were visible, however, for the entire three miles. In 2015, a group of flat earthers once again repeated Robotham's experiment at the Bedford level, with similar results. They detected no curvature, and saw the boat beyond the halfway marker, but became obscured by poor weather before reaching the full six miles. In 1871, after getting massive amounts of pressure from the public to address these claims from Flat Earth proponents, Royal Astronomical Society President George Airy devised an experiment which he hoped would once and for all prove Earth's axial motion and forever silence the rabble-rousing Flat Earthers. By first filling a telescope with water to slow down the speed of light inside, then calculating the tilt necessary to get the starlight directly down the tube, Airy planned to measure the speed of the telescope and thereby the speed of the Earth, by extrapolating the amount of tilt needed to keep the starlight coming in straight. The experiment, however, would go down in history and forever be known as Airy's failure, because every time he repeated it, Airy found the starlight was already coming in the correct angle, with no change necessary, proving that the stars move relative to a stationary Earth, and not the other way around. Airy had meant to prove the heliocentric theory, but instead devised an everlasting proof of the geocentric model. In 1887, American physicists Albert Michelson and Edward Morley performed an experiment to determine Earth's speed through space, or what was then called the ether. By passing light through two pathways, one in the direction of Earth's alleged motion and the other at right angles to it, the light traveling with the Earth should have taken longer to return than light traveling at right angles to it. To the surprise of Mickelson Morley and the scientific establishment, however, no difference whatsoever was detected, even after repeating the experiment several times in different places. To attempt to patch up this glaring problem, the heliocentric establishment created the fitzgerald lorentz contraction, which actually had the gall to claim that the light pathway going the same direction as the Earth became physically shorter during the experiment so that the time to return became equal to the other pathway. The implications of Michelson and Morley's experiment were so detrimental to the spinning globe earth myth that they were forced to concoct this ludicrous backpedaling explanation which even Arthur Miller denounced calling it a physics of desperation. After Samuel Robotham's death, Lady Elizabeth Blunt, an English author, flat earther, vocal vegetarian and anti-vivisectionist, founded the Universal Zetetic Society, which attracted thousands of members and published a journal called The Earth Not a Globe Review for several decades. Many other prominent flat earthers of the time also continued doing their best to spread the word. John Hampton continued publishing his own work and reprinted all of Samuel Robotham's material. In 1885, William Carpenter published his famous 100 Proofs Earth is Not a Globe, in 1892, Alexander Gleason released his New Standard Map of the World as it is, which remains to this day one of the most accurate flat earth maps ever created. He had hopes it would completely replace globes and mercator maps the world over, but unfortunately his map's influence was short-lived. The next year, in 1893, Gleason published his flat earth tome entitled Is the Bible from Heaven? Is the Earth a Globe? Does Modern Science and the Bible Agree? which gave many flat earth proofs and also explained his wonderful map. In 1899, South African flat earth author Thomas Winship published his excellent work, Zetetic Cosmogony, evidence that the world is not a rotating revolving globe, but a stationary plane circle. 1903 marked the beginning of airplane travel, which, had it been invented in Copernicus's era, would have destroyed his spinning ball earth fantasy long before takeoff. When hot air balloons were first invented, people were told the reason they cannot simply float in the air and wait for the spinning ball earth to bring their destinations to them 
was because gravity somehow stuck the entire atmosphere and everything in it in place, dragging it along at a thousand miles per hour so uniformly that we can't see it, feel it, hear it, or measure it in any way. Once airplane technology evolved so that we could fly at comparable speeds to the Earth's supposed rotation, however, it became immediately apparent that the Earth and its atmosphere could not be constantly rotating a thousand miles per hour west to east. Simply put, if the Earth were constantly spinning eastward a thousand miles per hour, then airplane flight durations going eastwards versus westwards would be significantly different. If the average commercial airliner travels 500 miles per hour, it follows that westbound equatorial flights should reach their destination at approximately three times the speed as their eastbound return flights. In reality, however, the differences in east and westbound flight durations usually amount to a matter of minutes, and nothing near what would occur on a thousand mile per hour spinning ball earth. For example, flights eastward with the alleged spin of the ball earth from Tokyo to LA take an average of 10.5 hours. Therefore, the return flights westwards against the alleged spin should take an average of 5.25 hours, but in actual fact, take an average of 11.5 hours. Also of note, if Earth were a globe, there are several flights in the southern hemisphere which would have the quickest, straightest path over the Antarctic continent, such as Santiago, Chile to Sydney, Australia. Instead of taking the shortest, quickest route in a straight line over Antarctica, all such flights detour all manner of directions away from Antarctica instead, claiming the temperatures too cold for airplane travel. Considering the fact that there are plenty of flights to, from, and over Antarctica, and NASA claims to have technology keeping them in conditions far colder and far hotter than any experienced on Earth, such an excuse is clearly just an excuse, and these flights aren't made because they are impossible. If the Earth was a ball and Antarctica was too cold to fly over, the only logical way to fly from Sydney to Santiago would be a straight shot over the Pacific, staying in the southern hemisphere the entire way. Refueling could be done in New Zealand or other southern hemisphere destinations along the way if absolutely necessary. In actual fact, however, Santiago to Sydney flights go into the northern hemisphere, making stopovers at LAX and other North American airports before continuing back down to the southern hemisphere. Such ridiculously wayward detours make no sense on the globe, but make perfect sense and form nearly straight lines when shown on a flat earth map. On a ball earth, Johannesburg, South Africa to Perth, Australia should be a straight shot over the Indian Ocean, with convenient refueling possibilities on Mauritius or Madagascar. In actual practice, however, most Johannesburg to Perth flights curiously stop over either in Dubai, Hong Kong, or Malaysia, all of which make no sense on the ball, but are completely understandable when mapped on a flat earth. A casual study of other South Hemisphere flight paths and stopover points will prove to even the most staunch skeptic the clear illegitimacy of globe map projections. Building on Michelson and Morley's experiment, in 1913, French physicist Georges Sagnac again proved the existence of the ether and the stillness of Earth by using a beam splitter to send light in opposite directions around a path, recombining them, then observing their interference fringes, first while stationary, and then while rotating the entire experiment table two revolutions per second. The changes in interference patterns between the moving and non-moving trials proved that the light, and therefore the Earth, was stationary. In 1914, William Westfield wrote his geocentric classic, Does the Earth Rotate? No. And when Gerard Hickson's masterpiece, Kings Dethroned, A History of the Evolution of Astronomy from the Time of the Roman Empire up to the Present Day, was published in 1922, the heliocentric theory of the universe was on its last legs. In 1925, the Michelson-Gale experiment again vouched for a stationary Earth and it was clear to the establishment that they needed something big to bring public opinion back their way. In 1916, a Jewish physicist named Albert Einstein had published his General Theory of Relativity, a brilliant revision of heliocentrism which, in one philosophical swoop, abolished the ether from scientific study, replacing it with a form of relativism which allowed for heliocentrism and geocentrism to hold equal merit. If there was no absolute etheric medium within which all things exist, then hypothetically one could postulate complete relativism with regard to the movement of two objects such as the earth and sun. In one philosophical leap, with no scientific evidence to support it, 
Einstein and the heliocentric establishment were thus able to sweep Aries' failure, Mickelson, Morley, Sagnac, and Gale all conveniently under the carpet and pretend they didn't exist, simply by claiming that all motion in the universe was relative. By the late 1920s, Einstein and his theories had been pushed so vehemently, the heliocentric theory began making a comeback, and Einstein was being touted as a genius and one of the greatest minds in history. Far from it, even he himself admitted when asked, what is it like to be the smartest man alive, responded by saying, I don't know, you'll have to ask Nikola Tesla, a true genius who in no way supported Einstein's relativity or the heliocentric theory. Einstein was even caught lying when he originally claimed to have never even heard of the Michelson-Morley experiment, but later admitted that he had indeed created special relativity with the intent of abolishing the ether and nullifying the Michelson-Morley result. By the 1930s, an eccentric Christian flat earther named Wilbur Glenn Voliva was attracting widespread publicity around the world thanks to his American lecture tours and daily radio broadcasts from his personal station, which could be heard all the way to Australia. Voliva famously founded and built Zion City in Illinois, a town of 6,500 people, all of whom were Christian flat earthers. Zion City even had its own schools and churches which taught flat earth cosmology. In the spirit of Robotham and Hampton, throughout his life, Voliva offered an open-ended wager of $5,000 to anyone who thought they could disprove the Flat Earth. Until his death in 1942, there were no takers. After the Second World War, Operation Paperclip brought hundreds of top German rocket scientists and physicists into the United States, and beginning in the late 50s employed them in NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Meanwhile, the Russian space program was also forming, and a so-called space race between America and Russia ensued. The Geostationary Communications Satellite was first imagined in a 1945 proposal by Freemason science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke, and supposedly became science fact just over a decade later. In 1957, Russia allegedly launched the first satellite named Sputnik into low Earth orbit, followed in 1958 by America's Explorer 1. Nowadays, there are supposedly upwards of 20,000 such satellites constantly orbiting the Earth. They are allegedly floating around in the thermosphere, where temperatures are claimed to be upwards of 4,530 degrees Fahrenheit. The metals used in satellites, however, such as aluminum, gold, and titanium, have melting points of 1,221, 1,948, and 3,034 degrees respectively, all far lower than they could possibly handle. People even claim to see satellites with their naked eyes, but this is ridiculous considering they are smaller than a bus and allegedly a hundred plus miles away. It is impossible to see anything so small that far away. Even using telescopes, no one claims to discern the shape of satellites, but rather describes seeing passing moving lights, which could easily be any number of things, from airplanes to drones to shooting stars or other unidentified flying objects. The fact that they are geostationary means they would not appear to move through the sky anyway, but rather be perpetually stuck in the exact same place all day every day. So-called satellite phones have been found to have reception problems in countries like Kazakhstan with very few cell phone towers. If the Earth were a ball with 20,000 plus satellites surrounding, such blackouts should not regularly occur in any rural countryside and deep ocean areas. Also, satellite TV dishes, which existed for years before satellites were supposedly invented, are almost always positioned at a 45 degree angle towards the nearest ground-based repeater tower. If TV antenna were actually picking up signals from satellites 100 plus miles in space, most TV dishes should be pointing more or less straight up to the sky. The fact that satellite dishes are never pointing straight up and almost always positioned at a 45 degree angle proves they are picking up ground-based tower signals. Before satellites, radio, television, and navigation systems like LoRan and DECA were already well established and worked fine using only ground-based technologies. Nowadays, huge fiber-optic cables connect the internet across oceans, gigantic cell towers triangulate GPS signals, and ionospheric propagation allows radio waves to be bounced all without the aid of the science fiction bestseller known as satellites. Also in the late 50s, a sign maker from Dover, England named Samuel Shenton, in the spirit of Robotham and Lady Blunt's Zetetic Society, created IFERS, 
the International Flat Earth Research Society, and began giving lectures on television in newspapers to youth clubs and schools about our flat, motionless Earth. Shenton discovered the writings of the late 19th century flat earth authors mentioned previously and made it his mission to spread the Zetetic message as far and wide as he could. With NASA's supposed satellite launches happening, people constantly questioned Shenton about satellites proving the globe earth, to which he would always reply, does sailing around the Isle of Wight prove it is spherical? When NASA claimed to have put the first man in space, Shenton said from the beginning that it was all photo and video trickery. When John Glenn supposedly orbited the world in 1963, Shenton even sent him a free Eifers membership with a personal message saying, Okay, wise guy. Shenton knew that John Glenn, two-time U.S. Senator and one of NASA's first astronauts, was a lying Freemason, just like his heliocentric forefathers from Pythagoras to Copernicus, Kepler to Cavendish, along with most all of NASA's astronauts. Buzz Aldrin Jr. is an admitted ring-wearing, hand-sign-flashing 33rd-degree Mason from Montclair Lodge No. 144 in New Jersey. Edgar Mitchell is an Order of Demolay Mason at Arresta Lodge No. 29 in New Mexico. James Irwin was a Tihon Lodge No. 104 member in Colorado Springs. Don Izell was a member of the Luther B. Turner Lodge No. 732 in Ohio. Gordon Cooper was a Master Mason in Carbondale Lodge No. 82 in Colorado. Virgil Grissom was a Master Mason from Mitchell Lodge No. 228 in Indiana. Walter Shearer Jr. was a 33rd degree Mason at Canaveral Lodge No. 339 in Florida. Thomas Stafford is a Mason at Western Star Lodge No. 138 in Oklahoma. Paul Weitz is from Lawrence Lodge No. 708 in Pennsylvania. C. Fred Klangnecht, the head of NASA during the Apollo program, shortly thereafter became Sovereign Grand Commander of the Council of the 33rd Degree of the Ancient and Accepted Scottish Rite of Freemasonry of the Southern Jurisdiction. NASA astronauts Neil Armstrong, Alan Shepard, William Pogue, Vance Brand, and Anthony England all had fathers who were Freemasons as well. The amount of astronauts known to be Freemasons or from Freemasonic families is astonishing. It is likely that more astronauts and people of key importance in NASA are affiliated with the Brotherhood as well, but not so open about their membership. For there to be this many Masons, members of the world's largest and oldest secret society, involved with the promotion and propagation of this globalist heliocentric doctrine from its outset to modern times, should raise some serious suspicion. Before the first Apollo missions ever even cleared the launch pad, 11 NASA astronauts died in highly suspicious accidents. Gus Grissom, Roger Chafee, and Ed White were all cremated together in an Apollo capsule fire during a completely unnecessary and dangerous test where they were strapped down and locked into a 100% oxygen chamber which incinerated the three of them to death in seconds. Seven other astronauts, Ted Freeman, Charles Bassett, Elliot C., Russell Rogers, Clifton Williams, Michael Adams, and Robert Lawrence died in six separate airplane crashes and Ed Gibbons in a car crash. Eight of these deaths were in 1967 alone. So many astronauts coincidentally dying under such circumstances is highly unlikely and lends credence to the idea that these were intentional hits by the Masons trying to find the right people to sell their hoax. One of the most outspoken of the fallen astronauts was Gus Grissom. By 1967, Grissom had become increasingly irritated and vocally negative about NASA's chances of ever landing a man on the moon. He stated the odds were pretty slim, and famously hung a lemon on the Apollo capsule after it repeatedly failed safety testing procedures. Grissom threatened to go public with his complaints about the LEM, and even told his wife Betty, quote, If there ever is a serious accident in the space program, it's likely to be me. Right after his murder, government agents raided Grissom's house before anyone had been informed about the fire or his death. They removed all his personal papers and his diary, never to be returned. From 1969 to 1972, the Freemasons at NASA claimed to have landed six of their Apollo missions on the moon. With this ingenious deception, a bit of rocket technology, a bunch of lying Freemasons, and photographs taken through a round window, with this one psyop, NASA managed to convince nearly everyone on Earth that they live on a spinning ball. However, in the documentary A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon, you can watch official leaked NASA footage showing Apollo 11 astronauts Buzz Aldrin, 
Neil Armstrong, and Michael Collins for almost an hour using transparencies and camera tricks to fake shots of a round Earth. They communicate over audio with Control in Houston about how to accurately stage the shot, and someone keeps prompting them on how to effectively manipulate the camera to achieve the desired effect. First they blacked out all the windows, except for a downward-facing circular one, which they aimed the camera towards from several feet away. This created the illusion of a ball-shaped Earth surrounded by the blackness of space, when in fact it was simply a round window in their dark cabin. Neil Armstrong claimed at this point to be 130,000 miles from Earth, halfway to the moon, but when camera tricks were finished, the viewer could see for themselves the astronauts were not more than a couple dozen miles above the Earth's surface in a high-altitude plane. These images showing a globular world soon became the Freemasons' most valuable tool in altering public perception about the shape of the Earth. Since the original so-called blue marble image, NASA has provided the public with many more pictures and videos showing a globe Earth, touting veritable photographic proof that Pythagoras' 2,500-year-old theory was finally validated. When seen with a skeptical eye, however, professional photo analysts have dissected several NASA images of the ball Earth and found undeniable proof of computer editing. For example, images of the Earth allegedly taken from the moon have proven to be copied and pasted in, as evidenced by rectangular cuts found in the black background around the Earth by adjusting brightness and contrast levels. If they were truly on the moon, and Earth was truly a ball, there would be no need to fake such pictures. When NASA's images of the ball Earth are compared with one another, the coloration of the land and oceans and relative size of the continents are consistently so drastically different from one another as to prove beyond any reasonable doubt that the pictures are all fake. NASA has many alleged photographs of the ball Earth which show several exact copy-and-pasted duplicate cloud patterns. Cheeky graphics artists have even placed things like faces, dragons, and the word sex into cloud patterns over various ball Earth pictures. One recent Pluto picture clearly has a picture of Disney's Pluto the dog layered into the background. On a clear afternoon, during a waxing or waning moon cycle, it is possible to see the blue sky right through the moon. For centuries, stars and planets have often been seen and recorded, even by the Royal Astronomical Society, to have been seen through the moon. If the moon is translucent enough to see objects through it, it cannot be the solid, spherical planetoid claimed by NASA and modern astronomers. Samuel Shenton, president of IFERS, was quoted before the Apollo supposed moon landing, stating that stars have been seen through the moon. The astronauts had better be ready to come right back, because there isn't anything much to land on. Besides Shenton, many of the first people to unequivocally call out the NASA moon landings as being a staged hoax were professional photographers. When the official NASA photographs of the moon are closely examined, it is clear that many were taken inside a studio using repetitive backgrounds, artificial lighting, wires, and cranes. Award-winning British photographer David Percy, photo analyst and historian Jack White, photographer and Nexus magazine publisher Marcus Allen, and many others all put their professional reputations on the line to expose NASA's so-called photographic evidence. None of the Apollo missions brought any extra studio lighting with them on the lunar lander, so the sun should be the only light source on the moon, and in all pictures taken there. In that case, the light should only come from one direction, and all shadows should be cast in the opposite direction. However, in dozens of official NASA photos, there are shadows being cast in up to three directions simultaneously, often at up to 90 degree angles, which can only be the result of multiple light sources not present on the moon. Several pictures even show overhead spotlights reflecting in astronauts' helmets and multiple lens flares originating from two or more light sources. Analyzing several images from the six missions shows repeated background features, the exact same hills, dunes, and craters, being used over and over again in supposedly different places on the moon, as well as visible foreground and backdrop lines indicative of a studio set. In images from Apollo 11, Buzz Aldrin can be seen wearing different color gloves and different length boots in pictures that were supposedly taken within minutes of each other. If Buzz was really in the vacuum of space in a pressurized spacesuit, he certainly would not have had the time or reason to depressurize and repressurize his suit just to make such fashion adjustments. Some pictures show the lunar rover with no tracks anywhere around it. 
Others show rover tracks all over the foreground while it is yet to be unpacked and unloaded. A couple pictures even show what appear to be sneakers and a lady's heel tracks on the moon, in addition to the astronaut's boot prints. Another glaring mistake is that none of NASA's images or videos show stars in the background as they should, just complete blackness, likely because exact star maps as they should appear from the moon would be nearly impossible to fake. The testimony of different astronauts on different missions, in their autobiographies and interviews, just muddies the water even more, some of them bragging about the quote, astonishingly brilliant light of the stars, and others saying they quote, don't remember seeing a single star while on the moon. Such inconsistencies, and the fact that none of NASA's moon pictures feature stars or planets in their appropriate positions, should raise a red flag that these astronauts were not on the moon. Many pictures of the sun on the moon are clearly spotlights and not the sun. Some images show studio lighting lens flares or studio lighting reflecting off a black background. One image clearly shows a shadow on the ceiling of space as the lunar lander lifts off. Many images show shadows of reticule crosshairs suspended in air over a print underneath, proving them to be doctored and not originals as claimed. Images of the lunar lander supposedly on the moon shows a pathetic 1969 attempt at creating high-tech futuristic-looking equipment using what appears to be construction paper, gold foil, scotch tape, and metal shower rods. The idea that the piece of junk shown in these official NASA photographs flew to the moon and back is so ludicrous it's laughable. Close-ups of the lunar lander footpads show them without a speck of dust on them and without a burn print under its 10,000-pound thrusters, like it was just gently set down in place. NASA scientists in their own documents were worried about the LEM falling into its own massive burn radius, yet there it sits with no burn print and spotless clean pads. Even the astronauts' boot prints made deep impressions on the moon dust, yet the lander's 10,000-pound thrusters left not a trace, no blast hole, and no dust on the pads. When the video evidence is examined, even more anomalies are found. In certain frames, light pings can be seen reflecting off overhead stage wires attached to astronauts' backpacks. In one Apollo 16 clip, an astronaut falls to his knees and is quickly jerked back up to his feet by what can only be an unseen wire hoisting him straight upwards. One of the more obvious video anomalies is how several Apollo missions show American flags flapping around in the non-existent space wind. The moon is supposed to have no atmosphere, and so the flags should remain perfectly still, but can often be seen moving quite boisterously. Another interesting video anomaly is discovered by playing NASA's moon footage at two times speed, then watching the astronauts walking, running, jumping, or cruising around on their little buggy. Without the speed adjustment, there is a low-gravity illusion, as the astronauts seem to float, drift, and glide slowly and smoothly along. But once they are seen at two times speed, it becomes clear that they are in, quote, normal gravity, walking, running, jumping, and cruising at normal speeds. They simply reduced the play speed by 50% in post-production, and voila, instant moon motion. Not only is the Apollo video record fraught with fraud, but NASA claims the original Apollo 11 videos have conveniently disappeared from their records so no one can analyze them for authenticity. You heard correctly. They spent over $30 billion of American taxpayer money traveling to the moon and then lost the video evidence. Those blurry, ghostly black-and-white images shown on TV were purposely lousy because NASA insisted at the time that all TV networks must broadcast directly from a big-screen display in their operations room, a mandate which all the major networks accepted, and so what the public saw was just a video of a poorly magnified video, and now it is impossible to watch the original. Not only have the Apollo 11 originals disappeared, but NASA claims to have lost all original audio tapes from the Apollo missions, and that their contractors have lost all prints and plans for the lunar rover, LEM lander, and Apollo ship engines. It even recently came out that when curators at Amsterdam's Rijksmuseum investigated their moon rock, personally given to them by Armstrong and Aldrin in 1969, they found that it was actually just a worthless piece of petrified wood from Earth. In 1970, Freemason and philosophy professor at St. Thomas's University, Leo Ferrari, created the Flat Earth Society of Canada, which he soon shortened to simply the Flat Earth Society. 
Unlike Samuel Shenton's International Flat Earth Research Society in every way, Leo Ferrari's Flat Earth Society treated the entire subject as a deadpan joke, making a mockery of it, and even creating several intentionally false flat earth arguments. For example, Leo Ferrari would always bring a pumpkin-sized rock with him during interviews and lectures, claiming he brought the stone back from the edge of our flat earth. He would say, with a huge smirk on his face, how his boat had fallen over the edge, but he was luckily saved by hanging onto this rock. Clearly, treating our flat earth in this tongue-in-cheek way discouraged people from taking the matter seriously, and creating this fake flat earth society was the Freemasons' way of mitigating Shenton's Eifer's genuine threat to their global deception. In 1971, Samuel Shenton passed away, and the American former airplane mechanic Charles K. Johnson took his place as president of Eifer's. Charles and his wife Marjorie, like Lady Blunt and many of the original Zetetic Society members, were not only flat earthers, but outspoken vegetarians and anti-vivisectionists. Charles and Marjorie maintained a periodical called The Flat Earth News for many years, where they printed articles about NASA's lies, geocentricity, flat earth, and vegetarianism. Unlike Leo Ferrari and his mock society spreading disinformation, Charles Johnson was a genuine voice speaking out against the evils of the world. In 1974, when Johnson heard of Ferrari's budding organization, he decided to contact him and wrote a cordial letter requesting further information about his society, to which Ferrari never replied. Two years later, Johnson wrote another polite letter saying how he was delighted by the prospect of a like-minded campaigner, and said how it was a very happy day when he learned of Ferrari's society. Quote, I feel sure at the core we cannot be too far apart in aims, Johnson wrote. I do try to practice what I preach, to think and seek and search out reasonable ideas and concepts. He closed saying that he could hardly wait to hear from Ferrari and hoped very much he would please reply. After six months without a response, Johnson wrote one more time explaining again his sole purpose to enlarge his view and getting and holding on to the facts, which would benefit himself and in time the rest of the world. He requested a reply and a copy of Ferrari's FES magazine. In conclusion, Johnson signed, thanks from the bottom of my heart, in advance, but warned that if Ferrari insisted on ignoring him once again, quote, I will then know for sure that you are some kind of enemy of the flat earth work. Eventually, Ferrari did reply this time, but not with a message or magazine as requested. He simply enclosed an FES paid application form. Johnson investigated Ferrari's organization further and found that he was using, quote, the flat earth idea as a gimmick to entertain and promote the atheistic society. From then on, Johnson worked hard to expand his ciphers and constantly for the rest of his life exposed Ferrari's FES, calling him a false prophet, guilty of muddying the waters of truth. Near the end of his life, tragically, Johnson's house burned down, along with all the flat earth materials he and Shenton had collected over their lifetimes. Until his dying day, Johnson claimed the fire to be the result of arson by a NASA agent he had seen snooping around. Apparently finished with their moon landing propaganda, starting in 1976, NASA began faking Mars landings instead. To begin with, the planets, formerly known as wandering stars, are not terrestrial Earth-like habitations capable of landing anything on. The sun, moon, and stars are all simply luminaries, celestial lights relatively close to Earth, and not something tangibly solid that humans could ever walk on. This is painfully obvious to anyone with functioning eyeballs and a telescope or Nikon P900 camera, but NASA continues to this day to publish thousands of fake CGI images claiming to come from Mars. Even assuming Mars was an actual spherical desert planet as NASA claims, it is impossible for them to have safely landed the probes based on their own trials and statistics. They say the surface pressure on Mars is only three-tenths of one percent the surface pressure on Earth, and equivalent to the pressure at about 23 miles above the Earth. There is not enough air matter at that pressure, however, to provide any lift for opening up the parachutes NASA uses to land its Mars probes. No parachute ever devised has been able to successfully deploy at that altitude. They simply stream straight back, then never feel the rest of the way down. Joe Kittinger's record highest, fastest, and longest parachute dive from the Earth's upper atmosphere had him free-falling from only 19 miles high for 15 minutes at 767 miles per hour, and his drogue chute proved useless and offered no deceleration. 
Yet NASA would have us believe, for example, that Phoenix's parachute managed to somehow slow it down from 12,738 miles per hour to 123 miles per hour in just 2.86 minutes before its final landing. In other words, NASA is claiming to do something on Mars, millions of miles away, by remote control, something that we have no evidence is even possible on Earth at significantly lower altitude and 16 times slower speed. To this day, NASA continues to fake Mars landings, and more government space agencies around the world, including Russia, China, Japan, France, India, and others, are following the same Freemasonic model of fleecing their populations of taxpayer money to fund programs that provide the public nothing but propaganda. NASA and other space agencies' rocket launches never even go straight up. Every rocket forms a parabolic curve, peaks out, and inevitably starts falling back to Earth. The rockets which are declared successful are those few which don't explode or start falling too soon, but make it out of range of spectator view before crashing down into restricted waters and recovered. There is no magic altitude where rockets or anything else can simply go up, 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 and then suddenly just start free-floating in space. This is all science fiction illusion created by wires, green screens, dark pools, some permed hair, and zero-g planes. In 1998, NASA claimed to have sent up their first piece of the ISS, International Space Station. They have been caught, however, time and again with air bubbles forming and floating off in their official outer space footage. Astronauts have also been caught using scuba space gear, kicking their legs to move, and astronaut Luca Parmitano even almost drowned when water started filling up his helmet while allegedly on a spacewalk. It is admitted that astronauts train for their spacewalks in underwater training facilities like NASA's Neutral Buoyancy Lab, but what is obvious from their space bubbles and other blunders is that all official spacewalk footage is also fake and filmed underwater. Analysis of many interior videos from the International Space Station have shown the use of camera tricks such as green screens, harnesses, and even wildly permed hair to achieve a zero-gravity type effect. Footage of astronauts seemingly floating in the zero-gravity of their space station is indistinguishable from Vomit Comet zero-g airplane footage. By flying parabolic maneuvers, this zero-g floating effect can be achieved over and over again, then edited together. For longer uncut shots, NASA has been caught using simple wires and green screens. In 2001, Charles K. Johnson died, and having lost all his flat earth material and correspondence in his house fire, the Eifers was officially finished. Leo Ferrari's farcical Flat Earth Society, on the other hand, continued operation as usual, making a mockery of the flat earth subject. In 2004, the reins of FES presidency were handed over to Daniel Shenton, of no relation to genuine flat earther Samuel Shenton, who, true to Ferrari's example, maintains the Flat Earth Society website to this day where they purport such fantastical, purposeful disinformation as the flat earth disk constantly rising upwards forever through the universe to account for gravity. Their sole purpose, as Charles Johnson correctly stated, is clearly to poison the well and muddy the waters of truth. In 2008, teacher and author Eric Dubay that's me, began a website and published a book titled The Atlantean Conspiracy, which exposed, among many other things, Freemasonry, the fake moon landings, geocentricity, and even featured a quote from Eifer's president, Charles K. Johnson. At the time, I had already read Samuel Robotham and William Carpenter's old 19th century flat earth books, and though personally still on the fence regarding the shape of the earth, I was confident they were correct about the location or geocentricity of earth so I wrote about it. In 2009, after watching Alex Jones interview and praise several NASA astronauts on his show, I wrote an article and sent a message to him and his producers about the moon landing hoax, and included a link to Samuel Robotham's Flat Earth book for them to read. Alex even mentioned this on air the next day, and called me a flat earther who thinks he's covering up some Atlantean conspiracy, the title of my book and website. Uh, well, don't. well, I mean, I mean, I mean, the Earth being flat—that that's clearly ridiculous. Though I've actually been contacted by some flat earthers saying I'm covering up the fact that it's it's some Atlantean conspiracy. 
For the next several years, I continued writing books and articles about various conspiracies and worked on building a huge social media presence. By making multiple accounts, adding as many friends and followers as possible, joining and posting to as many groups and pages as possible, over the course of a few years, I began building up very large followings on Facebook, Google+, LinkedIn, Twitter, StumbleUpon, Pinterest, Sue, and many other sites. To give you an example of their efficacy, you can see here my main Google Plus account with over 135 million views and my secondary one with over 87 million. In mid-2011, a professional artist, comedian, and Hollywood actor named Math Powerland, claiming to also be an ex-NASA whistleblower, created the NASA channel on YouTube. He made a few decent videos exposing NASA image fakery, but his channel certainly did not contain many flat earth proofs or evidence, and there are more videos of him ranting about Axe deodorant, hookers on Tinder, his championship sexual prowess, and other irrelevant topics than there are actually exposing the flat earth. For example, see his recent video entitled The History of the Flat Earth, the same name and comparable length as the video you are watching now, but contains almost no content relating to history or the flat earth, just him venting his various political frustrations. In short, anyone visiting his channel would not become a flat earther and would more likely be turned off from the subject due to his manic ranting style and lack of factual content. In November of 2014, after years of researching and writing, I released my book The Flat Earth Conspiracy, the first pro-flat earth book written in nearly 50 years. I simultaneously released a flat earth conspiracy documentary on YouTube began giving radio interviews, and published several influential articles on the subject. Within a very short space of time, the flat earth keyword saw a 600% rise in activity, and Google search results jumped from a few thousand to over 21 million. Soon after this, just as Johnson had experienced with Ferrari, I noticed a wave of disingenuous so-called flat earthers flooding into the movement with the obvious intent to muddy the waters. For example, when I began writing my book, The Flat Earth Conspiracy, I came across Paul Michael Bales on Facebook, a recent flat earth convert who had been collecting a library of old original flat earth books and letters. Hoping to find some good reference material, I messaged him asking for recommended titles, and he told me a few choice books to read. The full extent of our interaction consisted of a short Facebook conversation, yet curiously after my book was published and the flat earth movement started growing, Paul began stating publicly that he was the Morpheus to my Neo, and that he taught me everything I know about the Flat Earth. He even made the ludicrous claim that my book was plagiarized from old Facebook posts of his. Matt Boylan, aka Math Powerland, also jumped in and had the gall to say that, quote, my entire book was plagiarized from his information, which is equally laughable, considering he and his information are only mentioned in two paragraphs of my 252-page book. Needless to say, both of their claims are baseless and go to show how desperate they are to receive credit where it is not due. You can also see from this Google Analytics chart that the Flat Earth keyword had not made any significant change in 2011 since the launch of Matt's YouTube channel, nor in late 2012, early 2013, when Paul claims to have gotten his start. The moment when the flat earth tides shifted and the exponential growth of the movement began was clearly around and after November 2014, the exact month when I exploded all of my flat earth research onto the internet. In November 2014, I published the first pro-flat earth book written in 50 years, The Flat Earth Conspiracy. I also published several popular articles on the subject, uploaded the most popular flat earth conspiracy documentary on YouTube, began giving radio interviews, and soon restarted Charles Johnson's IFERS, the International Flat Earth Research Society, and published my most successful book ever, 200 Proofs Earth is Not a Spinning Ball, which has now been translated into 12 foreign languages and read by millions worldwide. These simultaneous actions, my intentional exploding of credible flat earth information onto the internet all at once, which I had been preparing for the entire year before, are undoubtedly the catalyst behind the exponential growth curve seen beginning here. Later on, around March 2015, recent Flat Earth convert Mark Sargent came out of nowhere, began uploading new Flat Earth videos every day, uploading new interviews several times per week, got offered his own radio show, started being heralded by many as the King of Flat Earth, and credited with starting the modern Flat Earth revival. 
At first I was glad to have him on board, until the cracks began to show and the clear disinformation campaign began. Mark claimed the moon and stars were holographic projections, maintained by alleged dome builders, who keep us inside a Truman Show enclosed structure, among much other nonsense. He even lied about me in several interviews, including one where he claimed that I promoted the idea of a constantly rising flat earth to account for gravity, when in fact I constantly expose this false concept as being disinformation. Mark was, and continues to be, the Leo Ferrari to my Charles Johnson. In fact, Mark has even bragged several times about being a card-carrying member of Ferrari's farcical organization. By New Year's Eve 2016, our new Eifers had gained over 3,000 members and was receiving 50,000 hits monthly when it was suddenly and without warning or explanation deleted from the internet. As the administrators and myself quickly worked on salvaging our material and creating a new site, the obvious parallels to Johnson losing everything in his NASA agent-initiated house fire were noteworthy. Around the same time, two disingenuous Flat Earth channels issued two fraudulent copyright strikes against me, which I managed to overturn by filing legal counterclaims against them. YouTube itself began a program of regularly unsubscribing old subscribers of mine and lowering view counts of popular videos. Shortly after that, Facebook also decided to jump on the Eric Dubé censorship bandwagon by deleting my account all my pages, and giving my Atlantean conspiracy group directly over to a team of Freemason shills who still administrate it to this day, filling the group with nothing but death threats to me, pictures of Masonic goats, and ridiculous belittling memes. After re-registering for new accounts and accumulating my friends lists again, Facebook has now deleted two more profiles, and I am currently on my fourth, still trying my best to spread the word. In 2016, the movement continued to grow, with many more genuine flat earthers taking up the reins and exposing the truth online, as well as many more disingenuous shills continuing to poison the well with misinformation. The new Eifers began thriving with more monthly visitors than ever before. Many new flat earth YouTube channels began creating and mirroring excellent content. Now, at the turn of 2017, I am truly pleased with the rapid growth of this wonderful Flat Earth movement, and I encourage everyone to please help speak out, share this video, and spread the good word as we look forward to a future where humanity is finally free from this grandest of all deceptions. Nowadays, and for the past five centuries, since the introduction of the heliocentric globe deception, all world maps and explorers have depicted and described the North Pole and surrounding region as being nothing but an arbitrary point in a semi-frozen tundra. Previous to this, however, depictions and descriptions of the North Pole and surrounding regions in world maps and ancient explorers' accounts were very different. Firstly, before the 16th century, the North Pole was never once shown or thought to be just some random, ambiguous point amidst a low-salinity Arctic Ocean as it is now. Instead, the North Pole was universally described and depicted from diverse cultures all across the Earth as being a gigantic magnetic mountain situated directly below Polaris. The prevailing belief was that compass needles the world over were actually pointing to a huge lodestone mountain made of magnetite at the pole. In contrast to today's prevailing belief that compass needles are pointing to some constantly moving magnetic field generated by hypothetical molten metal existing at the center of a fantastical globe earth. While neither claim can be confirmed or denied without independent exploration and experimentation, it should be noted that nowhere in nature can we find molten metal which retains any significant magnetic properties once heated past the Curie point, let alone create some convoluted, constantly moving dipolar field as is claimed by proponents of the fantasy ball earth. Ancient Buddhist, Vedic, and Jain traditional cosmologies all state that at the North Pole magnetic center point of Earth exists a circular mountain of magnetite called Mount Meru. Puranic and Sumerian traditions also referred to this place calling it Mount Sumeru. In ancient Iran they spoke of Mount Hara Barazati with a celestial spring on its highest peak in the realm of the stars. In early Chinese writings, there is Mount Kunlun, with a bronze pillar of heaven at the summit where the immortals dwell, 
often also called the Pearl Mountain, a paradise home of four great rivers around which the heavens revolve. The Turkmen tribes of southern Turkestan told of a copper pillar that marks the navel of the earth. The Mongols wrote of Mount Sumer, with the Zambu tree on its summit. The Buryats of Siberia talked of Mount Sumur, with the North Pole Star fastened to its summit. The Siberian Dalmaks spoke of a mountain lake from which four rivers flow to the points of the compass. The Egyptians wrote of the mound of the first time, which was the first land to appear from the waters, and is the dwelling place of the high god, the source of light. The Muslims wrote of Kaf, and the Zoroastrians wrote of Gurnagar, the world encircling mountains. The Navajos spoke of encircled mountain, which was surrounded by four directional mountains. The Dogon tribe of Nigeria told of a cosmic pillar spanning fourteen worlds, which was the roof post of the house of the high god Ama. The Warao Indians of the Orinoco Delta in Venezuela speak of a cosmic axis extending above the center of their earth disk. Ancient Greek mythology referred to Mount Olympus, the home of the gods. The ancient Germans told of Irmensul, a universal column which sustains everything. The Norse Edda spoke of Asgard, the burg of the gods, rising in the center of Midgard, the circular earth. Ptolemy recounted a legend involving magnetic islands which exerted such strong attraction that ships with metal nails were held in place and unable to leave. In the Arabic legend, One Thousand and One Nights, a magnetic mountain pulls all the nails right out of their ship, causing it to fall apart and sink. The second tallest mountain in Tanzania is even named Mount Meru, after its primordial partner at the pole. Richard Thompson wrote, in many traditions, the world mountain is identified symbolically with some local mountain. This is illustrated by Mount Olympus of the Greeks, Mount Albors of the Iranians, and Mount Kunlun of the Chinese. In Near Eastern tradition, the world mountain is the small hill in Jerusalem known as Mount Zion. Thus, the circular continent centered on Jerusalem in medieval maps also possessed a symbolic world mountain. John Phillips wrote, Jerusalem was Paul's lodestone. The ancient mariners who set sail in their little cockle-shell boats tended to hug the coastline, not daring to get too far from land. Aids to navigation were few, and their vessels were at the mercy of wind and wave. The slightest sign of a storm would send them scurrying for refuge. Moreover, the dreams of those old-time venturers were haunted by the thoughts of the fabled lodestone mountain. They believed it had the power to draw their vessels to shipwreck on its shores against all the pull of tide and wind. Isaiah wrote about a mountain, set above all other mountains, in the far recesses of the north, where the gods meet, called Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Genesis, Ezekiel, and Enoch all mention a paradisical Eden, the mountain of God, and source of four main rivers. Genesis 2, 10-14 reads, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted, and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is, which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is Delium, and the onyx stone, and the name of the second river is Gihon, the same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia, and the name of the third river is Hidekel, that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. Muhammad also spoke of four rivers and a divine tree. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, four branches of the celestial Ganges flow out from Brahmapuri on top of Mount Sumeru. In ancient Canaan, Gurili, the mountain of El, was the dwelling of El, the creator, and a place of assembly for the demigods. In one Phoenician ivory carving from around 1000 BC, a deity is shown dressed to represent a mountain with four streams coming out from the mountain god-man at right angles. Similarly, in an ancient Akkadian hymn to the goddess Ishtar, she is addressed as the queen of the mountain of the world and queen of the land of the four rivers of Eric. And she says, I am lord of the steep mountains which tremble whilst their summits reach to the firmament. 
In the Christian apocryphal Book of Enoch, Enoch is taken by angels on a tour of the seven heavens, and while in the third heaven shown magnificent trees producing wonderful fruits with adjacent springs pumping honey, milk, oil, and wine to four directional rivers flowing down into paradisical Eden, an abode specially prepared only for the pious and selfless. Similarly, in the Hindu cosmology, Four trees in Alavarta Varsa stand on great mountains, producing rivers of nectar and honey, like fountains of youth, providing health and vitality to all who drink of them, while the central tallest jambu tree rises to incredible heights and seems to cover all the heavens. Richard Thompson wrote, In the Bhagavata Purana, Mount Sumeru is surrounded by four great mountains, surmounted by four gigantic trees. These include the Jambu tree, after which Jambudweep is named. Four huge lakes of milk, honey, sugarcane juice, and pure water are located between the four mountains, and these lakes confer mystic powers on the celestial beings who bathe in them. There are also four celestial gardens near these lakes. From the foot of each of the four trees, there flows a river that either emerges from the tree itself or from the fruits of the tree. These rivers of honey and different kinds of juice flow throughout the region of Ilavarja Varsa, surrounding Mount Sumeru, and they confer freedom from fatigue, disease, and old age on the inhabitants of that region. The Yaku people of northeastern Siberia have their own strikingly similar ancient myth where a world tree of immeasurable age exists at the navel of the earth, just like the Hindu Jambu tree is born of the umbilical knot of Brahma. The Yaku world tree reaches into the high heavens with cones nine fathoms long and sap which imparts youthfulness on all who consume it. Near the Yaku tree also lies a lake of sweet milk, which is where the popular modern Japanese milk company Yaku doubtless gets its inspiration. Richard Thompson wrote, In different traditions, the upper and lower worlds may be divided into several levels, often seven or nine. In the center of the earth disk, there is a world mountain or world pillar that links middle earth to the lower and upper worlds. The world mountain represents the polar axis and the dwellings of great demigods are located on its summit. The world mountain may be surrounded by other mountains that define the cardinal directions and these directions may be associated with certain colors. Four sacred rivers may also flow from the world mountain in the four cardinal directions. There is a world tree that is often situated on the world mountain, or four world trees may be located on the neighboring directional mountains. The world tree extends from the earth to the heavens, and it is nearly immortal. It is the source of rivers of nectar or pure water that give health and longevity to those who drink them. The tree stands in an earthly paradise where there are celestial gardens and rivers of various substances, such as milk, oil, and honey. The tree or world pillar is often associated with a great eagle-like bird that is the enemy of great serpents dwelling in the lower world. In ancient Iranian thought, a mountain called Hera Berazati, or Alborj, stands at the center of the earth, a fixed point around which the sun, moon, and stars revolve. At its summit lies the dwelling place of Ormuzd, the Lord of Light, complete with a giant miraculous tree an Edenic garden of Ahura Mazda, and the celestial fountain Ardusur, which is the mother of all earthly water, and flows down towards four cardinal points into four large streams. The bridge Chinavad reaches from the peak of Alborj to the solid vault of heaven, or Gorodman, the home of the pious and blessed, whilst underneath lies the great gulf of Dozak, the abysmal abode of the Lord of Darkness, Araman. The earliest cosmogony recorded by the Japanese in their most ancient book, the Kojiki, once again mirrors this recurring mythology. In the beginning, Izanagi and Izanani, the great god and goddess, standing in heaven, drove a celestial spear into the endless sea and twisted it around until an island rose from the water. They then descended from heaven to earth and built a palace around the huge spear, using it as the central pillar. This spear became the central axis of the world, and their palace the birthplace of the human race. 
in the Kojiki and Shinto religion, the Creator and the North Pole are so purposely and inseparably linked that one of the often used names of God translates to the Lord of the Center of Heaven. The Ainos, supposed first inhabitants of Japan, whose name means offspring of the centered, are believed to have arrived onto the archipelago from the north, and bury their dead facing north to where their ancestors came and to which their spirits would return. In Buddhist funeral ceremonies, bodies are cremated in special crematoriums actually called meru, which are essentially tall stone pillars with four doors at the peak aligned to the cardinal directions with the belief that our reincarnated souls will pass Mount Meru before returning to earthly bodies. Literally every temple and the little spirit house shrines found in most Buddhist homes are also representations of Meru, the abode of the gods, aligned to the four cardinal directions and opulently embellished with gold, jewelry, and metaphysical artwork. Dr. William Warren wrote, Copen assures us that every orthodoxly constructed Buddhist temple either is or contains a symbolical representation of the divine regions of Meru and of the heaven of the gods, saints, and Buddhas rising above it. Lily says, the thirteen pyramidal layers at the top of every temple in Nepal represent the thirteen unchangeable heavens of Amitabha. Faber develops the evidence of this practice among the ancients with great fullness, and with respect to the Hindus and Buddhists, says, each pagoda, each pyramid, each montiform high place is invariably esteemed to be a copy of the holy hill Maru. Ancient South American traditions also believed the human race was birthed in the farthest north, upon the highest of mountains, surrounded by perpetual clouds, fountainhead of the world's waters, and home of god Tlaloc, residing on their sacred paradise mountains, Tlapalan. The first man, Quetzalcoatl, was said to have drank the water of immortality from Tlaloc's mountain, and ruled as king throughout the Golden Age in Mexico. The many Incan, Mayan, Aztec, and other steppe pyramids and temples aligned to cardinal directions and devoted to the gods are representative of this world mountain. Interestingly enough, many modern Mexican myths now represent the mountain as crooked or partially turned over. Similarly, in the ancient Chinese Taoist tradition, a myth over 4,000 years old refers to Shang Te, the highest of all gods, who lives in Si Wei, described as a celestial space above the North Pole. Shang Te's abode is said to exist directly over the peak of Mount Kunlun, which again places the highest god at Polaris. As with the other cosmologies, Mount Kunlun is a primeval paradise, abode of the gods, with a world tree in the middle and a fountain of immortality from which four rivers flow outwards to the four corners of the earth. Dr. William Warren wrote, Sparkling fountains and purling streams contain the far-famed ambrosia, one may there rest on flowery carpeted swards, listening to the melodious warbling of birds, or feasting upon the delicious fruits, at once fragrant and luscious, which hang from the branches of the luxuriant groves. Whatever there is beautiful in landscape or grand in nature may also be found there in the highest state of perfection. All is charming, all enchanting, and whilst nature smiles, the company of genie delights the ravished visitor. Where now is the Paradise Mountain located? At the North Pole. Immediately over the central peak of Kunlun appears the Polar Star, which is Shang Te's heavenly abode. In the central place, the Polar Star of Heaven, the one bright one, the great monad, always dwells. In accordance with this conception, the Emperor and his assistants, when officiating before the altar of Heaven, always face the North. The Pole Star itself is a prominent object of worship. Both the ancient Orientals and Greeks turned to face north before commencing prayer. Homer states that when addressing the gods of Mount Olympus, they would stretch their arms toward the northern sky, and Plato also confirms that this holy habitation of Zeus was placed in the center of the world. Heraclitus said that it touches the ether and casts a shadow five thousand stadia in length. 
Herodotus stated the mountain to be very tapering and round, so lofty, moreover, that the top cannot be seen, the clouds never quitting it either summer or winter. The natives call this mountain the pillar of heaven, and they themselves take their name from it, being called Atlantes. They are reported not to eat any living thing. Strabo claimed it was an earthly paradise, with gigantic olive trees and grape clusters a cubit in length. Pliny described a river of milk descending from great heights, and called the mountain a fabulosissimum. Maximus Tyrius claimed the ocean waves stopped short before reaching the mountain, standing up like a wall around its base, though unrestrained by any earthly barrier. Nothing but the air and the sacred thicket prevent the water from reaching the mountain. In the Phaedo, Socrates is quoted as saying, All things that grow, trees and flowers and fruit, are fairer than any here, and there are hills and stones in them, smoother and more transparent and fairer in color than our highly valued emeralds and sardonyx and jaspers and other gems, which are but minute fragments of them. For there all the stones are like our precious stones, and fairer still. The temperament of their seasons is such that the inhabitants have no disease and live much longer than we do, and have sight and hearing and smell and all the other senses in much greater perfection, and they have temples and sacred places in which the gods really dwell, and they hear their voices and receive their answers and are conscious of them and hold converse with them, and they see the sun, the moon, and stars as they really are. Dr. William Warren wrote, the evidence that in ancient Hellenic thought also the heaven of the gods was in the northern sky is incidental, but cumulative and satisfactory. For example, heaven is upheld by Atlas, but the terrestrial station of Atlas, as we have elsewhere shown, is at the North Pole. Again, Olympus was the abode of the gods, but if the now generally current etymology of this term is correct, Olympus was simply the Atlantean pillar pictured as a lofty mountain, and supporting the sky at its northern pole. In fact, many writers now affirm that the Olympus of Greek mythology was originally simply the north polar world mountain of the Asiatic nations. The ancient Germanic and Finnish people also, when praying or sacrificing to the gods, always faced north, and in the Scandinavian Eddas, both Asgard and Idavalar are represented as the navel, or center of the world. For them, atop the Yggdrasil tree at Earth's center was the heavenly Asgard, home of the gods. Today we still pay respect to this primitive tradition at Christmas when we top our symbolic world trees with a bright yellow pole star. Dr. William Warren wrote, We have already seen that the term navel was anciently used in many languages for center, and that the pole or central point of the revolving constellations was the navel of heaven. But as to the celestial pole, there corresponds a terrestrial one, so it is only natural that to the term the navel of heaven there should be the corresponding expression the navel of the earth. Beginning with Christian traditions, let us make a pilgrimage to the church of the Holy Sepulchre at Jerusalem. There, in the portion belonging to the Greek Christians, we shall discover a round pillar, some two feet high, projecting from the marble pavement but supporting nothing. If we inquire as to its purpose, we shall be informed that it is designed to mark the exact center or navel of the earth. Early pilgrims and chroniclers refer to this curious monument, but its antiquity no one knows. In the Indian Puranas, both the terms navel of the earth and navel of heaven are used repeatedly and always referring to a place not in or near India, but rather at the North Pole. Hymns from the Rig Veda speak of the supporting column of heaven, otherwise known as the Atlas Pillar of Vedic Cosmology, and describe it as standing upon the navel of earth. In the fifth verse of the 185th hymn, day and night are represented as twin sisters in the bosom of their parents, heaven and earth, where they lock arms and spin circles around a common center point, namely the navel. This is also echoed in a mysterious passage by Quintus Curtius, which has baffled modern commentators, stating how the object which represented the divine being resembled a navel set in gems. Dr. William Warren wrote, 
If anything is needed to disprove the common notion that geographical ignorance and national self-esteem first governed the ancient peoples in locating in their own countries navels of the earth, it is furnished by what is, in all probability, the oldest epic in the world, that of Izubar, fragments of which have survived in the oldest literature of Babylonia. These fragments show that the earliest inhabitants of the Tigro-Euphrates basin located the center of the earth, not in their own midst, but in a far-off land of sacred associations where the holy house of the gods is situated, a land into the heart whereof man hath not penetrated, a place underneath the overshadowing world tree and beside the full waters. No description could more perfectly identify the spot with the arctic pole of ancient Asiatic mythology. Yet this testimony stands not alone, for in the fragment of another ancient text, translated by Sais in the records of the past, we are told of a dwelling which the gods created for the first human beings, a dwelling in which they became great and increased in numbers, and the location of which is described in words exactly corresponding to those of Iranian, Indian, Chinese, Edaic, and Aztec literature, namely, in the center of the earth. Among the ancient Inca subjects of Peru was found the same idea of a navel of the earth, and even among the Chickasaws of Mississippi. Thus is all ancient thought full of this legendary idea of a mysterious primeval holy paradisic earth center, a spot connected as is no other with the center of heaven, the paradise of God. Why it should be so no one has ever told us, but the hypothesis which places the biblical Eden at the pole, and makes all latter earth navels commemorative of that primal one, affords a perfect explanation. In the light of it, there is no difficulty in understanding that earth center in Jerusalem with which we began, the inconspicuous pillar in the church of the Holy Sepulchre, symbolizes and commemorates far more than the geographical ignorance of medieval ages. It stands for the Japanese pillar by which the first soul born upon earth mounted to the sky. It stands for the world column of the East Aryans in the Chinvat Bridge of Iran. It stands for the law-proclaiming pillar of Orichalcum in Atlantis, placed in the center of the most central land. It stands for that Talmudic pillar by means of which the tenants of the terrestrial paradise mount to the celestial, and having spent the Sabbath return to pass the week below. It symbolizes Cardo, Atlas, Meru, Hera Berezatai, Karsakura, every fabulous mountain on whose top the sky pivots itself, and around which all the heavenly bodies ceaselessly revolve. It perpetuates a religious symbolism which existed in its region before ever Jerusalem had been made the Hebrew capital, recalling to our modern world the Tabur Haaretz of a period anterior to the days of Samuel. In tradition, it is said to mark the precise spot whence the clay was taken, out of which the body of Adam was modeled. It does so, but it does it in a language and method which were common to all the most ancient nations of the earth. It points not to the soil in which it stands, but to the holier soil of a far away primitive Eden. In Freemasonic temples, on Freemasonic tracing boards, and upon Freemasonic aprons can be found similar symbolism pointing to these concepts namely a flat earth framed by pillars, covered by an arch firmament, often with the tallest or most prominent pillar positioned centrally and a single eye representing Polaris situated above it. The sun and moon are also usually shown on either side representing their paths and positions over and around the flat earth. This knowledge was clearly widespread among the ancient world, but in modern times has become occulted by certain such secret societies and vested interests. Dr. William Warren wrote, Everywhere, therefore, in the most ancient ethnic thought, in the Egyptian, Akkadian, Assyrian, Babylonian, Indian, Persian, Chinese, and Greek, everywhere is encountered this conception of what looked at with respect to its base and magnitude is called the mountain of the world, but looked at with respect to its glorious summit and its celestial inhabitants is styled the mountain of the gods. We need not pursue the investigation further. Enough has been said to warrant the assertion of Dr. Samuel Beale. It is plain that this idea of a lofty central primeval mountain belonged to the undivided human race. Elsewhere, the same learned synologue has said, 
I have no doubt that the idea of a central mountain, and of the rivers flowing from it, and the abode of the gods upon its summit, is a primitive myth derived from the earliest traditions of our race. In concluding this sketch of ancient cosmology, one further question naturally and inevitably thrusts itself upon us. It is this. How are the rise and the so wide diffusion of this singular worldview to be explained? In other words, how came it to pass that the ancestors of the oldest historic races and peoples agreed to regard the North Pole as the true summit of the earth and the circumpolar sky as the true heaven? The ancient world's mythologies regarding a magnetic mountain, four directional rivers, and other more fantastical features at the North Pole are shockingly consistent. But what did the earliest known explorers, historians, and cartographers have to say about the subject? Pythias, the earliest recorded explorer of the North Pole in the 4th century BC, claimed to discover an island he called Thule, or Thule, the farthest northern land, and gave an account sounding straight out of ancient mythology. In his lost book entitled On the Ocean, Pythias wrote, the island was more than 40,000 stadia, and in this region there was no longer either land properly so called, or sea or air, but a kind of substance concreted from all these elements, resembling a sea lungs, a thing which the earth, the sea, and all the elements are held in suspension, and this is a sort of bond to hold all together, which you can neither walk nor sail upon. Pythias claimed upon reaching the northernmost point accessible that land, air, and water somehow became like one substance similar to a jellyfish and was completely impassable. Little remains of Pythias's original account, but second-hand sources like Strabo inform us regarding the inhabitants of the surrounding northern islands. He says that of the animals and domesticated fruits there is an utter dearth of some and scarcity of others and that the people live on millet and other herbs, and on fruits and roots, and where there are grain and honey, the people get their beverage also from them. As for the grain, he says, since they have no pure sunshine, they pound it out in large storehouses, after first gathering in the ears thither, for the threshing floors become useless because of this lack of sunshine, and because of the rains. Pliny the Elder also wrote of Pythias's journey in his Naturalis Historia, stating that on summer days the sun approached nearer to the top of the world, owing to a natural circuit of light, the underlying parts of the earth of continuous days for six months at a time, and continuous nights when the sun has withdrawn in the opposite direction towards winter. Pythias of Morellus writes that this occurs in the island of Thule, Six days' voyage north from Britain, Pythias states that north of Britain the tides rise eighty cubits. The most remote of all is Thule, in which we have pointed out there are no nights at midsummer when the sun is passing through the sign of the crab, and on the other hand, no days at midwinter. Indeed, some writers think this is the case for periods of six months at a time without a break. One day's sail from Thule is the frozen ocean called by some the Cronian Sea. Benjamin Franklin da Costa wrote, The earliest voyage to the north that is claimed for Pythias, the distinguished Phoenician astronomer and geographer of Marcells, who flourished 320 BC. His works were extant in the 5th century, but are no longer found. Pliny and Eratosthenes gave full credit to his narrations, though Strabo shows great hostility to Pythias, whose accounts he refused to receive, saying that he made use of his acquaintance with astronomy and mathematics to fabricate his false narrative. Pliny, however, with more reason, thought that he employed his knowledge in practical exploration. The latest editor of Strabo does not share in his author's doubt. According to Pliny and others, Pythias sailed through the Straits of Gibraltar, making his way north to the British Isles, whither it was the custom of his countrymen to resort, and after traveling over England on foot, proceeded northward to a place called Thule, six days' sail from the northern part of Britain. Even before the 4th century BC, similar claims were made by ancient Greek and Roman poets and historians like Pindar, Herodotus, Hesiod, Homer, 
then later Virgil and Cicero, regarding Hyperborea and the Hyperboreans, meaning place or people beyond the north wind. They said the people of Hyperborea were giants who lived for over a thousand years and enjoyed lives of perfect happiness. In another lost book, written in the 4th century BC, Hecatus of Abdera collated all the known stories written about the Hyperboreans. Diodorus Siculus references this lost work, stating that in the regions beyond the land of the Celts, there lies in the ocean an island no smaller than Sicily. This island, the account continues, is situated in the north and is inhabited by the Hyperboreans, who are called by that name because their home is beyond the point whence the north wind, Boreas, blows, and the island is both fertile and productive of every crop and has a temperate climate. The classical Greek poet Pindar wrote that Never the muse is absent from their ways. Lyres clash and flutes cry, and everywhere maiden choruses whirling. Neither disease nor bitter old age is mixed in their sacred blood. Far from labor and battle they live. And reminiscent of Pythias's strange account, Pindar stated that Neither by ship nor on foot would you find the marvelous road to the assembly of the Hyperboreans. Similar to Thule and Hyperborea, the Celts also had their northern terrestrial paradise, known as Avalon. St. Brandon, son of Finn Logo, a famous saint of the Irish church, who died in 576 AD, was allegedly the first to reach this land during a sea voyage to the north. Similar to other ancient accounts, St. Brandon mentioned a fountain with four directional streams and claimed there were magnificent castles and castle halls lighted with self-luminous stones and adorned with all manner of precious jewels surpassing description. In 1035 AD, Archbishop Adalbert, the vicar of Scandinavia, sent a team of Frisian nobles to explore the northern polar region, after which Adam of Bremen recorded their experiences in the book Gesta Hamaburgensis Ecclesiae Pontificum. Similar to accounts of the Hyperboreans, the Frisian explorers claimed to reach an island where they encountered giant human beings living in caves and underground hollows. The giant's domiciles were adorned in gold and precious metals, which some of the Frisians stupidly attempted to steal and were swiftly chased back to their boats, minus one of their comrades caught by a giant who, quote, in a twinkling tore him to pieces before their eyes. They never reached the North Pole or a magnetic mountain, but did encounter an incredible feature long alleged to surround them. Ancient Norse legend states that a gigantic violent maelstrom or whirlpool known as Virgulmer, or the world's well, surrounds the polar mountain and via four, six-hour daily cycles of pushing and pulling through subterranean channels cause the rising and falling of tides on earth. Adam of Bremen recounts the Frisian explorer's deadly encounter with this abysmal chasm as such. Of a sudden they fell into that numbing ocean's dark mist which could hardly be penetrated with the eyes, and behold, the current of the fluctuating ocean whirled back to its mysterious fountainhead, and with most furious impetuosity drew the unhappy sailors, who in their despair now thought only of death, on to chaos. This, they say, is the abysmal chasm, that deep in which report has it that all the backflow of the sea, which appears to decrease, is absorbed and in turn re-vomited, as the mounting fluctuation is usually described. As the partners were imploring the mercy of God to receive their souls, the backward thrust of the sea carried away some of their ships, but its forward ejection threw the rest far behind the others. Freed thus by the timely help of God from the instant peril they had had before their eyes, they seconded the flood by rowing with all their might. Besides the Norse legends of Virgulmer, historical records of this world well can be found as early as the 8th century AD, when Paulus Diaconus, or Paul the Deacon, Benedictine monk, scribe, and historian of the Lombards, wrote in his Historia Longobardorum that, not far from the shore, where the ocean extends without bounds, is that very deep abyss of waters which we commonly call the ocean's navel. 
it is said twice a day to suck the waves into itself and to spew them out again, as is proved to happen all along these coasts, where the waves rush in and go back again with fearful rapidity. By the whirlpool of which we have spoken, it is asserted that ships are often drawn in with such rapidity that they seem to resemble the flight of arrows through the air, and sometimes they are lost in the gulf with a very frightful destruction. Often, just as they are about to go under, they are brought back again by a sudden shock of the waves, and they are sent out again thence with the same rapidity with which they were drawn in. Geraldus Cambrensis, or Gerald of Wales, Archdeacon of Brecon, historian and royal clerk to King Henry the Second, wrote in his 1188 work, Topographia Hibernica, that, not far from the islands towards the north, there is an astonishing whirlpool in the sea, towards which there is a set of current of the waves from all corners, until, pouring themselves into nature's secret recesses, they are swallowed up, as it were, in the abyss. Should a vessel chance to pass in that direction, it is caught and drawn along by the force of the waves, and sucked by the vortex without chance of escape. There are four of these whirlpools in the ocean, described by philosophers as existing in the four different quarters of the world, whence it has been conjectured that the currents of the sea, as well as the winds, are regulated by fixed principles. The whirlpool was also mentioned in another late twelfth-century work, Historia Norwegia, where the author, an anonymous Norwegian monk, gives a particularly detailed description, stating, The greatest of all whirlpools is to be found there which engulfs the strongest ships, sucking them in at ebb tide, and spewing out their fragments with a belch at flood tide. There is a very deep abyss in the earth itself, and alongside it are open-mouthed caverns containing winds which are said to be brought forth by the breathing of the water, and these are the breath of gales. Indeed, by their breathing, these winds draw to them the waters of the sea. Through hidden passages in the earth, they shut them up in the vaults of the abyss, and then by the same force drive them out again, causing sea surges, spates, and the whirling of water spouts. Earthquakes also occur, and various discharges of vapor and conflagration, for when the wind's breath, held in the cheeks of earth, presses to burst out, it shakes the foundation of the world with a dreadful roaring, and forces it to tremble. So when the wind's breath contends with fire in the earth's interior, then even in mid-ocean, the depths are fissured, and smoky exhalations and sulphurous flames are seen to emerge. By the 13th century AD, the idea of a magnetic mountain at the North Pole was widely known enough that Italian poet Guido Guinazelli actually used it as a simile for the power of his woman's love. The section from his poem, Madonna, the fine love I give you, translated reads, In that land beneath the north wind, are the magnetic mountains, which transmit to the air their power, to attract the iron, but because it is far away, it needs help from a similar stone, to make the compass needle turn towards the pole star. In the 14th century, two lost books, Inventio Fortunata, by Nicholas de Lynn, and the Itinerium of Jacobus Sinoian, mention the magnetic mountain, four directional rivers, and encircling whirlpool, said to change every six hours, causing the tides, comparing them to the breath of God at the navel of the earth, inhaling and exhaling the great seas. Many citations from the two books are made by more modern sources, but surviving copies have unfortunately all been lost to antiquity. Nicholas de Lynn was an English Minorite friar of Oxford, a mathematician, astronomer, and explorer, who lived from 1330 to 1390. He was fascinated by the astrolabe, and actually produced several of them for patrons and his own personal use. John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, even commissioned Nicholas to produce an astrolabe and a calendarium of complete astronomical tables covering 1387 to 1463, which were later used to create nautical almanacs. For this, Nicholas became famously known as the man with the astrolabe, and was even complimented and lauded as an astronomical genius by Geoffrey Chaucer in his Treatise on the Astrolabe. His esteem as a knowledgeable astronomer and navigator soon reached King Edward III, 
who in the early 1360s sent Nicholas and a team of ships to explore the Arctic. Benjamin Franklin da Costa wrote, The work by which Nicholas of Lynn will longest be remembered is not now to be found. Its disappearance under any circumstances is not a matter of surprise, since of many important works once well known, no copy remains today, while of others there are only one or two examples. Unfortunately, we know almost as little about the voyages made from Lynn by the fellow townsmen of Nicholas as about the book in question. Many hardy mariners sailed from the port of Lynn, but of their enterprise at the north only the most scanty memorials remain. It is nevertheless clear that their activity was appreciated by Edward III, while their neighbors of Blakeney were several times favored by that king on account of their superior merit. What we know about Nicholas de Lynn, his polar explorations, and his lost book now come from existing citations and quotations from his contemporaries and readers. One such man was Jacobus Snowian, a Dutch explorer who composed a book of travel epics in Flemish, also lost to antiquity, but quoted and reprinted in later works still available. Snowian is referenced as learning from the Minorite Nicholas de Lynn that large parts of the polar indrawing sea did not freeze over in winter. Speaking of Nicholas, Snowian wrote, The priest who had the astrolabe related to the king of Norway that in 1360 AD there had come to these northern islands an English Minorite from Oxford who was a good astronomer. Leaving the rest of the party who had come to the islands, he journeyed further through the whole of the north and put into writing all the wonders of those islands, and gave the king of England this book, which he called in Latin Inventio Fortunate, which book began at latitude 54 degrees, continuing to the pole. Both Nicholas and Snowian's books contained a detailed map of the Arctic derived from Nicholas's journeys, which included a magnetic mountain at the North Pole, four directional streams, encircling whirlpool, and surrounding islands. Luckily for posterity, a version of this map still survives to this day, because it was used for Johannes Ruysch's 1508 map of the world, and later reproduced in detail and published in 1595 by the most well-known cartographer in history responsible for the most popular maps ever created, Gerardus Mercator. On the legend of Ruysch's map, Nicholas de Lin's Inventio Fortunata is referenced as its source, stating that it is written in the book of the fortunate discovery that under the Arctic Pole there is a high magnetic rock 33 German miles in circumference. A surging sea surrounds this rock, as if the water were discharged downward from a vase through an opening to four mouths below. Around are islands, of which two are inhabited. Mountains vast and wide surround these islands, 24 of which deny habitation to man. Another inscription on Ryusha's map describes the incredible magnetic effect of the polar lodestone mountain, stating, Here the ship's compass loses its property, and no vessel with iron on board is able to get away. Chet Van Duzer wrote, A world map by Johannes Ruysch, the Universalier Cogniti Orbis Tabula, published in an edition of Ptolemy's Geographia in Rome in 1508, shows four islands around the North Pole. Two, the one north of Greenland, and its opposite across the Pole, are labeled Insula Deserta. The one north of Europe is that of the Hyperboreans, and the one north of America is labeled Aranfe. He labels the waters within the four islands as the Mare Sugenum, and speaks of a violent whirlpool that sucks the incoming waters down into the earth. In addition, his map shows a ring of small, very mountainous islands around the four islands, which numerous islands, Ryush says, are uninhabited. This would seem to indicate that the book written by Nicholas of Lynn was known to the mapmaker, while also it may have been known at Rome. It is evident that the polar region was drawn more or less in accordance with some plan by Nicholas, which was combined with later material. Around the magnetic rock, immediately under the pole, are four islands, Aronfe, Insula Deserta, Hyperbore Europa, and Insula Deserta. Outside of these islands are smaller and mountainous islands, arranged in a semicircle, 
while the peninsula of Pilipalanti, with its base resting upon Europe, pushes out into this druidic arrangement of islands, bearing up what is intended to represent a church, with the legend Sacti Adolfi. Eastward of this peninsula is the Provisia Obscura and the Mare Sugenum. Westward of Burga Extrema, another peninsula enters the groups of islands which is pierced by Planora de Burga at the extreme west. The Mare Sugenum also fills the west. South of Greenland is Terra Nova, or Newfoundland. From the Mare Sugenum, the water flows northward through the four openings into the polar basin. The arrangement is curious, yet not wholly without resemblance to what is found in nature, for what is called the polar basin is fed by several vast streams pouring into it from the warm regions at the south. These streams also create counter-currents, which flow southward, bearing enormous quantities of the heaviest ice. Swedish historian Olus Magnus wrote of both the magnetic mountain and surrounding whirlpool in his 1555 work Historia de Gentibus Septentrionabilis, a description of the northern peoples, stating it to be a well-known fact that ships in the north must be built with wooden pegs as iron nails would be pulled out by the northern lodestone mountain, and that, quote, between Roest and Lofoten is so great an abyss, or rather Cherubdis, that it suddenly swamps and swallows up in an instant those mariners who incautiously approach. Pieces of wreckage are very seldom thrown up again, and if they come to light, the hard material shows such signs of wear and chafing through being dashed against the rocks that it looks as if it were covered with rough wool. Just two years later, in 1557, English explorer Anthony Jenkinson also wrote of the whirlpool, saying, Note that there is between the said Rost Island and Lofot a whirlpool called Malastrand, which, from half ebb until half flood, maketh such a terrible noise that it shaketh the rings and the doors of inhabitants' houses of the said islands ten miles off. Also, if there cometh any whale within the current of the same, they make a pitiful cry. Moreover, if great trees be carried into it by force of streams, and after would the ebb be cast out again, the ends and boughs of them have been so beaten that they are like the stalks of hemp that is bruised. A few decades later, in 1591, Seanable, a man who was sheriff of Lofoten and Vesterallen for over twenty years, wrote a similar description, claiming that, quote, Iron rings on house doors are shaken hither and thither by the rushing of the current. Whales who cannot go forward on account of the strong stream give a great cry and then are gone. And great trees, spruce or fir, which disappear in this current, and when at last they come up again, then all the boughs, all the roots, and all the bark is torn off, and it is shaped as though it had been cut up with a sharp axe. The most famous mapmaker who ever lived, and likely the only person in the history of cartography to become a household name, Gerardus Mercator, known for his meticulous accuracy and responsible for the popular Mercator projection, lived from 1512 to 1594 and created hundreds of detailed maps. The year after his death, in 1595, his family compiled his life's work into an atlas, which included never-before-released reproductions of Nicholas de Lin's maps of the polar regions, specifically the Septentrionolium Terrarum Descriptio. This incredible map shows the polar magnetic mountain, said to be the highest in the world, named Rupus Nigra, encircling whirlpool, four directional rivers, and surrounding islands in fine detail, along with several revealing inscriptions. Chet Van Duzer wrote, The map shows a North Pole that is very unfamiliar to modern eyes. At the center of the map, and right at the pole, stands a huge black mountain. This mountain was made of lodestone, and was the source of the Earth's magnetic field. The central mountain is surrounded by open water, and then further out by four large islands that form a ring around the pole. The largest of these islands, perhaps 700 by 1100 miles, and they all have high mountains along their southern rims. These islands are separated by four large inward-flowing rivers, which are aligned as if to the four points of the compass, though of course there is no north, east, or west at the North Pole. Every direction from this center is south. 
Mercator's notes inform us that the waters of the oceans are carried northward to the pole through these rivers with great force, such that no wind could make a ship sail against the current. The waters then disappear into an enormous whirlpool beneath the mountain at the pole, and are absorbed into the bowels of the earth. Mercator also tells us that four-foot-tall pygmies inhabit the island closest to Europe. In another inscription made on the map, Mercator informs the reader further regarding the great whirlpool, stating that a monstrous gulf in the sea towards which from all sides the billows of the sea come from remote parts converge and run together as though brought there by conduit, pouring into these mysterious abysses of nature, they are as though devoured thereby, and should it happen that a vessel pass there, it is seized and drawn away with such powerful violence of the waves that this hungry force immediately swallows it up, never to appear again. Gerardus Mercator studied at the University of Louvain in 1549, where he met and befriended another very influential figure of his time, John Dee, astronomer, astrologer, and advisor to Queen Elizabeth I. Dee was convinced that a route to the Indies could be found through the Northwest Passage, and while attempting to interest Queen Elizabeth to support an expedition, he contacted Mercator for more information. In Mercator's 1577 letter back to Dee, we learn he copied verbatim from Jacobus Snowyen's Itinerium, stating that in the midst of the four countries is a whirlpool, into which there empty these four indrawing seas, which divide the north, and the water rushes round and descends into the earth, just as if one were pouring it through a filter funnel. It is four degrees wide on every side of the pole, that is to say eight degrees altogether, except that right under the pole there lies a bare rock in the midst of the sea. Its circumference is almost thirty-three French miles, and it is all of magnetic stone, and is as high as the clouds, so the priest said, who had received the astrolabe from this Minorite in exchange for a testament. And the Minorite himself had heard that one can see all round it from the sea, and that it is black and glistening, and nothing grows thereon, for there is not so much as a handful of soil on it. This is word for word everything that I copied out of this author years ago. As late as the mid-17th century, aspects of these polar phenomena continued appearing in cartography and cosmography. The Euripi, or four indrawing streams, were included or alluded to in Lyschoten's 1595 map, the Ortelius of 1599, Quad's Fasciculus Geographicus of 1608, Hondius's 1619 map, Purchase's map of 1625, and in Halen's 1659 cosmography, he wrote about the Rupus Nigra and surrounding whirlpool in Euripi, stating that, under the Arctic Pole is said to be a black rock of wondrous height, about 33 leagues in compass, the land adjoining being torn by the sea into four great islands, for the ocean violently breaking through it, and disgorging itself by nineteen channels, maketh four Euripi, or fierce whirlpools, by which the waters are finally carried towards the north, and these swallowed into the bowels of the earth. That Euripis, or whirlpool, which is made by the Scythic ocean, hath five inlets, and by reason of his straight passage and violent course is never frozen. The other, on the back of Greenland, being thirty-seven leagues long, hath three inlets, and remaineth frozen three months yearly. Between these two lieth an island, on the north of Lapia and Biarmia, inhabited, as they say, by pygmies, the tallest of them not above four foot high. A certain scholar of Oxford reporteth that these four Euripi are carried with such furious violence towards some gulf in which they are finally swallowed up, that no ship is able with never so strong a gale to stem the current, and yet there is never so strong a wind as to blow a windmill. There is modern circumstantial evidence that lends strong credence to this idea as well. The largest publicly known maelstrom in the world is called Saltstrumen, just north of the Arctic Circle in Norway, where 400 million cubic meters of water pass through a 3-kilometer-long, 150-meter-wide strait, reaching speeds of 10 meters per second. Similar to legends of Virgilmer, this northern whirlpool actually arises exactly four times per day, every six hours, along with the shifting of the tides. In fact, 
the majority of naturally occurring whirlpools in the world, including the famous Naruto whirlpools in Japan, form four times per day, every six hours, as the tides change. If the entire ancient world's mythologies, along with early explorers, historians, and cartographers, all shared similar accounts of a polar magnetic mountain, encircling whirlpool, four directional streams, and surrounding islands occupied by giants and or pygmies, why is it that no modern accounts of the North Pole have a single mention of any such thing? How is it possible for such consistency in polar geography to exist throughout the ancient world? Why have all these features suddenly disappeared from modern maps? Were the ancients all completely mistaken with regards to the North Pole? Or are we now, in modern times, the victims of a concerted cover-up, and being deceived about what is really at the Pole? At the turn of the 17th century, shortly after Queen Elizabeth's advisor John Dee was corresponding with Gerardus Mercator regarding the Polar Magnetic Mountain, Queen Elizabeth's personal physician and knighted president of the College of Physicians, Sir William Gilbert, wrote his opus, De Magnet, in which he argued against the prevailing belief of a polar magnetic mountain, claiming instead the earth itself to be a great magnet. Coming in the wake of the Copernican Revolution, Gilbert's new model, in stark contrast to the long-held, now deemed unscientific notion that compass needles were attracted to a lodestone mountain at the pole, proposed that the Copernican ball earth actually generated magnetism from a hypothetical molten metal core, which caused a constantly moving dipolar magnetic field over the globe. To this day, Gilbert's hypothesis remains pure speculation, since no one in history has ever come close to penetrating or perceiving the supposed 3,950 miles to the ball earth's core. In reality, the deepest drilling operation in history, the Russian Kola Ultra Deep, after decades of work and dozens of broken drills, managed to penetrate only eight miles down. So the entire ball earth model taught in schools, showing detailed descriptions of a crust, outer mantle, inner mantle, outer core, and inner core layers, are all purely speculative, as we have never even broken through beyond the crust. Furthermore, there is nowhere in nature that molten metal retains any significant magnetic properties once heated past the Curie point, let alone create some convoluted, constantly moving, dipolar field, as Gilbert claimed then, and proponents of the globe still maintain today. Several decades after Gilbert's de Magnet made its impression on the world, Another knighted president of the Royal Society, Sir Isaac Newton, would write the influential Principia Mathematica, where he proposed the concept of gravity to account, among other things, for how people could exist without falling off the underside of Copernicus's ball earth. Coincidentally, or perhaps conspiratorially, a couple centuries later, it would be yet another royally knighted man, Sir Ernest Shackleton of the Royal Navy, who would allegedly complete that upside-down journey under the globe, becoming the first person to reach the so-called Southern Magnetic Pole. Back when the Earth was perceived as a level plain, there was only one pole, the North Pole, directly below Polaris, which was both geographically and magnetically the center point of Earth. Due to the hypothetical globe's hypothetical dipolar magnetic core, however, there suddenly became new frontiers to discover. Not only did Earth have a geographic North Pole in the Arctic, but now its geographic antipode, the South Pole in the Antarctic. Since Gilbert's magnetic poles were caused by perpetually shifting molten metal, there now also came into existence constantly moving northern and southern magnetic poles as well. And lastly, Earth's magnetic field was claimed asymmetrical, so that the constantly moving north and south magnetic poles were not even antipodal, meaning a straight line drawn from one to the other failed to pass through the geometric center of their globe. To account for this, two more theoretical poles, known as the geomagnetic north and geomagnetic south poles, were also added into the convoluted mix. 
With this, after centuries of failed expeditions to the Pole, the first decade of the 20th century would suddenly claim the discoveries of the Northern Magnetic Pole, the Southern Magnetic Pole, and shortly thereafter both the geographic and geomagnetic North and South Poles as well. This turn of the century rush to the Poles was not without its problems, however, and many explorers' supposed polar achievements during this era are now regarded, even by mainstream historians, as being riddled with fraud and falsehoods. Before the alleged 20th century successes, many attempts were made to reach the North Pole during the 19th century, all of which failed. In 1827, knighted British Royal Navy Rear Admiral Sir William Perry reached a record 82 degrees 45 minutes north latitude before being forced to turn back due to impassable thick ice. In 1845, another knighted British Royal Navy officer, Sir John Franklin, and his ill-fated two-ship 129-man crew all died during their attempt at the pole after becoming stuck in the ice and everyone subsequently succumbing to starvation, hypothermia, tuberculosis, lead poisoning, zinc deficiency, and or scurvy. In 1875, yet another knighted British Royal Navy officer, in fact, the Knight Commander of the Royal Order of Bath, Admiral Sir Albert Markham, made an attempt at the pole, reaching a new record, 83 degrees, 20 minutes north latitude, before turning back due to rampant scurvy and lack of equipment. In 1895, Norwegian explorers Fritzjof Nansen and Jalmer Johansen made a record-breaking 86 degrees 14 minutes north attempt before turning back because of lack of food and supplies. Then in 1899, Duke of the Abruzzi, member of the Royal House of Savoy and Italian Navy Admiral Prince Luigi Amedio set another record, just barely beating out the Norwegians, reaching 86 degrees 34 minutes north latitude, before becoming stuck in the ice and losing two fingers to frostbite. Finally, on September 1st, 1909, Arctic explorer Frederick Cook became the first person in modern times to claim attainment of the North Pole when he cabled from the Shetland Islands after a 15-month trek back alleging to have reached the Pole on April 21st, 1908. That day, the evening mail headlined, Dr. Cook Reaches North Pole, and the next day, the New York Herald headlined, The North Pole is Discovered by Dr. Frederick A. Cook, who cables to the Herald an exclusive account of how he set the American flag on the world's top. The news sent America and the rest of the world into a frenzy of media-fueled excitement, hailing Cook as a hero. Meanwhile, another Arctic explorer, U.S. Navy Admiral Robert Perry, happened to be at that very moment traveling home from his own polar expedition. Just five days after Cook's cable, on September 6, 1909, Perry cabled from Labrador that he too had recently, quote, nailed the American flag to the pole on April 6, 1909, a year after Cook's claim. When informed of Cook's news, Perry cabled that Cook's claim, quote, should not be taken seriously, as he just stood atop the pole and found no trace of Cook or anyone else having been there. On September 7th, the New York Herald headlined, Robert E. Perry, after 23-year siege, reaches North Pole. But to Perry's utter disappointment, his claim to be first to the pole was not widely accepted. Perry immediately sprang into action, obtaining and cabling confessions from Cook's Eskimo guides, making the evening telegram headline for September 8, 1909. Perry quotes Eskimos as saying Cook was not out of sight of land, and with this began a heated rivalry between two former friends and Arctic travel companions that would eventually end with both men and their polar attainment claims being completely discredited. Paul Simpson Housley wrote, The claimed attainment of the North Pole generated enormous controversy and acrimony. Both Cook and Perry boasted that they were the first to reach the Pole. Cook's North Polar Expedition, which dates from July 3, 1907 to September 21, 1909, 
began from Gloucester, Massachusetts, and was sponsored by John Bradley. Cook visited Etah in northwest Greenland, and then proceeded north to Anoratok. Here, he became convinced that he could reach the North Pole. Subsequently, he returned to Etah in order to prepare for the journey, and solicited assistance from Inuit. They advanced again to Anoratok, and on February 19, 1908, set out for the North Pole. Cook's route took him and his men via Smith Sound to Cape Sabine, to Flagler Bay, and then across Ellesmere Island to Bay Fjord. From there they proceeded to Eureka Sound and established a camp at Cape Stalworthy, located at the northern extremity of Axel Heiberg Island, where most of his party remained. Cook himself set out for the pole with two Inuit, Awela and Etukashuk, two sledges and twenty-six dogs. He insisted that he reached the North Pole on April 21, 1908. Perry's polar venture occurred between July 6, 1908 and September 21, 1909. It was sponsored by the Perry Arctic Club, and the party strived to reach the North Pole from Ellesmere Island. Perry's ships, the Roosevelt and Eric, collected 22 Inuit men and 17 Inuit women in addition to 246 dogs in northwest Greenland. Winter quarters were at Cape Sheridan in northeast Ellesmere Island. After arriving there on September 5, 1908, Perry transferred stores to Cape Columbia, located on the north of the island, and the selected place from which the assault on the pole was to be made. Perry's polar advance commenced in February 1909. Support parties led by Bartlett, Borup, Marvin, Macmillan, and Godsell had the task of carrying provisions, establishing a trail, and providing igloos for Perry and Henson, who were to lead the assault on the pole. The support parties turned back. The last to do so was led by Bartlett, who retreated on April 1, 1909, from latitude 87.47 north. Perry, Henson, and four Inuit continued their approach to the pole, which they claimed to reach on April 6, 1909. A Cook-Perry controversy resulted. On September 2, 1909, Cook published his claim to have reached the pole. Perry's rival claim was submitted four days subsequently. So after centuries of unsuccessful, ill-fated attempts at the pole, within the space of just four days, two American explorers claimed to be the first successes. Cook's journal description of his heroic arrival at the pole reads more like a piece of poetic fiction than an actual experience, however, which has raised questions from skeptics. He wrote, Constantly and carefully, I watched my instruments in recording this final reach. Nearer and nearer they recorded our approach. Step by step, my heart filled with a strange rapture of conquest. At last, we step over colored fields of sparkle, climbing walls of purple and gold. Finally, under skies of crystal blue, with flaming clouds, we touch the mark. The soul awakens to a definite triumph. There is sunrise within us, and all the world of night-darkened trouble fades. We are at the top of the world. The flag is flung to the frigid breezes of the North Pole. The first realization of actual victory, of reaching my lifetime's goal, set my heart throbbing violently and my brain aglow. I felt the glory which the prophet feels in his vision with which the poet thrills in his dream. I saw silver and crystal palaces, such as were never built by man, with turrets flaunting pinions glorious golden. The shifting mirages seemed like the ghosts of dead armies, magnified and transfigured, huge and spectral, moving along the horizon and bearing the wind-tossed phantoms of golden blood-stained banners. I was at a spot which was as near as possible, by usual methods of determination, 520 miles from Svartavoeg, a spot towards which men had striven for more than three centuries, a spot known as the North Pole, and where I stood first of white men. Perry's journal description of his arrival at the Pole sounded more down-to-earth and believable, but doubt would soon be cast over his claims as well. He wrote, The Pole at last, the prize of three centuries, my dream and goal for twenty years, mine at last. I cannot bring myself to realize it. It seems all so simple and commonplace. 
while we traveled the sky cleared and at the end of the journey i was able to get a satisfactory series of observations at columbia meridian midnight these observations indicated that our position was then beyond the pole in a march of only a few hours i had passed from the western to the eastern hemisphere and had verified my position at the summit of the world it was hard to realize that on the first miles of this brief march we had been traveling due north while on the last few miles of the same march we had been traveling south although we had all the time been traveling precisely in the same direction in traveling the ice in these various directions as i had done i had allowed approximately ten miles for possible errors in my observations and at some moment during these marches and countermarches i had passed over or very near the point where the north and south and east and west blend into one thus starting in september nineteen o nine a huge public debate fueled by the newspapers raged over who was truly first to the north pole with the new york times showing unwavering support for perry and the new york herald doing the same for cook the demand of proof in the form of navigational records was issued and subsequently avoided by both sides cook never produced any detailed original navigation records to substantiate his polar claim and on december twenty first nineteen o nine after examining what little evidence cook did submit a commission at the university of copenhagen ruled there was no proof he had reached the pole cook's inuit guides would also testify in handwritten documents that during their final push for the pole they actually traveled south not north and never once did they travel out of sight of land meanwhile perry outright refused to submit his records for the copenhagen commission forcing them to also conclude a lack of proof for his claim cook later alleged to have kept copies of his sextant navigation data and in nineteen eleven published some only to be exposed as having an incorrect solar diameter during his calculations the national geographic society held perry's papers for decades refusing researchers any access to them and when finally independently examined were also shown to be lacking the released documentation listed only three solar observations without giving the date no mention of which limb of the sun perry observed and claimed the star betelgeuse was present when it could not have been detected by a sextant during that time of year perry never produced records of compass readings observed data for steering for his longitudinal position at any time and for the final stage in his expedition never took latitudinal or transversal readings and had no accompanying colleagues trained in navigation who could confirm or deny his work even though cook's own navigational data was found to be flawed he would still publicly criticize perry's alleged sextant readings stating mr perry's polar claim rests upon the impossible observations of a sun at an altitude of less than seven degrees above the horizon the three armchair geographers seldom out of reach of dusty bookshelves passed upon these worthless observations not one out of one hundred thousand honest sextant experts would credit such an observation as that upon which mr perry's case rests not even in home regions where for centuries tables for corrections had been gathered not only were cook and perry's testimonies dubious and navigational records unsatisfactory but the speeds claimed on their final pushes to the pole were also incredulous cook recorded on the fourth and fifth days before his support party left that even with full sledge loads he was able to traverse twenty-nine and twenty-two miles respectively those days around double their usual distance covered yet his inuit guide atukashuk claimed that they remained in the same place for two nights polar researcher and author randall oskzewski in his book frederick cook and the forgotten pole wrote that cook had needed to invent additional mileage to make up the distance he said he had covered in reaching the pole and to bring him back to land on a reasonable date some of this padding is found in distances claimed for days when they did not travel but some could have been created by simply changing the units since his mileage figures came from a pedometer it is likely that he originally recorded these figures as statute miles pretending that they had really been nautical miles would add fifteen per cent to the distance perry's supposed speeds during his final push to the pole were even less believable than cook's 
allegedly averaging up to an implausible 71 miles per day. His last five marches, while accompanied by experienced navigator Captain Bob Bartlett, averaged no more than 13 miles per day. Once his last supporting party turned back, and Captain Bartlett was ordered southward, Perry's alleged speeds immediately doubled for the next five marches. Then, Perry claimed during the final eight days that his speed quadrupled from a base camp to the pole and back, covering 296 miles, 198 of them in just four days, giving an average of 49 miles a day. This figure, however, is before factoring many more miles of admitted detours due to navigation errors, drift, avoiding pressure ridges, and open water leads, which critics claim bring the figure closer to 71. No other explorer before or since has ever claimed such ridiculous speeds. Polar researcher and author Paul Simpson Housley wrote in his The Arctic Enigmas and Myths that those records failed to confirm that Perry reached his goal, and such observations could certainly have been faked. Perry fails to provide a detailed account in his diary. Moreover, he should have presented a well-kept log of his final approach that included checks on compass variation and on his latitude and longitude made by providing altitudes of the sun, planets, and stars at various locations. Polar pack ice is difficult terrain to traverse. The ice drift deviates from wind direction to the right by 28 degrees to 30 degrees in the northern hemisphere at a speed of 1 50th of the wind forcing it. Perry provided no wind speeds in either his diary or published reports. It is highly likely that he would be propelled to the left of his 70-degree meridian. His desire to reach the pole was certainly in excess of his intent to produce records. In addition, Perry's chronometer displayed an error of 10 minutes, and this would have influenced his heading. More doubt would eventually be cast on both Cook and Perry through public scrutiny. In 1906, Cook had previously claimed himself the first man to reach the summit of the tallest mountain in North America, Mount McKinley, only to be dethroned upon further investigation. It turned out the picture Cook provided as proof of his summit attainment was actually taken on a small outcrop on a ridge beside the Ruth Glacier, 19 miles away, and at only 5,338 feet high, nearly 15,000 feet lower than McKinley's true peak. Cook's sole companion during the 1906 climb, Ed Barrell, would also later sign an affidavit admitting that they had not reached the summit, including a map showing the location of what would become known as Fake Peak, where Cook's picture was actually taken. Belmore Brown, an experienced mountaineer who assisted Cook in the weeks before his alleged summit attainment, claimed McKinley too expansive and treacherous to have allowed Cook such quick access in the time frame given. He would later call Cook untrustworthy and state for the record that he, quote, knew that Dr. Cook had not climbed Mount McKinley the same way a New Yorker would know that no man could walk from the Brooklyn Bridge to Grant's tomb in ten minutes. Decades later, Cook would also be indicted and eventually charged and found guilty of 14 counts of fraud for startup oil companies he promoted, and was sentenced to 14 years, 9 months in prison. As for Perry, his obsession with the pole caused him in the first 23 years of his marriage to spend only three with his wife and family, missing the birth and tragic death of his son. While in the Arctic, Perry cheated on his wife, with a 14-year-old Inuit girl named Alaquasina, who would eventually bear him two children named Kala and Kari. During Perry's seven long Arctic expeditions made between 1886 and 1909, a black man named Matthew Henson was technically more responsible for their successes than Perry himself. Henson took care of the other men, dogs and supplies, spoke the Inuit language, pulled and fixed the sledges, and Henson even dragged Perry himself around during their final expedition, since Perry had lost eight toes to frostbite on their previous journey and could barely walk. Even still, Perry had secretly planned to leave Henson and the Inuit guides behind for the final stint so that he could claim the pole solely for himself. His plan never came to fruition, however, and upon realizing he would have to share the fame, Perry immediately stopped speaking to Henson. 
the man who had engineered his success, saved his life on a previous expedition, and remained unwaveringly loyal to him for over two decades. As Perry had once written in a letter to his mother, quote, I must be the peer or superior of those about me to be comfortable. Historian Fergus Fleming called Perry, quote, the most unpleasant man in the annals of polar exploration. And polar researcher and author Bo Riffenberg wrote that he, quote, was perhaps the most self-serving, paranoid, arrogant, and mean-spirited of all 19th century explorers. He was suspicious of and hateful to those he considered rivals, either in actual geographical discovery or as heroic figures. He was condescending and insensitive to his subordinates, and he was ingratiating and servile to those he felt could help his quest for personal glory. Another man preparing for a North Pole expedition in 1909 was accomplished Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen. Upon hearing word of Cook and Perry's alleged successes, however, Amundsen decided to turn his attention towards the Antarctic and the South Pole instead. Unsure his patrons and crew would accept this change in plans, for the next two years Amundsen lied to everyone about his true destination, telling even his entire crew that they were traveling north to the Arctic Pole, right up until their ship, the Fram, was departing from their final port of call, Madeira, when he let everyone know that they would actually be going to the Antarctic in search of the South Pole. After some initial insubordination, Ultimately, everyone went ahead with his drastic change of plans. Upon reaching Antarctica, Amundsen brought five men and fifty-two dogs with him for the final push to the pole, and instead of bringing enough food along for everyone, Amundsen had his team kill and eat over half of the dogs used to carry them there. On December 14, 1911, they would allegedly reach the geographic South Pole to be confirmed by Robert Falcon Scott of the British Royal Navy, who just happened to be in the Antarctic about to launch his own polar expedition. Just one month after Amundsen's alleged attainment of the South Pole, Scott's team, already en route, would arrive and confirm Amundsen's claim. The problem with Amundsen, Scott, and all subsequent South Polar claims, however, is the following. On the Globe Earth model, the geographic South Pole is located at 90 degrees south latitude, where all 360 degrees of longitude converge to one hypothetical point in the middle of an Antarctic continent. In reality, though, the Antarctic is not a continent, but an encircling icy perimeter of unknown length, and on our planar Earth, lines of longitude only converge upon the North Pole center point and project out straight southwards from there. One degree of latitude is approximately 68 miles, and the Antarctic ice begins around 70 degrees south latitude, depending on access point. Therefore, no matter what meridian of longitude followed, after traveling south across the ice significantly far enough to the 90 degree mark, several hundred miles, the pole has been achieved. In other words, the so-called geographic south pole is just an arbitrary point in the Antarctic along any line of longitude, significantly far enough south, where all lines of longitude on the globe converge and become zero degrees. For ease of transportation, supplies, and navigation, all South Pole explorers just retrace their paths back to their boats, though if Earth was truly shaped like a ball, conceivably they should be able to simply continue a straight-line path and come out the other side of Antarctica. No explorer on foot or by air has ever done such a south-north circumnavigation, however, because it is impossible, as the Earth is not a globe. For posterity, Roald Amundsen would be credited not only with being first to the geographic South Pole, but also first to winter in the Antarctic, and then subsequent expeditions to the Arctic would claim for him titles of first through the Northwest Passage, first to cross and first to circumnavigate the Arctic Ocean, first to the Ice Pole, the Arctic Ocean point furthest from land masses, and after widespread distrust and dispute of Cook and Perry's claims, a 1926 expedition would see Amundsen reclaim being first to the geographic North Pole as well. Reminiscent of the 1909 Cook-Perry controversy, however, 
A similar media-fueled heated debate raged in 1926, as U.S. Admiral Richard Byrd allegedly reached the pole by plane just three days before Roald Amundsen did by dirigible. Both Byrd and Amundsen were aware of each other's concurrent expeditions, and due to recent advances in aviation technology, both decided to reach the pole via air rather than land and sea, as previous explorers attempted. Similar to Scott's follow-up confirmation of Amundsen's South Pole claim, the plan was for Admiral Byrd to fly over first and dump a load of hundreds of large American flags directly at the pole, which Amundsen would then find and confirm a few days later during his own polar flight. So on May 9, 1926, Byrd and his co-pilot departed in their Fokker trimotor airplane, the Josephine Ford, from the Norwegian island Spitsbergen, and attempted to fly over the pole. Just 15 hours and 57 minutes later, including an alleged 13 minutes of circling the pole, Byrd landed back at Spitsbergen, claiming to have reached the pole and traveled a distance of 1,535 miles. Upon return to the United States, Byrd became a national hero, promoted to the rank of commander, and was awarded a Presidential Medal of Honor at the White House. Roald Amundsen's airship, the Norge, allegedly floated over the pole three days later, on May 12th, but was unable to confirm Byrd's attainment, because Byrd never ended up dropping his cargo of U.S. flags over the pole, nor provide a public explanation of why. At first, Byrd's polar claim was widely accepted, and Amundsen reduced to second fiddle. But after new evidence came to light, and further investigations made clear, Byrd never dropped the flags, because he never actually reached the pole. The first public skepticism of Byrd began a year after his death, in 1958, when Byrd's colleague, personal pilot during his South Pole flight, and helper in Spitsbergen for the North Pole flight, Bernd Balkin, published his book, Come North With Me, which questioned the feasibility of Byrd's 1926 polar claim. Essentially, Byrd's sextant-locked 61-knot mean speed for the first six and a quarter hours of the flight per his own records in a recorded 707 GCT sextant shot, required that to reach the pole at the reported time, he would need to have suddenly, after taking the reading, jumped his average speed over double from 61 to an implausible 148 knots in order to cover the final 284 miles in the alleged time allotted. In addition, once supposedly reaching the pole and circling around it for 13 minutes, his written calculations contradictorily still claimed constant 85 mile per hour straight line speed northward. Apologists and defenders of Byrd dismissed Balkin's objections, insisting prevailing winds may have helped him along, until, in 1960, Gosta Lilliquist, professor of meteorology at University of Uppsala, examined the meteorological records and concluded there were absolutely no polar winds strong enough on May 9, 1926, to propel Byrd so swiftly to his destination. Another exposure of Byrd's hoax surfaced in 1971 with Richard Montague's book Oceans, Poles, and Airmen, in which he interviewed Bernd Balkin, who claimed that Floyd Bennett, Byrd's North Pole co-pilot, had confessed to him before his death that the Josephine Ford had actually developed an oil leak early in the flight, lost a motor several hundred miles from the pole, and subsequently turned back, circling out of sight of land without making an effort to reach the pole. The final nail in Bird's coffin came with the 1996 release of his personal diary and papers, recording the May 9, 1926 flight. His official sextant reading, typewritten in his June 22nd report to the National Geographic Society, taken at 70710 GCT, claimed a solar altitude of 18 degrees, 18 minutes, and 18 seconds. In his diary, however, an erased but still legible recording shows his apparent observed solar altitude at 70710 to have been 19 degrees, 25 minutes, and 30 seconds. Not only this, but a scrap piece of paper found in Bird's diary also in his handwriting, shows a third scribbled solar altitude for 70710 as being 18 degrees, 19 minutes, and 18 seconds. 
This intermediate scrap paper calculation between the diary recording and official typewritten report shows evidence of gradual doctoring of the raw data in an effort to fudge a believable figure. In addition, Byrd's official recorded sextant data was overly precise, far beyond the capabilities of his or any other sextant available at the time. Dead reckoning latitudes were recorded with a thousand times better precision than physically possible, again pointing towards an attempt to overcompensate the perceived accuracy of his inaccurate fudged data. To summarize, Byrd's 1926 primary record includes several mysterious erasures, back-and-forth diary entries, confirmed fabrications, and contradictions including two takeoff times, three pole arrival times, and 707 sextant altitudes, and four different speeds. In documents including his diary from the time, we see intermediary steps of his forging calculations for the most believable and accurate times, airspeeds, distances, and solar altitudes. He never dropped the cargo of U.S. flags as intended, and could not have attained the pole at the speeds recorded. Dennis Rollins wrote, In brief, Byrd's diary and his typescript describe two quite different trips. Indeed, there are actually four distinct trips, because the diary has three separate and contradictory sections. The sextant observations are for a 70-mile-per-hour celestially navigated trip, the radio distances are for an 80-mile-per-hour direct trip, while the last-minute direct data are for an 85-mile-per-hour trip. But the later neat typescript claims that the mean northward speed was over 90 miles per hour. The typescript trip does not agree with any of the three disparate diary trips. If you are caught keeping two sets of fiscal books, you go to jail. Not even the wildest defense lawyer would try alibying the accused by treating the differences between the two documents as exculpatory or mysterious, when the whole point of the indictment is the discrepancies. Question. Did any other explorer in history leave us manuscript astronomical observations for position which grossly, to his disadvantage, invariably differed from his published observations? Since Cook, Perry, and Byrd's North Pole claims have all been found fraudulent, it is now generally accepted that Roald Amundsen's dirigible flight of May 12, 1926 did cross the Pole, and he is credited with being the first explorer to both the South and North Poles. Even Wikipedia states that, quote, three prior expeditions led by Frederick Cook, 1908 land, Robert Perry, 1909 land, and Richard E. Byrd, 1926 aerial, were once also accepted as having reached the Pole. However, in each case, later analysis of expedition data has cast doubt upon the accuracy of their claims. This is also Irish journalist Anthony Galvin's conclusion in his book, The Great Polar Fraud, Cook, Perry, and Bird: How Three American Heroes Duped the World into Thinking They Had Reached the North Pole. Ever since Amundsen's dirigible, the Norge, allegedly successfully floated over the pole, many more explorers have also continued the legacy. Norge designer and pilot Umberto Nobile, along with several scientists and crew, allegedly crossed the pole a second time on May 24, 1928, in the airship Italia, which crashed before returning, killing half the people on board. In May 1937, the Soviet government established the world's first North Pole ice station, allegedly just 13 miles from the pole. Interestingly enough, this station was found by icebreakers just nine months later off the eastern coast of Greenland, over 1,700 miles away. This was explained as being caused by swift ice drifts, which radically displaced them. In May 1945, David Cecil McKinley of the Royal Air Force claimed to fly over both the geographic and north magnetic poles. The Soviet Sever II expedition in May 1948 claimed to set foot on the pole, and in May 1949, Soviets Vitaly Volovich and Andrei Medvedev claimed being first to parachute to the pole. In May 1952, U.S. Air Force Lieutenants Joseph Fletcher and William Benedict claimed the first aerial landing at the pole. The U.S. Navy submarine USS Nautilus allegedly crossed the pole in August 1958, and in March 1959, the USS Skate claimed first to surface at the pole, 
breaking through the ice above it. On April 1969, British Transarctic Expedition claimed first to reach the North Pole by foot. August 1977, the Soviet icebreaker Arctica claimed first surface ship to reach the pole. And on the list of alleged polar firsts continue, from first by dog sled to first by motorcycle. In 1985, for a particularly interesting media-hyped first, Sir Edmund Hillary, the first man to stand on the summit of Mount Everest, and Neil Armstrong, the alleged first man to stand on the moon, claimed to land a small twin-engine ski plane and stand together at the North Pole. As is abundantly clear to anyone who has objectively studied the NASA Apollo missions, Freemason Neil Armstrong most certainly did not land on the moon, so it is fair and wise to be skeptical of whether he and his royally knighted colleague Sir Edmund Hillary actually stood foot on the geographic pole as well. As for the magnetic poles, the north was allegedly discovered by James Clark Ross in 1831 at the Boothia Peninsula, named after his father's patron Sir Felix Booth. This peninsula, located at 70 degrees north latitude, however, strangely placed the magnetic pole well over a thousand miles from the geographic pole. Roald Amundsen, during his 1903 Arctic expedition, was also credited with discovering a new position of the magnetic north pole, just 30 miles north from where Ross had claimed. It was later in 1947, allegedly found again, by Canadian government scientists Paul Serson and Jack Clark of the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory, who claimed the pole had moved near Prince of Wales Island at 72 degrees north latitude. Since then, the North Magnetic Pole has continued to be discovered time and again at random places in the Arctic, following no discernible pattern. Likewise, the South Magnetic Pole was first allegedly discovered by Sir Ernest Shackleton during his 1909 expedition, and has ever since been found randomly moving all over the Antarctic. The idea of constantly randomly moving magnetic poles, divorced from their geographic counterparts, makes it conveniently impossible to independently confirm or deny polar claims by compass. In other words, since the invention of the video camera, any claim to have found the North or South Magnetic Pole can and should be easily proven. By holding a compass and walking in a circle around the North Pole, the compass should always point directly towards it. And by walking in a circle around the South Pole, the compass should always point 180 degrees away in the opposite direction. To this day, however, no such single experiment has been performed to prove to the public that these are truly magnetic poles at all. Similarly, there are no videos from the geographic poles that provide the public with any concrete evidence that they are anywhere but some indistinct, undeclosed snowy tundra. North Pole documentaries always show some man with an icicle mustache and a Garmin counting up their GPS latitude until reaching 90 degrees. There are never stellar readings made showing Polaris exactly 90 degrees above, there is no footage of the six months of constant day and six months of constant night supposed to exist at the pole. GPS, the Global Positioning System, is based on a non-existent globe and created by the U.S. military. So why should we trust that a GPS 90 degree north reading is truly the North Pole? Why are the annals of polar exploration so abundant with frauds and hoaxes? Why should we accept all these more recent polar claims as being legitimate when the original discoveries and discoverers continue being exposed as false and liars? Why is there such an inordinate number of royal knights and Freemasons involved in polar exploration? Admiral Byrd himself was a high-ranking Freemason from Federal Lodge No. 1 in Washington, D.C., and financed by none other than fellow 33rd degree Freemason and Illuminati bloodline elite John D. Rockefeller. Roald Amundsen even had Masonic Lodge No. 648 in Sacramento, California named after him. If these explorers truly reached the North Pole, then where is the magnetic mountain, encircling whirlpool, four directional rivers, and surrounding inhabited islands mentioned by Adam of Bremen, Paul the Deacon, Gerald of Wales, Guido Guinazelli, Nicholas de Lind, Jacobus Sinoyan, Gerard Macader, 
John D., the Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, Shinto, Taoists, Jews, Christians, Muslims, the Norse, the Egyptians, the Persians, and literally every single ancient culture on earth. Are these all to be discounted as completely false stories with no factual impetus? And if the polar magnetic mountain truly is just fanciful mythology and nonsense, how do we account for this same quote-unquote false concept originating and flourishing independently in nearly every ancient culture worldwide? The North Pole is the inherent geographical focal point of all creation. It is the perfect center of the bullseye, the magnetic attractor of all the world's compasses, the originator of all the world's tides, and home to the only motionless star in the heavens around which all the other stars, the sun and the moon, revolve. In ancient times, it was also claimed to be home to the tallest mountain and the tallest people on earth. As recently as the 19th century, explorers like Olaf Janssen have continued telling so-called tall tales of meetings with races of giant human beings who live at the pole. In his book, The Smoky God, Olaf Janssen claimed to have journeyed to the North Pole with his father in 1829, where they met and mingled two years with a race of twelve-foot-tall giants who lived up to eight hundred years, spoke a language similar to Sanskrit, and inhabited a paradisical capital city named Eden. This particular story is most likely a piece of fiction but echoes a long-standing tradition of similar claims that the North Pole is or was once home to a paradisical Edenic abode inhabited by races of gigantic and or miniature human beings. In Halen's 1659 book Cosmography, he states that on the north of Lapia and Biarmia, near the Pole, lives a race of pygmies, the tallest of which are not above four feet high. Gerardus Mercator's 1595 polar map includes this island of pygmies with a caption mentioning their tiny four-foot stature. Johannes Ruiz's 1508 world map also shows the many surrounding polar islands claiming two of them inhabited, but without mentioning the alleged inhabitants' size or stature. In the book Gesta Hemabergensis Ecclesiae Pontificum, Archbishop Adalbert's team of Frisian explorers told of encountering giant human beings living in caves and underground hollows during their 1035 polar expedition. In ancient Greek and Roman texts from Pindar, Herodotus, Hesuid, and Homer, to Virgil and Cicero, it was universally claimed that the North Pole was home to a race of giants called the Hyperboreans, who lived for over a thousand years and enjoyed lives of perfect happiness. Hyperborea was allegedly bathed in 24-hour sunlight, with the sun only ever rising or setting once every year. Pliny the Elder wrote in his Natural History Book 4 that, The farthest of all, which are known and spoke of, is Thule, in which there be no nights at all, as we have declared, about midsummer, namely when the sun passes through the sign Cancer, and contrarywise, no days in midwinter, and each of these times, they suppose, do last six months, all day or all night. For observers standing at the pole, the heavens would appear to have been created just for them. Their unique perspective places Polaris, the only motionless star in the sky, perfectly situated directly above them, with all the other visible stars rotating horizontal left-to-right paths 360 degrees around, all at an apparent equal distance away. The sun and moon also rotate horizontally around the polar observer, with the sun rising and setting only once per year, creating six-month days and six-month nights. Lokmanya Bal Gangadhar Tilak wrote, If an observer is stationed at the North Pole, the first thing that will strike him is the motion of the celestial sphere above his head. Living in the temperate and tropical zone, we see all heavenly objects rise in the east and set in the west some passing over our head, others traveling obliquely. But to the man at the pole, the heavenly dome above will seem to revolve around him, from left to right, somewhat like the motion of a hat or umbrella turned over one's head. The stars will not rise and set, but will move round and round in horizontal planes, 
turning like a potter's wheel, and starting on a second round when the first is finished, and so on. During the long night of six months, the sun, when he is above the horizon for six months, would also appear to revolve in the same way. The center of the celestial dome over the head of the observer will be the celestial north pole, and naturally enough, his north will be overhead, while the invisible regions below the horizon would be in the south. For polar observers, the sun rises in the south, not the east, and circles horizontally around, rising ever so slightly in the sky, about a quarter degree per day. This creates an extended morning twilight with its brilliant colors, which instead of lasting for the usual 45 minutes, lasts around 45 days. Every year at the spring equinox, after a long winter night, dawn begins to break and the first traces of the sun creep above the horizon. By summer solstice, the sun reaches its highest point in the polar sky, around 23.5 degrees, and begins its slow, almost imperceptible descent. At the autumnal equinox, the last traces of the sun disappear beyond the horizon, and an extended evening twilight persists for a month and a half, after which the polar observer will not see sunlight again until spring. Thanks to abundant starlight, regular aurora borealis activity, and two weeks of moonlight per month, the long polar nights are not pitch black, but actually quite well lit and beautiful. Lokmanya Bal Gangadhar Tilak wrote, we have stated that to an observer at the North Pole, there will be a night of six months, and one is likely to infer therefrom that there will be total darkness at the Pole for one half the portion of the year. Indeed, one is likely to contemplate with horror the perils and difficulties of a long night of six months, during which not only the light, but the warmth of the sun has to be artificially supplied. As a matter of fact, such a supposition is found to be erroneous. First of all, there will be the electrical discharges known as aurora borealis filling the polar night with their charming glories and relieving its darkness to a great extent then we have the moon which in her monthly revolution will be above the polar horizon for a continuous fortnight displaying her changing phases without intermission to the polar observer but the chief cause which alleviates the darkness of the polar night is the twilight before the rising and after the setting of the sun the dawn in the tropical or the temperate zone is but brief and evanescent, and it recurs after every twenty-four hours. But still it has formed the subject of poetical descriptions in different countries. If so, how much more the spectacle of a splendid long dawn after a darkness of two months would delight the heart of a polar observer, and how he will yearn for the first appearance of the light on the horizon. In all, a year at the pole sees approximately six months of continuous daylight, followed by a month and a half of evening twilight, then three months of relative darkness, ending in a month and a half long spring dawn. The exact number of days for each portion of the polar year is disputed among various authorities, however, which raises the question again as to whether or not modern man truly has attained the pole. If we have research bases and encampments built all over at and around the North Pole as claimed, why is there not a single video online or anywhere else showing a year-long continuous time-lapse of this world wonder? To see Polaris unmoving directly 90 degrees overhead while all the other stars rotate horizontally around, uninterrupted by sunlight, for months at a time? then to watch the first rays of the longest, most beautiful dawn lighting the horizon and revolving 360 degrees around without setting for many more months, would be an absolute spectacle to behold, worthy of an IMAX documentary, and a true wonder of the world. But somehow, no such video exists. Dr. William Warren wrote, First of all appears low in the horizon of the night sky, a scarcely visible flush of light. At first it only makes a few stars' light seem a trifle fainter, but after a little it is seen to be increasing and to be moving laterally along the yet dark horizon. Twenty-four hours later it has made a complete circuit around the observer and is causing a larger number of stars to pale. Soon the widening light glows with the luster of orient pearl. Onward it moves in its stately rounds, until the pearly whiteness burns into ruddy rose light, fringed with purple and gold. Day after day, 
as we measure days, this splendid panorama circles on, and according as atmospheric conditions and clouds present more or less favorable conditions of reflection, kindles and fades, kindles and fades, fades only to kindle next time, yet more brightly, as the still hidden sun comes nearer and nearer his point of emergence. At length, when for two long months such prophetic displays have been filling the whole heavens with these increscent and revolving splendors, the sun begins to emerge from his long retirement, and to display himself once more to human vision. After one or two circuits, during which his dazzling upper limb grows to a full-orbed disk, he clears all hilltops of the distant horizon, and for six full months circles around and around the world's great axis in full view, suffering no night to fall upon his favored homeland at the pole. Even when at last he sinks again from view, he covers his retreat with a repetition of the deepening and fading splendors which filled his long dawning, as if in these pulses of more and more distant light he were signaling back to the forsaken world the promises and prophecies of an early return. You would think such a sight would be worthy of recording, yet somehow no one in history has ever bothered to do so. If we have truly attained the North Pole, and have permanent and semi-permanent structures with people stationed at and around there year-round, why in the flat world has no one ever recorded an annual time-lapse of this incredible occurrence? The polar six-month day and six-month night has been written about by diverse cultures throughout history, many insisting that their ancestors, or gods, were the original inhabitants. In the ancient Indian Vedas, the Day of the Gods and Night of the Gods were each six months in duration, and their gods lived atop Mount Meru at the North Pole. The Surya Siddhanta 1267 states that, At Meru, gods behold the sun after but a single rising during the half of his revolution beginning with Aries. In the Institutes of Vishnu says, the southern progress of the sun is with them a night, and a year is with them a day and a night. In Norse mythology, it is claimed that before this present established order of the world, their sun rose in the south, which is what would have been experienced by their polar ancestors. In ancient Iranian mythology, Yima, the first man, and king of the Golden Age, lived in an Edenic abode called Vara, where the sun only rose and set once per year. Lokmanya Bal Gangatar Tilak wrote, A phenomenon like this cannot fail to be permanently impressed on the memory of a polar observer, and it will be found later on that the oldest traditions of the Aryan race have preserved the recollection of a period when its ancestors witnessed such wonderful phenomenon, a long and continuous dawn of several days with its light laterally revolving on the horizon in their original home. The heavenly dome rotating perfectly horizontally overhead for polar observers is another unique peculiarity of polar astronomy found in ancient mythology. In Greek mythology, the gods rule from Mount Olympus, as the Iliad states, from the upper sky, the celestial dome in which the sun, moon, and stars wheel silently around the pole. In the Vedas, Indra supports the heavens as on a pole, and upholds heaven and earth and turns the widest expanse as the wheels of a chariot are held by the axle. An imaginary line from the North Pole to Polaris would appear perfectly vertical and like a handle supporting the twirling umbrella of the heavens, or an axis supporting the wheel of a chariot. Lokmanya Bal Gangadhar Tilak wrote, If we combine the two statements, that the heavens are supported as on a pole, and that they move like a wheel, we may safely infer that the motion referred to is such a motion of the celestial hemisphere as can be witnessed only by an observer at the North Pole. In the Rig Vedas 1.24.10, the constellation of Ursa Major, Riksha, is described as being placed high, and as this can refer only to the altitude of the constellation, it follows that it must then have been over the head of the observer, which is possible only in the circumpolar regions. In the Mahabharata, during Arjuna's visit to Mount Meru, chapters 163 and 164 of the Vena Parvan state that, At Meru, the sun and the moon go round from left to right every day, and so do all the stars. The day and the night are together equal to a year to the residents of that place. 
The ancient laws of Manu, 167, state, A human year is a day and a night of the gods. Thus are the two divided, the northern passage of the sun is the day, and the southern the night. And the Tatiriya Brahmana says, That which is a year is but a single day of the gods. In the collection of ancient Zoroastrian texts known as the Avesta, the Aryan paradise, known as Ariana Veho, is described as a blissful place where the sun only rose once per year and was destroyed by relentless snow and ice, forcing the inhabitants, Earth's original progenitors, to migrate southwards. This same idea that the first humans devolved from god or gods at the North Pole is replete within ancient scriptures, and starkly contrasts modern mainstream claims that the first humans evolved from primates in Africa. Two excellent books were written on this subject, one by Boston University President and Professor Dr. William Warren, entitled Paradise Found, The Cradle of the Human Race at the North Pole, and another by the renowned Indian teacher and activist Lokmanya Bal Gangadhar Tilak, entitled The Arctic Home in the Vedas. In both well-researched publications, Warren and Tilak present convincing arguments with abundant supporting evidence suggesting that our most ancient ancestors lived at the North Pole and spread outwards southwards from there, likely due to climate changes. Dr. William Warren wrote, Our hypothesis calls for an antediluvian continent at the Arctic Pole. It is interesting to find that a writer upon the deluge, writing more than 40 years ago, advanced the same postulate. Is the supposition that there existed such a continent scientifically admissible? Until very recently, too little was known of the geology of the high latitudes to warrant or even to occasion the discussion of such a question. Even now, with all the contemporary interest in Arctic exploration, it is difficult to find any author who has distinctly propounded to himself and discussed the question as to the geologic age of the Arctic Ocean. It will not be strange, therefore, if we have here to content ourselves with showing, first, that geologists and paleontologists do not think the present distribution of Arctic sea and land to be the primeval one, and secondly, that in their opinion, incidentally expressed, a continent once existed within the Arctic Circle, of which at present only vestiges remain. Mr. Alfred Russell Wallace incidentally shows that the facts of Arctic paleontology call for the supposition of a primitive Eocene continent in the highest latitudes, a continent which no longer exists. His language is, The rich and varied fauna which inhabited Europe at the dawn of the tertiary period, as shown by the abundant remains of mammalia wherever suitable deposits of Eocene age have been discovered, proves that an extensive, pale Arctic continent then existed. Another most eminent authority in Arctic paleontology, the late professor here of Zurich, fully fifteen years ago, arrived at and published the conclusion that the facts presented in the Arctic fossils plainly point to the existence, in Miocene time, of a no longer existing polar continent. On another and more lithological line of evidence, Baron Nordenskjold, the eminent Arctic explorer, has arrived at the same conclusion. Speaking of certain rock strata north of the 68th degree of north latitude, he says, an extensive continent occupied this portion of the earth when these strata were deposited. Elsewhere, he speaks of this ancient polar continent as something already accepted and universally understood among scientific men. Lokmanya Bal Gangadhar Tilak wrote, It has been already stated that the beginnings of Aryan civilization must be supposed to date back several thousand years before the oldest Vedic period, and when the commencement of the post-glacial epoch is brought down to 8000 BC, it is not at all surprising if the date of primitive Aryan life is found to go back to it from 4500 BC, the age of the oldest Vedic period. There are many passages in the Rig Veda which, though hitherto looked upon as obscure and unintelligible, do, when interpreted in the light of recent scientific researches, plainly disclose the polar attributes of the Vedic deities, or the traces of an ancient Arctic calendar, while the Avesta expressly tells us that the happy land of Ariana Vaiho, or the Aryan Paradise, was located in a region where the sun shone but once a year, and that it was destroyed by the invasion of snow and ice, which rendered its climate inclement 
and necessitated a migration southward. These are plain and simple statements, and when we put them side by side with what we know of the glacial and the post-glacial epoch from the latest geological researches, we cannot avoid the conclusion that the primitive Aryan home was both arctic and interglacial. The discovery of the intimate relationship between Sanskrit and Zend, on the other hand, and the languages of the principal races of Europe, on the other, a complete revolution took place in the views commonly entertained of the ancient history of the world. It was perceived that the languages of the principal European nations, ancient and modern, bore a close resemblance to the languages spoken by the Brahmins of India and the followers of Zoroaster, and from this affinity of the Indo-Germanic languages, it followed inevitably that all these languages must be the offshoots or dialects of a single primitive tongue, and the assumption of such a primitive language further implied the existence of a primitive Aryan people. In 1786, Sir William Jones, a Supreme Court judge who could speak thirty languages, gave his third anniversary discourse to the Asiatic Society, where he declared that the similarities between Sanskrit, Greek, Latin, German, Celtic, and Persian languages could only be explained on the hypothesis that they all shared a common parentage. His contemporary, the German philosopher Hegel, compared the consequences of Jones' revelation to the discovery of a whole new world, and his groundbreaking work on this subject established him as the founder of comparative linguistics. Jones wrote that, The Sanskrit language, whatever be its antiquity, is of a wonderful structure, more perfect than the Greek, more copious than the Latin, and more exquisitely refined than either, yet bearing to both of them a stronger affinity, both in the roots of verbs and the forms of grammar, than could possibly have been produced by accident. So strong, indeed, that no philologer would examine them all three without believing them to have sprung from some common source, which perhaps no longer exists. There is a similar reason, though not quite so forcible, for supposing that both the Gothic and the Celtic, though blended with a very different idiom, had the same origin with the Sanskrit, and the Old Persian might be added to the same family. Scholar and renowned linguist Charles Berlitz of Berlitz Language Schools spoke an amazing 32 languages, and just like Sir William Jones, his life's research in comparative linguistics led him to the inescapable conclusion that all the world's languages must trace back to a single, lost, ancient dialect. Berlitz actually wrote several books about Atlantis, and believed the primary language of the human race originated there. In my previous book, The Atlantean Conspiracy, I also included a large section on Atlantean etymology, showing how an inordinate number of words and prefixes from languages worldwide share the exact same or incredibly similar meanings and pronunciations, strongly suggesting a common ancient etymological ancestor. Researcher and author John G. Bennett also wrote a paper entitled The Hyperborean Origin of the Indo-European Culture, in which he argues that ancient languages were more advanced, have devolved into our current languages, and likely originally trace back to a lost polar civilization. This idea has also been promoted by esotericists like Helena Blavatsky, René Guénon, and Julia Sivola, who all shared a belief in the Hyperborean, polar origins of mankind. According to them, during a golden age, humanity solidified into this material realm and has since undergone devolution. Rather than evolving from apes, they insist humanity has progressively devolved into an ape-like condition. Lokmanya Bal Gangadhar Tilak wrote, It is admitted that many of the present explanations of these traditions and legends are unsatisfactory, and as our knowledge of the ancient man is increased, or becomes more definite, by new discoveries in archaeology, geology, or anthropology, these explanations will have to be revised from time to time, and any defects in them, due to our imperfect understanding of the sentiments, the habits, and even the surroundings of the ancient man, corrected. That human races have preserved their ancient traditions is undoubted, though some or many of them may have become distorted in course of time, and it is for us to see if they do or do not accord with what we know of the ancient man from latest scientific researches. In the case of the Vedic traditions, myths, and beliefs, we have the further advantage that they were collected thousands of years ago and handed down unchanged from that remote time. 
It is, therefore, not unlikely that we may find traces of the primeval polar home in these oldest books. If the Aryan man did live within the Arctic Circle in early times, especially as a portion of the Rig Veda is still admittedly unintelligible on any of the existing methods of interpretation, although the words and expressions are plain and simple in many places, Dr. Warren has quoted some Vedic traditions along with those of other nations in support of his theory that the Arctic regions were the birthplace of the human race. Every day in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, thousands of Muslims gather and walk westward circles around a tall black stone cube called the Kaaba. This Kaaba stone lies at the very center of Islam's most important mosque, the Great Mosque of Mecca, and is the most sacred site in Islam, said to be the Bat Allah, House of God, where all Muslims must turn to face before daily prayers. The most common epithet often used for Kaaba translates to the center of the earth, and in the ninth century, Islamic scholar Al-Qasai argued that the true Kaaba was actually located directly beneath the North Pole Star. This would mean the true Kaaba is actually Mount Meru, and not the large black stone worshipped in Saudi Arabia. This would mean that every day, thousands of Muslims walk westward circles around Kaaba, just like every night, thousands of stars rotate westward circles around Mount Meru. This would mean that just like the ancient Chinese and Greeks would face north before commencing prayer, that Muslims too are meant to be facing the North Pole, rather than Saudi Arabia. Many legends of Mount Meru claim it to be a mountain composed of black magnetite stone, Mercator's Rupis Nigra, surrounded by four directional rivers and islands, and this is again echoed symbolically by the black stone four-sided cube at Mecca. Why does this black cube in Mecca so perfectly mirror the ancient myths of Mount Meru? Could this man-made construction in Saudi Arabia be usurping the placement of the true house of God at the North Pole? Chet Van Duzer wrote, Many sacred centers are aligned to the four cardinal directions. The purple forbidden city has four gates opening out to the four cardinal directions. The throne room of the royal palace of King Minden, a perfect square oriented to the cardinal directions, was in the middle of Mandalay, which is thought to be the center of Burma and hence of creation. Above the throne room rose a gold-plated seven-story 256-foot tower of Pyathat, which was thought to funnel the wisdom of the universe to the king in its center. The great temple Tenochtitlan, now Mexico City, was at the center of the island, the first spot colonized, and the spot where the eagle eating the serpent on the cactus was seen, and the sacred precinct had gates in the four directions, and many other examples of sacred centers oriented to the cardinal directions come to mind, not least the Garden of Eden with its four streams. The city of Beijing is known as the pivot of the four quarters, and the sacred center of the city, the Forbidden City, is more precisely known as the Purple Forbidden City, purple being the symbolic color of the North Star, and the designation Purple Forbidden City, thus signifying that the Emperor's residence is the center of the world. Where is the center of the world? Is it the Umphalos in the Adidim of Apollo's temple at Delphi? The navel of the world pillar in the Catholicon of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem? The temple of Medyamashrava, the lord of the center, in the holy city of Benares, India? Easter Island in the South Pacific, whose ancient name Topito o Tehenua means the navel of the world? The stone marking kilometer zero on the Ile de la City, Paris, just in front of Notre Dame? The Kanrodai Pillar? at the Tenrikyo Main Sanctuary in Tenri, Japan, the monument at El Mita del Mondo, 22 kilometers north of Quito, Ecuador, Lake Poso in the center of the island of Sulawesi, Indonesia, the pivot of the earth and heavens, and the spot where a rope once joined the two. It is, of course, impossible for these pillars, temples, and churches to all be the centers of the world, which only further proves the point that none of them are authentic, 
and they are each merely symbolic representations. The one and only true center point of all creation, the navel of both the heavens and earth, is undeniably the North Pole. But by giving us all these symbolic facsimiles and by turning Earth into a gigantic tilting sphere spun around the sun, the North Pole has effectively been nullified in the minds of the masses as being the true, natural, sacred center of the universe. Ritual reverential circumambulation, like that of the Muslims around Kaaba, is a practice found in many cultures throughout history. Hindus in India plant sacred tulasi shrubs in their courtyards, with ample space around for reverential circumambulation, known as domestic pradakshana. They repeat this permambulation 108 times while reciting the 108 names of Vishnu, keeping their right shoulder turned towards the plant, mimicking the revolution of the celestial bodies around Polaris. Similarly, at Vishnu temples, devotees walk circles around the outside either seven or 108 times, always keeping their right shoulder towards it. Buddhists in Sri Lanka circumambulate their Dagoba shrines the same way. The sacred Adi Granth, the Sikh Bible, is kept at the Golden Temple of Amritsar, where devotees perform ritual reverential circumambulation around the sanctuary that houses the book three, five, or seven times. Christian bishops, when consecrating a church, make three circuits around the building, sprinkling holy water, and priests perambulate the altar, incensing it while reciting a prayer, which includes mention of this circular worship, circumdato alter dum domine. Several initiation rituals of the Freemasons include circumambulation around central-placed shrines. The stringing of lights around a Christmas tree, topped with a star, is another example of this tradition mimicking the luminary's revolution around Polaris, and the reason a godlike figure, Santa Claus, resides at the North Pole. John O'Neill wrote, Then there is the old Highlander's ceremony of going daysil, sunwise, round chapels, houses, people, and cattle, now done for luck, but preserving for us a lingering trace of the worship practiced by their ancestors. It is also done round graves, and it was a common custom to turn oneself round to the right at the beginning and end of journeys for luck, as well as at weddings and on other occasions. The turn round three times and catch who you may of children's games will here occur to anyone, and the catching may hang on to the practice of securing a victim for human sacrifice pointed to in the Welsh stampede after the quenching of the Halloween bonfires to the cry of the cuddy black sow catch the hindmost. Just our own devil take the hindmost, to turn the reverse way, to the left, still well known in Scotland by the expressive term wither shins, is evil and unlucky. Witches dance that way, and it is like the Bible upside down. The Lap or Sami people of Scandinavia tell a folk tale about a man who disappeared in the winter time. His wife tracked him in the snow, finding that he had walked repeatedly in circles around a bush, and that after several circuits around the bush, his human footsteps suddenly turned into bear tracks. She then repeatedly circumambulated the bush herself and magically transformed into a bear as well. When she finally found her husband in a nearby cave, he was sorrowful and lamented that now he was prophesied to be murdered by his own son, but warned her that if she jumped into his empty skin as soon as he was flayed, she would and did magically recover her human form. This folktale preserves the tradition of polar, stellar, Ursa Major, Great Bear worship and the permambulation of a sacred tree in the far north. John O'Neill wrote, The Dance of Stars was an ancient classic idea in Greece and Rome. Plato spoke of the turnings and dances of the stars. Manilius, too, used the words signoramique chorus, which are to be understood as the dance of the signs or constellations and which is like the Zoroastrians calling the great bear the leader of the stars in the north. The word chorus seems originally to have meant a round dance. According to Eratos, the two other stars next to Polaris in the little bear's tail were called the dancers. The idea of the dance of the stars has survived in modern popular culture with the long-running hit television show Dancing with the Stars but the concept was far more prevalent in ancient times. 
The traditional European maypole dance, for example, features a central tree or pillar topped with a cross and two equal-sized circles on either side representing the sun and moon. Dancers circle around the maypole holding long colorful streamers which wrap and weave around the central pillar causing the dancers to narrow their circles. The pillar is Polaris at the pole. The dancers represent the fixed and wandering stars while the spiraling streamers show the paths of the sun and moon over and around the earth. During this summer celebration, like the ever-narrowing spiraling streamers, the sun has actually just narrowed its spiral path from its greatest southern extent at the Tropic of Capricorn during December winter solstice, and fast approaches its arrival at the northern Tropic of Cancer during the upcoming summer solstice. In fact, originally and still today in many countries, the Maypole Dance is not performed in May at all, but rather on June 21st, the very day the sun reaches its northernmost peak. The Sufi Muslim sect known as the Mevlevi Order, or the Whirling Dervishes, have also preserved a form of polar worship with their circular dance, which is said to represent the harmonious movement of the universe. The dervishes wear a conical cap directed to the zenith, point their right hand to heaven and their left to earth, and then spin circles in place, causing their robes to flare out, making another conical circle around them, all while internally incessantly intoning the name of God, Allah. The founder of the Mevlevi himself wrote that, He who is above all combination, all distinction, is a tree without branches or trunk or roots to which the mind can be attached. This references a concept found all over the ancient world regarding a macrocosmic and microcosmic world tree, what the Norse called Yggdrasil, the Germans called Ermansil, the Hindu Jambutwi, the Taoist paradisical tongue tree, the Buddhist Bodhi tree of wisdom, the giant tree of the Finnish Kalevala, the Celtic golden apple tree of Avalon, the Egyptian tree of life, and the tree at the center of the biblical Garden of Eden. Dr. William Warren wrote, In the center of the Garden of Eden, according to Genesis 3, there was a tree exceptional in position, in character, and in its relations to men. Its fruit was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired. At first sight it would not perhaps appear how a study of this tree in the different mythologies of the ancient world could assist us in locating primitive paradise. In the discussions of such sites, as have usually been proposed, it could not. But if the Garden of Eden was precisely at the North Pole, it is plain that a goodly tree standing in the center of that garden would have had a visible and obvious cosmical significance which could by no possibility belong to any other. Its fair stem shooting up as arrow straight as the body of one of the giant trees of California, far overtopping it may be, even such gigantic growths as these, would to anyone beneath have seemed the living pillar of the very heavens. Around it would have turned the stars of God, as if in homage, though its topmost branches the human worshipper would have looked up to that unmoving center point where stood the changeless throne of the Creator. How conceivable that that Creator should have reserved for sacred uses this one natural altar height of the earth, and that by special command he should have guarded its one particular adornment from desecration. If anywhere in the temple of nature there was to be an altar, it could only be here. That it was here finds a fresh and unexpected confirmation in the singular agreement of many ancient religions and mythologies in associating their paradise tree with the axis of the world, or otherwise with equal unmistakableness locating it at the arctic pole of the earth. The Norse Yggdrasil tree exists at the very center of their world and cosmology, with its roots descending into hell, its mid-branches overarching the earth, and its top reaching to heaven. Likewise, the medieval legend of Seth's visit to the Garden of Eden sees a central tree of life with its crown in heavens and roots in hell, distilling a life-saving oil of mercy obtained for his dying father. The Hindu world tree also provided their gods with an immortality drink called Soma and existed at the North Pole, with its roots reaching to the underworld of Yama, god of death, its top extending to the heavenly realm of benevolent gods, and its body the central sustaining axis of the universe. The Mayan world tree similarly was called Yaxchilkab, 
which means the first tree of the world, and was a gigantic central cosmic Seba tree with its trunk planted on earth, reaching straight upwards through circular holes made in seven heavenly celestial planes that souls of the dead ascend according to merit. The Leni Lenap Native Americans even perform religious rituals in large tree houses using living trunks as the central post to physically embody this symbolism. To this day, many Mayan village centers have a single sacred Seba tree growing due to these surviving ancient beliefs. They always plant them within sight of the town hall, offer incense to them, elect their mares beneath them, and have done so for countless centuries. Walter Crickenberg wrote, The cosmic image of the ancient Nahua tribes of Texcoco, Chalco, and Laxcala distinguished nine underworlds and as many heavens, while the Aztec sometimes spoke of thirteen heavens. According to the original concept, these heavens were the steps by which the sun ascended from east to west during the morning and by which he descended in the afternoon in order to effect a parallel journey at night when passing through the kingdom of the dead. In this way, the highest heaven and the lowest underworld were not to be found at the end, but in the center of the two series of steps, the thirteen gods of the diurnal hours and the nine gods of the nocturnal ones correspond to the steps or levels of the heavens and of the underworld. The sun god reigns over the central seventh hour of the day, and the god of death rules over the central fifth hour of the night. Once again, spatial and temporal concepts have been coordinated. Anthropologist William R. Holland wrote of the Maya that they, quote, consider the heavens the home of benevolent deities, creators and makers of all human, animal, and vegetable life. Conversely, the lower world is the residence of evil gods who eternally fight to undo the work of the heavenly gods and try to win over new occupants for the world of the dead. Life is a constant struggle between the forces of good and evil. In 1982, anthropologist Peter Rowe completed an exhaustive study of 105 Amazonian tribes and found their cosmologies strikingly similar. He summarized their worldviews as follows. There is a disc-shaped earth surrounded by ocean. This disc is sandwiched between upper and lower worlds, which are often subdivided into several levels. There is also a world tree with its roots in the underworld and its crown in the heavens. Yet another example of this nearly ubiquitous concept is the Buddhist sacred Bodhi tree of wisdom, under which the Buddha was enlightened. Nowadays associated with a local tree in India, the original legend of the Bodhi tree of wisdom placed it at the center of the earth, where it helped Gautama Buddha pass over the celestial water to reach Nirvana. When Buddha was unable to cross from one bank to the other, the spirit of the Bodhi tree stretched its arms to aid him across, and then, sitting underneath the tree, he gained enlightenment. In Buddhist art and sculpture, the Bodhi tree is often pictured with the Chatra umbrella symbol above it. According to scholars Dr. William Warren and Gerald Massey, this ornate parasol symbolizes the dome of the heavens and the north polar home of the gods. Dr. William Warren wrote, The paradise tree of the Chinese Taoists is also a world tree. It is found in the center of the enchanting garden of the gods on the summit of the polar Kunlun. Its name is Tong, and its location is further denned by the expression that it grows hard by the closed gate of heaven. As in many of the ancient religions, the mount on which, after the flood, the ark rested, was considered the same as that from which in the beginning the first man came forth. It is not strange to find the tree on top of the mountain of paradise remembered in some of the legends of the deluge. In the Taoist legend, it seems to take the place of the ark. Thus we are told that one extraordinary antediluvian saved his life by climbing up a mountain, and there and then, in the manner of birds plating a nest, he passed his days on a tree, whilst all the country below him was one sheet of water. He afterwards lived to a very old age, and could testify to his late posterity that a whole race of human beings had been swept from the face of the earth. It is at least suggestive to find this same idea of salvation from a universal deluge by means of a miraculous tree growing on the top of the divine mountain of the north among the Navajo Indians of our own country. Speaking of the men of the world before our own, and of the warning they had received of the approaching flood, their legends go on. 
Then they took soil from all the four corner mountains of the world, and placed it on top of the mountain that stood in the north, and thither they all went, including the people of the mountains, the salt women, and such animals as then lived in the third world. When the soil was laid on the mountain, the ladder began to grow higher and higher, but the water continued to rise, and the people climbed upwards to escape the flood. The ancient Egyptians, Phoenicians, Persians, Greeks, Syrians, and Assyrians all had their own versions of the world tree as well. The Greek winged oak of Pharisees and the holy palm of Apollo in the Hyperborean garden of Hesperides were two stories of this sacred tree. The Egyptian tree of life was located at the axis of earth and was home to Bennu, the sunbird, who sat upon its branches. The north wind from his polar perch yielded a life-sustaining celestial rain upon the earth and down to Duat, the underworld. The Persian Zoroastrian tree grew atop the summit of Hera Berezetai, the world's tallest mountain, at the geographic center point of the universe, around which the stars revolved and behind which the sun hid at night. It was home to Ardvisura, the polar headspring source of all waters, falling from heavenly rivers to earth before descending to the underworld. Dr. William Warren wrote, In our interpretation, the original river is from the sky. The division takes place on the heights at the pole, and the four resulting rivers are the chief streams of the circumpolar continent as they descend in different directions to the surrounding sea. Does such a view find any support in the traditions of the ancient world? That it does will be clear to anyone who has carefully read thus far. Let us take the rivers of the Persian cradle of the race. Where do they rise? If the investigator of this question have made no previous studies in comparative sacred hydrography, he will be surprised to find that in Persian thought, not only the Paradise Rivers, but also all the rivers of the whole earth, have but one headspring and but one place of discharge. This headspring is the Ardvisura, situated in heaven, the heaven of the pole. This heavenly fountain, says Hog, summarizing the contents of the Abanyasht, has a thousand springs and a thousand canals, each of them forty days' journey long. Thence a channel goes through all the seven Keshvares, or regions of the earth, conveying everywhere pure celestial waters. These concepts of celestial rainfall and heavenly rivers are found concurrent with most world tree myths. In the Mexican version, Tlaloc, the god of water, lives atop the world's tallest mountain, whence all the earth's rains and streams come. In the Indian version, the heaven spring Ganja falls upon Mount Meru, first watering the land of gods at the pole, then flowing outwards towards the cardinal points from four main rivers into the Arctic Ocean. The Hindu epic Mahabharata says the headspring exists in the highest heaven of Vishnu, high above the highest star Druva, Polaris. During their descent, the waters first wash Druva, then the seven rishis, the great bear, and then fall atop Mount Meru, where the heavenly Ganja River divides into four mighty rivers flowing in opposite directions and feeds the world's oceans. John O'Neill wrote, And all this lays bare for us the origin of the Iranian and Hindu holiness of water. River water is everywhere throughout India held to be instinct with divinity, says Sir Monier Williams. Among primeval peoples who observed the connection between the rains and the springs and watercourses, which were manifestly swelled by them, all waters became of supernal origin, the gift of the heaven's god. And thus the heaven's river, clearly discerned by the eye of faith in the heavens as the Milky Way, became the generation and sanctifier of all earthly rivers. According to Josephus, the Ganges, Tigris, Euphrates, and Nile were but members of the one great ocean river of the Greeks, which ran about the whole earth, which Aristotle described as having its origin in the upper heavens, descending in rain upon the earth, feeding, as Hesiod, Homer, and Euripides said, all fountains and rivers, and every sea, then branching out into the rivers of the underworld, to be returned fire-purged and sublimated to the upper heavens, there to recommence its round. The ancient Greek poets also often alluded to this concept with Okeanos, the great earth-encircling river. Homer wrote that Okeanos was where all rivers and every sea and all fountains flow, Hesiod, in his Theogony, similarly wrote that 
All rivers as sons, and all fountains and brooks as daughters, are traced back to Okeanos. The Greek poets personified Okeanos as a god, the great sea god who girdles the entire world, or as Aeschylus wrote, he who with his sleepless current encircles the whole earth. Plato also wrote of Okeanos, directly connecting it with the four polar rivers in his Phaedo, stating, Among the many are four streams, the greatest and outermost of which is that called Okeanos, which flows round in a circle. And if any doubt remains, Orphic Hymn 83 explicitly mentions the fountain at the pole. Okeanos, whose nature ever flows, from whom at first both gods and men arose, sire uncorruptible, whose waves surround, and earth's all-terminating circle bound, hence every river, hence the spreading sea, and earth's pure bubbling fountains spring from thee. Here, mighty sire, for boundless bliss is thine, greatest cathartic of the powers divine, earth's friendly limit, fountain of the pole, whose waves wide-spreading and circumfluent roll, approach benevolent with placid mind, and be forever to thy mystics kind. The Chinese story of Mount Kunlun and the Tong Tree also features Tian Ho, the many-channeled river, or River of Eight, which falls and separates at the pole. The headspring of these celestial waters, and source of this mythology, is none other than that area of the heavens known to the ancients as the Dark Rift, and better known to us as the Milky Way. In the Chinese version, celestial rainfall from the Milky Way descends on the North Pole, separating into many channels including their sacred Yellow River, which they see as a continuation of the Tian Ho heavenly stream. Then from there, the many channels flow into the oceans, transporting pure heavenly waters across the entire world. Dr. William Warren wrote, However named, all waters are simply portions of the same heaven-descending stream. The other innumerable waters and rivers, springs and channels, are one in origin with those, so in various districts and various places, they call them by various names. Even plant sap and blood and milk are parts of the one cosmic current. All these, through growth or the body which is formed, mingle again with the rivers, for the body which is formed and the growth are both one. Everything of a liquid nature, therefore, in the whole world is conceived of as proceeding from one source high in the north polar sky. Into such a marvelously complete cosmical circulatory water system did the Irenic imagination develop the primitive headstream of Eden. But never, even in the most extravagant mythological adornments of the idea, was it for a moment forgotten that the original undivided stream originates in the north polar sky, and that its division into earthly streams and rivers is on the holy mount which stands in the center. This concept of holy water exists in nearly all of the world's religions, from Christianity, Islam, and Sikhism, to Buddhism, Hinduism, and Jainism. The Christian cross itself is the same shape as the four rivers at the North Pole, and before entering church, the parishioner dips their fingers in holy water and touches four points on their bodies. To bless the water, the priest first makes the sign of the cross over the basin, touches the surface with the palm of his hand, and says, I bless thee, creature of water, by the God that made thee issue from the earthly paradise in four rivers. Christian baptism also takes place ex aqua et spirito sancto, or of water and of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit is transported into the born-again Christian through the medium of water. In Buddhism, monks similarly bless vessels of holy water, then use special wooden fans to sprinkle the water over temple-goers. In Islam, Followers drink or wash in water from their sacred Zamzam well in Mecca. How could these detailed parallel mythologies and concepts all rise and flourish independently of one another thousands of years ago? What could be the origin and impetus of these ideas of world trees, celestial rivers, and polar mountains, if not their literal existence? The next section will explore the metaphorical meanings of these ancient allegories, how modern man can make sense of them, and why this important information is so suppressed. Arguably the oldest polar mythology is that of Atlas, the king of Atlantis, who held the entire world upon his shoulders. Atlas had seven daughters, the Hesperides, 
who spent their days dancing around the tree of life, also coiled around the tree and guarding its golden apples of immortality, lived the serpent Ladon. The kingdom of Atlantis was shaped as concentric circles of land separated by concentric circles of water, with the Temple of Poseidon residing in the very center where sacred bulls roamed around freely, and sacrificial bull's blood was poured over the exterior of the temple. The actual medical term for the topmost thirty-third vertebrae of the spine which holds up the human skull, is the Atlas. So when it is said that Atlas metaphorically holds the world upon his shoulders, it is literally your head and mind which he holds up. Likewise, the Temple of Poseidon exists between your temples on the sides of your head, and your skull, when viewed from above, perfectly resembles Atlantis, or a bull's eye. Why would the center of a target be called a bull's eye anyway? The bull's eye at the center is your third eye, the pineal gland, located at the geometric center point of the human brain, and which roams around freely in a chamber of cerebrospinal fluid. This is surrounded by the cerebral cortex, which itself is covered by a layer of constantly flowing and pumping sacrificial bull's blood and enclosed by the skull cap, three concentric circles of solid separated by two concentric circles of liquid. The microcosmic tree of life is our cerebrospinal system, with its multitudinous branching nerve ganglia. The seven Hesperides, who dance around and guard the tree of life, are the seven chakras, seven energy centers along the spinal column where key organs exist, namely the cerebrum, the pineal gland, the throat, the heart, the navel, the sacrum, and the perineum. Lastly, the serpent Ladon, coiled around the tree of life, is the transformative kundalini serpent energy, which lies coiled at the base of the spine, trapped by our fused lower vertebrae. Dr. William Warren wrote, Science has now discovered, in a most unexpected manner, both the tree and the river of life. The former is the brain and spinal cord of man. We do not mean that the brain merely looks like a tree or resembles one externally. We are not dealing with analogies, but we do mean that the brain and spinal cord are an actual tree. By the most rigid scientific examination, it is shown to fill the ideal type and plan of a tree more completely than any tree of the vegetable kingdom. The spinal cord is the trunk of this great tree. Its roots are the nerves of feeling and motion branching out over the body. The tree of life is planted in the midst of many others, for the heart is a tree, the lungs are a tree, and the pancreas, stomach, liver, and all those vital organs. The brain is its radiant and graceful foliage. The mental faculties are classified in twelve groups by the most recent scientific analysis. This tree bears twelve kinds of fruit. On each side of the tree of life is the great river of life. Let us lay a man down with his head to the north and his arms stretched to the west and to the east. The river of life has its four heads in the four chambers of the heart, the two oracles and the two ventricles. The branches of this river pass upward to the head, the land of gold, eastward to the left and westward to the right, arm and lung. But greatest of all the branches, the river, or frath, are the aorta, and the vena cava, reaching southward to the trunk and lower limbs. In branching over the body, this river divides into four parts at seventeen different points. Two branches of the river form a network around the very trunk of the tree, and spread upward among its expanding branches. The blood is the water of life, and it looks as clear as crystal when seen through the microscope, the eye of science. It is three-fourths water, and through this are diffused the red cells, and the living materials, which are to construct and to maintain the bodily organs. Now before thinking this some new age nonsense or spiritual woo-woo without basis in physical reality, remember these allegories are actually ancient, several millennia old, and meant to encode yogic wisdom. As shown in my book The Atlantean Conspiracy, cultures as diverse and separated as the Indian and Mayan civilizations shared these identical mythologies since long before Columbus. Shakla 
in Mayan, refers to the body's energy centers, exactly like the Indian chakra system. Kultanlini, in Mayan, refers to the power of God within man, controlled by the breath, just as the Indian yogis claim of Kundalini. And Yokha, in Mayan, means on top of truth, just as the word yoga means in ancient Sanskrit. Furthermore, Atal, in Sanskrit, means to support or uphold, as Atlas was said to support and uphold the world on his shoulders. And in Mayan, Atal is found in the names of most of their gods, with one of its meanings being the top of the head. Suffice to say, these are archaic, long-known concepts, and not some New Age fad. Consider the caduceus symbol found on all hospitals and medical establishments. What does this represent, and why is it so revered in medicine? The symbol shows an upright staff being climbed and intertwined by twin serpents, topped with a ball and sprouting wings. You would be forgiven for confusion over why such a symbol has anything to do with the medical field. Like the tree of life in the Atlantean myth, the staff of the caduceus represents the human spine. Just as the serpent laid on lived coiled in the tree of life, the twin snakes coiling up the caduceus represent kundalini energy rising up the spinal column. The points where the two snakes intersect represent the lower chakras, and the ball sprouting wings represents the highest crown chakra. This symbolism is also found in ancient Egypt, where pharaohs would carry a tall staff while wearing cobra headdresses featuring a snake and or bird coming out from their third eye. Again, the staff represents the human cerebrospinal system, the snake represents kundalini, and the third eye is one of our seven chakras. The wings of the caduceus, or the bird's head on the pharaoh's headdress, represent enlightenment, risen kundalini, an open third eye, and an illuminated crown chakra. The Egyptian mystery schools were actually centers of initiation for this arcane knowledge. Jerry Ann Lenhart wrote, Mythology often appears to be describing body sensations when it speaks of serpents, as well as describing the human spine, which can be symbolized as the tree or twin trees, or the serpent or twin serpents. The serpent image connected with the spine has its best-known representation in the Indian Kundalini mythology. Chetwind describes body symbolism that is related to the serpent as connected with the spinal column, which joins the physical nature, the genitals, to the spiritual nature, the head. Unbeknownst to most Christians, these symbols and allegories were all expertly encoded into the Bible as well, and not just the obvious serpent on the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. For example, in Exodus, Moses and Aaron are brought before the Egyptian pharaoh, and by a miracle, Aaron's wooden staff magically transforms into a living snake. Exodus 7.10 reads, Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh, and before his servants it became a serpent. Aaron's rod is his spine, and the serpent is Kundalini. The actual Egyptian pharaohs would have been well aware of the symbolism conveyed here as they traditionally wore cobra headdresses and carried such staffs and scepters themselves. Later in the Bible, Aaron is again used in a passage encoding this symbolism. Numbers 8.2 reads, Speak to Aaron, and say unto him, When thou lightest the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light over against the candlestick. The candlestick is your spine and the seven lamps are your seven chakras. The word chakra literally translates to wheel of light. Similarly, Revelation 5.1 reads, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Again, just like what is found within and on your backside, your spine, sealed with seven chakras. This analogy is even more explicitly stated in the books of Matthew and Genesis. In Matthew 6.22, Jesus says, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Genesis 32.30 states that Jacob called the place Pineal, saying, It is because I saw God face to face. In other words, Jesus and Jacob 
are referring to the pineal gland, the third eye, or single eye meditation point, which lies at the geometric center of our brains. When you slow your brain waves through meditation, sensory deprivation, entheogens, fasting, or other methods, your usually overactive left brain eases off, allowing easier access to the higher, holistic right brain and through to the pineal gland, which the Bible calls the dwelling place of God, and Descartes called the seat of the soul. Here where I live in Thailand, Buddha is their Jesus, and many believe he performed several similar literal miracles as Jesus, like walking on water, over 500 years prior. Buddha was said to have been born and instantly began walking, taking seven steps forward. After each step, a lotus flower appearing on the ground under his feet. Upon completing his seventh step, Buddha stopped and shouted, I am chief of the world. Now, of course, newborn babies cannot talk or walk fresh out of the womb, and lotus flowers cannot magically blossom under one's feet. But we were never meant to take such spiritual scriptures literally. In Eastern mysticism, for many thousands of years, the seven chakras have been symbolized by lotus blossoms, and so this story represents the metaphorical birth of an enlightened being whose seven chakras are illuminated. This Buddhist second birth is analogous to the Christian baptismal concept of being born again. In another tale, Buddha was meditating under a Bodhi tree when it began to rain heavily. From behind him, a huge king cobra came and coiled his body seven times around Buddha's body to keep him warm and placed his hood over Buddha's head to protect him from the rain. After seven days, the rain stopped and the snake turned into a young man who thereafter became one of Buddha's followers. Here again, we have the sacred tree, the serpent coming from behind and then coiling up the back of the meditator seven times for seven days. The reason this story intentionally uses the number seven, both for how many times the cobra coils around Buddha and for how many days he protects him, is to esoterically reference the seven chakras, which the kundalini serpent climbs and illuminates. The number seven actually appears an incredible 735 times in the Bible, more than any other number. In Revelations alone, there are 54 sevens, including the seven seals, seven churches, seven trumpets, seven personages, seven vials, seven woes, seven angels, seven thunders, seven plagues, seven glories, and seven blessings. There are the seven deadly sins, the seven days of creation, seven circles around the wall of Jericho, seven years building the temple of Solomon. Again and again the number seven is given incredible significance over any other number in the Bible. Christians say the number seven denotes spiritual perfection and divine fullness, completeness, totality, which is correct. But what is the origin of this numerology, and could that provide more insight into a deeper meaning? It is the same as Atlas's seven daughters dancing around the tree of life. It is the same reason seven lotus blossoms appeared under Buddha's feet, and a snake wrapped around him seven times for seven days. After the seventh day of creation, Genesis states God had a millennial rest period of a thousand years, because the seventh crown chakra is known as the thousand-petaled lotus. The lower five chakras, illustrated with four, six, ten, twelve, and sixteen petals, add up to forty-eight. The sixth chakra, illustrated with two petals, was known as the ninety-six petaled lotus, because it was said to be twice as powerful as the lower chakras, which adds up to one forty-four, and when multiplied by the thousand-petal crown, gives the esoteric biblical number one hundred and forty-four thousand, which in the book of Revelations is the number of lucky Christians allowed into heaven along with Jesus Christ after the rapture. These myths long predated the Bible and were purposely encoded as symbolic keys to spiritual enlightenment. They were never meant to be read literally or historically. 2 Corinthians 3.6 clearly says the scriptures should not be read literally. Matthew 13.34 says Jesus never spoke unless it was in parables. He said, people who took the word literally were like those who looked but could not see. Modern fundamentalist Christians who read the Bible literally with their overactive left brains are missing the whole point. The reason Jesus cast nets to the right side, 
sits on the right side of God, and builds the door to the temple on the right side, is because he is leading us out of our carnal, lower left brains, and into our higher, holistic brains on the right. This is what the exodus of slaves out of Lower Egypt is all about, a manual for spiritual enlightenment, not a literal slave revolt. There is no history of 600,000 slaves leaving Egypt for Israel, because it never happened, and Israel never used to be an actual place. It was just three names of Egyptian gods, Isis, Ra, Elohim, shortened to Is, Ra, El. The real promised land Moses spoke of exists between your ears. Acts 7.48 says, The Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. The only temples not built by human hands are the two temples behind your eyes, in front of your ears. As asked in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? The Bible is teaching through a series of stories how to be Christ-like, how to live one's life in a divine manner, and ultimately how to achieve Christ consciousness. Similarly, in Hinduism, the Vedas teach of Krishna, an avatar of their god, and by internalizing and meditating on the stories within, the devout disciple begins to develop Krishna consciousness. In Buddhism, Buddha's personal mission, and that of all Buddhist practitioners, is to achieve the highest state of human consciousness, which they call samadhi, nirvana, or enlightenment. These ancient religious scriptures personified gods to teach important lessons by analogy, exoterically presented as literal historical people, places, and events, but esoterically encoding symbolism, numerology, and allegories which revealed the original, true, and intended purpose of the scriptures. It was the same since the first Egyptian mystery schools up to the Masonic secret societies of today. The doctrine is presented exoterically in stories which can be read and understood on one level by the uninitiated masses, meanwhile esoterically encoding the deeper meanings which will only be recognized and learned by the initiated few. The reason Freemasons have 33 degrees is the same reason Jesus is said to have lived 33 years and performed 33 miracles. It is the same reason the first Temple of Solomon stood pristine for 33 years, and King Solomon had 3,300 officers. It is why King David reigned in Jerusalem for 33 years, and why the Seal of Solomon, or Star of David, is two intersecting triangles, two threes, or 33. It is the reason Jacob and Leah had 33 children, why in Leviticus 12.4, there were 33 days of purification, and in Genesis 46.15, there were 33 sons and daughters of Israel. It is the same reason why Kabbalah, the Jewish mystical system from which masonry's signs and symbols were derived, has exactly 33 elements in its tree of life, and the same reason why Atlas is your 33rd vertebrae. One of the earliest sects of Christianity, known as the Essenes, taught a system known as the 33 Nazareth Degrees of Enlightenment, whereby initiates underwent a series of ascetic austerities to attain spiritual gnosis. Included in their program was a vegan diet and regular fasting, two things also found in the Indian system of Kundalini Yoga. Associating one degree per vertebrae of the spine, the initiate raises the Kundalini serpent up the 33 permutations of the Tree of Life and opens the seven seals. This is why the 33rd degree Freemasons revere the letter G, the seventh letter of the alphabet, and hold it sacred above all others, associating it with God and Gnosis, the G even representing a spiral like coiled kundalini. A thorough investigation into numerology shows this esoteric system of spiritual initiation was nearly ubiquitous in bygone times. In ancient Vedic temple architecture, a sacred post was always placed between the sanctum sanctorum and the main altar made of a special type of wood covered with brass and having 33 rings around it. These represented the upright human spine and its 33 vertebrae, or as the Rig Veda calls, the 33 divinities. In Zoroastrianism, Ahura Mazda created the universe with the power of Yazashni using 33 steps. 
In Buddhism, according to the Lotus Sutra, Canon Bodhisattva has 33 transformations in order to perform his task of salvation. In Islam, 33 angels carry the praise of man to heaven, and of the 99 beautiful names of Allah, number 33 is Al-Azim, the supreme glory, the most grand. Ayacucha Huamanga, the religious capital of Peru, in the heart of the Andes, is known as the city of the 33 churches. During the Ming Dynasty, in 1413, Emperor Zhu Di had 33 Taoist temples built on the Chinese holy mountain Wudang. The Basilica of St. Peter in Rome has exactly 33 chapels, and the Vatican has 32 archways on each side of the courtyard with a giant obelisk in the middle, and the Pope's cassock has 32 buttons, with his head representing the 33rd. This is why the United Nations symbol is divided into 33 sections, why their general assembly room has exactly 33 lights, and why on 3303 the UN World Prayer Center called for everyone on earth to pray simultaneously at 3.30 p.m. It is even why in the system of Fahrenheit measurement, 33 is the first degree of temperature in which solid ice melts and liquid water is able to flow freely, like the 33rd degree free masons. Kundalini is represented by the serpent, an animal without legs, condemned to a life of slithering with its belly on the ground. An illuminated crown chakra, on the other hand, is often represented by a winged orb, as in the caduceus, a large bird, or a mythical half-bird, half-man able to fly. Both the serpent and bird are found in many mythologies, often depicted fighting one another, symbolizing the internal struggle within man to raise out of our lower nature and into higher consciousness. For example, Amazonian tribes speak of a central world tree inhabited by a large harpy eagle who is the enemy of giant serpentine beings connected with the underworld. In one story, their human hero takes feathers from the eagle and sticks them on his arms so that he can fly and steal life-saving medicine from the poisonous underworld serpents. Upon his success, the hero himself then transforms into a bird. In the Indian Puranas, there are fourteen worlds, divided into seven underworlds and seven overworlds. The Nagas are intelligent, poisonous, angry, serpentine beings who live in the lowest of the seven underworlds. Their sworn enemy is Garuda, a golden-bodied, half-bird, half-man hero who lives atop a gigantic Siba tree in the overworld. Similar to the Amazonian hero, in one story, Garuda steals the nectar of immortality from the Nagas, later destroying and eating them all. In Mongolian legend, the evil underworld snake Losi attempted to squirt poison from its fangs to end all life on earth. The human hero Otshirvani tried to kill Losi and failed, but then ascended Sumer Mountain, where he transformed into the birdman Garid. He was then able to catch Losi, wrap him three times around the mountain, crush his head, and kill him. In the Norse Eddas, the Midgard serpent lies in the midst of the ocean encompassing all the land and bites upon his own tail, while the gold-feathered bird Vidofnir sits perched on the topmost bough of the central world Yggdrasil tree. In their legend, the hero Odin sacrifices himself upon the Yggdrasil tree and gains many supernatural powers, including the ability to transform into any animal from lowly slithering snakes to high-flying birds. Native American totem poles are another example of this ancient spiritual symbolism. These tall pillars depicted characters from their various mythologies stacked vertically upon each other, usually seven in number, and topped with a winged bird. The Native American chief's feathered headdress echoes this too by specifically using bird feathers to represent the illuminated crown chakra. In these ancient cosmological stories, the microcosm is always merged with the macrocosm. The macrocosmic tree of life at the North Pole center of the world is analogous to the microcosmic branching cerebrospinal system at the center of our bodies. The world engirdling serpent circling the outermost perimeter of the macrocosm is analogous to the coiled kundalini around our lowermost chakra in the microcosm. And the heroic golden bird perched atop the central pillar of the macrocosm 
is analogous to the microcosmic illuminated crown chakra of an enlightened human being. So we ourselves are Atlas, king of our own microcosmic Atlantis, perched atop the 33rd vertebrae with our seven daughters dancing around the tree of life and the serpent laid on lying in wait. This is the microcosmic metaphorical Atlantis within us all. The macroscopic literal Atlantis, however, is our entire flat earth itself. The North Pole is the center point of flat Atlantis, with its surrounding land masses separated by the Arctic Ocean, making the first concentric circles of land and water. The second giant landmass consists of all six inhabited continents, separated again by the southern oceans, giving a second ring of land and water. Then the mountainous circumferential Antarctic region and whatever potentially exists beyond make for three concentric circles. This is why a collection of terrestrial maps is called an atlas. Famous cartographer Gerardus Mercator actually coined the term himself in the 16th century when he published his work in honor of the mythological Titan. As if by divine synchronicity, or perhaps his own embellishment, just as Atlas is our 33rd vertebrae, Mercator's North Pole map claims the central Rupus Nigra Sumeru Mountain happens to be exactly 33 miles in circumference. Another interesting note is that Atlas holding the world upon his shoulders is actually a complete misconception. Both in famous sculptures and the original stories, Atlas was never holding up a globular earth from underneath. Atlas holds up the heavens while standing on earth, and the globe upon his shoulders is the celestial sphere, otherwise known as the firmament. As the story goes, according to Ovid, Perseus traveled to Atlas's kingdom, declaring himself a son of Zeus and requested shelter. Atlas cautiously refused, fearing a prophecy that had warned a son of Zeus would one day steal the golden apples of immortality from his garden. Feeling slighted, Perseus turned the titan into a mountain range, with Atlas's head as the peak, his shoulders the ridges, and his hair the forests. It turns out the prophecy had nothing to do with Perseus, however, and it would be another son of Zeus, Heracles, Perseus's great-grandson, who would steal Atlas's golden apples of immortality. One of Heracles' twelve labors was to fetch the golden apples tended by the Hesperides and guarded by the serpent Ladon. Heracles approached Atlas and offered to hold up the heavens himself while Atlas retrieved the apples from his daughters. Little did Heracles know, anyone who voluntarily accepted the burden was doomed to carry the heavens on their shoulders themselves forever, or until someone else came along. Sensing something amiss with Atlas's eagerness to help, Heracles began suspecting he may have been tricked, and upon Atlas's return with the apples, hatched a new plan. He nonchalantly asked that Atlas quickly help hold the sky again for a moment while he rearranged his cloak to use as padding for his shoulders. Once Atlas set the apples down and picked the heavens up, Heracles swiftly snatched the apples for himself and ran away. In another version of the story, rather than trick Atlas, Heracles instead built two great pillars to uphold the sky and freed Atlas from his burden. Dr. William Warren wrote, We have elsewhere shown that in oldest Greek thought, Atlas belongs at the North Pole, and it is only reasonable to locate the kingdom of Atlas in the same locality. Secondly, some authorities have unconsciously placed Atlantis in just this polar position by identifying its inhabitants with the Hyperboreans. Thirdly, Apollodorus and Theopompus expressly call the lost land Meropia and its inhabitants Meropes, i.e., according to the above authorities, issued from Meru. Atlas's pillar, then, is the axis of the world. It is the same pillar apostrophized in the Egyptian document known as the Great Harris Magic Papyrus, in these unmistakable words, O long column, which commences in the upper and in the lower heavens, it is with scarce a doubt what the same ancient people in their Book of the Dead so happily styled the spine of the earth. It is the umbrella staff of the Burmese cosmology, the churning stick of India's gods and demons. It is the trunk of every cosmical tree. It is the shadowless lance of Alexander, the tortoise-piercing, earth-piercing arrow of the Mongolian heaven god, the spear of Izanagi, the Hacha de Cabre on which the heavens of the Miztecs rested. 
It is the cord which the ancient Vedic bard saw stretched from one extremity of the universe to the other. Is it not the psalmist's line of the heavens which is gone out through the very earth and on to the end of the world? It is the Ermensil of the Germans, as expressly recognized by Grimm. It is the Tower of Kronos. It is Plato's spindle of necessity. It is the Azakol of the North African Sunnis. It is the ladder with seven lamps in the rites of Mithra. It is the Talmudic pillar which connects the paradise celestial and the paradise terrestrial. In the Egyptian version of this mythology, the Atlas character is named Shu, and his son and daughter were named Jeb and Nut, the god of earth and goddess of the sky. Since childhood, Jeb and Nut were inseparable, spending all their time together, and developed an incestuous relationship. Resolving to put an end to this, Shu caught them in the act and stood between the two forever separating them. This act in turn created duality in the manifest world, above and below, dark and light, good and evil. Many other mythological figures have also historically been represented this way, with their feet touching the earth and their head or hands holding up the heavens. For example, the Samoan god, Te'iti, was said to push up the heavens, causing footholds six feet deep into the rocks. The Finnish god Ukko was also tasked with holding up the firmament. The angel Sandalphon from the Jewish Mishnah, according to Rabbi Eliezer, standeth on earth and reacheth with his head to the door of heaven. The god Indra from the Rig Veda, the supporter and sustainer of the world, who has upheld the earth and heaven and the firmament, is another version of this myth. Richard Thompson wrote, Thus the vertical axis of the universe is made to correspond to the personal form of the Lord. An analogy is sometimes made between this axis, with its graded series of heavens, and the spinal chakras on which yogis meditate. In this analogy, Bhumandala corresponds to the lowest chakra, and Satyaloka corresponds to the thousand-petaled Brahmarandra at the top of the head. The lower worlds corresponding to the legs of the universal form do not play a role in this analogy, but the serpent Anantasesa may correspond to the Kundalini at the base of the spine. In his essay on Indian cartography, Joseph Schwartzberg described one way in which the analogy between the spine and the cosmic axis is used in the process of meditation. By contemplating this analogy, meditators further the process by which one's self becomes a microcosm that fuses and becomes one with the enveloping macrocosm. One's spine then becomes the meru, or axis mundi, of both. Arrayed along the spine are various centers of psychic energy that one summons up in the practice of yoga in moving toward the supremely illuminated samadhi state. These energy centers may be viewed as the psychophysiological analogs of the heavens that the soul transverses on its path to ultimate liberation. In the microcosm, the Atlantean pillar is your spine, whereas in the macrocosm, it is the axis mundi, the invisible vertical line from the North Pole to Polaris. In the microcosm, the seven Hesperides are your chakras, dancing around your spine all day, whereas in the macrocosm, they are the seven stars of the Great Bear, the closest constellation to Polaris, encircling it every night. In the microcosm, the serpent is Kundalini, whereas in the macrocosm, it is the serpent's constellation, with its head separated from its tail, thanks to Garuda, Garide, and the other celestial birdman heroes. In all these cosmological conceptions, the Axis Mundi is personified as a god or poetically described as a majestic pillar, a world tree, or a gigantic mountain range, supporting the heavens and establishing the pivot on which they revolve. In ancient Sanskrit yogic texts, the spine is actually called Meru Danda, which shows the purposefulness of this analogy. A literal mountain, tree, pillar, or abode of gods may or may not actually exist at the center of earth, but the spiritual allegory was somehow ubiquitous in bygone times, even amongst supposedly uncontacted civilizations. Likewise, whether or not a literal worldwide flood ever once occurred destroying Flatlantis, a metaphorical flood of amnesia has all but eliminated humanity's knowledge of these once universally known subjects like Kundalini and Flat Earth.
What exactly is this kundalini serpent energy that rises up our 33 vertebrae tree of life? And what are these supposed seven chakra wheels of light? What is all this symbolism actually pointing towards? Harajat Khalsa wrote, The ancient yogis and sages who developed kundalini yoga had a deep respect for the creator of this human body. They knew in their profound devotion and worship that so perfect a creator could only have created perfection in design, function, and potential. Based on this respect, they sought knowledge of the totality of the human being. They researched the human ability to maintain good health, increase vitality, open consciousness, and expand the experience of the excellence of human life. Their research gave them a great understanding of the nervous system, glandular system, organ system, energy system, and brain. They learned how blood, nerves, muscles, organs, and glands all work together. They investigated the seen and the unseen, and the interrelationships between the physical and the subtle. From this research, they developed Kundalini Yoga. Kundalini Yoga is a highly evolved technology based on a thorough understanding of the ecology of the human body, how the breath affects the thinking, how the angle of a finger affects the pituitary gland. This technology works with the systems of the human body using the body's own means. Hand position, breath, posture, sound, and motion are employed in various ways to create the optimum balance among all the body's components. Until recent times, these techniques had been secret, taught only to a chosen few. When babies are born, their entire 33 vertebrae spinal column is loose, flexible, and independently operating. By adolescence, however, the first four vertebrae begin fusing into a single unit known as the cossacks, and by early adulthood, the next five vertebrae fully fuse into another single unit known as the sacrum. No longer able to move about freely and independently, various processes of the cerebrospinal system become constricted and deregulated, such as the relaxation response, hormone production, and the flow of spinal fluid. Ancient yogis also taught that the root of individuated consciousness, the divine essence within man, originates at our first chakra point, the perineum, nestled and stuck by the many fused vertebrae. This kundalini energy desires to travel upward along the spine, illuminating the seven chakra centers and resulting in a fully realized, individuated, enlightened being. Since the awakening of kundalini requires extensive initiation, including meditation, breathing practices, advanced stretching, a plant-based diet, chastity, and other austerities, the majority of humanity remains unaware of this powerful, transformative energy to their own physical and spiritual detriment. Kundalini energy desires to climb our trees of life, but finds itself trapped by our fused lower vertebrae. So esotericists have long symbolized this with a serpent coiled around an egg three and a half times. In order to uncoil the serpent from its nest egg and allow Kundalini to rise up the tree of life, the initiate must sincerely dedicate themselves to a variety of holistic, healthful practices and self-discovery through asceticism and introspection, which will begin the process of ascension. As Kundalini ascends, one by one, the seven main energy centers of the body become illuminated, meaning the physiological and psycho-spiritual processes associated with each chakra become optimized. These seven energy centers, all of which are located along the cerebrospinal column, corresponding directly to a major nerve ganglia, endocrine gland, or internal organ, and have actually been measured electromagnetically to produce tenfold stronger biofields than non-chakra points. They each have physiological manifestations related to their location in the physical body, but also extend into the energy body, affecting us emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually as well. Muladhara, the red root chakra, is located in the perineum and relates to the gonads, adrenal medulla, and the pubococcygis muscle that controls ejaculation. Psychologically, the root chakra controls security, survival, and the fight-or-flight response. Swadhisthana, the orange sacral chakra, is located in the sacrum and relates to the testes or ovaries, the genitourinary system, and the adrenals. Psychologically, the sacral chakra controls sexuality, relationships, violence, addictions, pleasure, creativity, and enthusiasm. 
Manapura, the yellow solar plexus chakra, is located in the solar plexus and relates to the metabolic and digestive systems, the pancreas and adrenal cortex. Psychologically, the solar plexus chakra controls power, will, fear, and anxiety. Anahata, the green heart chakra, is located at the thymus in the middle of the chest and relates to the immune, circulatory, and endocrine systems responsible for fending off disease, blood flow, and maturation of T-cells. Psychologically, the heart chakra controls love, compassion, rejection, equilibrium, and well-being. Vishuddha, the blue throat chakra, is located at the thyroid, which produces the thyroid hormone responsible for growth and maturation. Psychologically, the throat chakra is related to communication and growth through expression. Ajna, the indigo third eye chakra, is located at the pineal gland, the precise geometric center of the brain. The pineal gland is light sensitive and produces melatonin, which regulates sleep and dream states. Psychologically, the third eye chakra is related to intuition and clarity of mind. Sahasrara, the violet crown chakra, is located at the crown of the head and relates to the pituitary gland, which secretes hormones to control the endocrine system and connects to the central nervous system via the hypothalamus. Psychologically, the crown chakra is related to beingness, pure consciousness, and karma. Irvin Laszlo wrote, Of the seven primary chakras that are deemed to mediate the awareness and energies of our personal energy field, five are considered to align primarily along the main meridians up our spine. One is between and slightly above our eye level, and the last sits at the crown of our head. Associated with nerve plexuses and the endocrine system of our bodies, which secretes and regulates hormonal balances, the chakras, as viewed by Eastern traditions, have a primary role in the mediation of consciousness. The electronic recordings of the human biofield were found to be strongest over the chakras. When the signal from the nervous system's alternating field was filtered out, at the frequencies above 500 cycles per second, the continuous low-intensity direct field seemed to be around 10 times as high as the field through which the body's nervous system is controlled, although its intensity is less than half that of a resting muscle. In the 1990s, scientist Itzhak Bentoff studied kundalini from an engineering perspective and hypothesized that traditional yogic practices were actually advanced methods for stimulating endocrine glands to release higher amounts of hormones, endorphins, and endogenous DMT, which directly caused the raising of consciousness. Bentov found the 7.5 Hz oscillation rhythm of the heart affect frequencies in the brain and create the stimulus equivalent of a current loop. In other words, the current homogenizes brain hemisphere activity, which in turn optimizes the secretion and flow of various bodily chemicals and fluids along the cerebrospinal system, causing an upgrade in both health and consciousness. Bentov also theorized that this made the body an effective antenna for the 7.5 Hz frequency, which just so happens to be the resonant frequency of the ionosphere, and could potentially be a mechanism allowing heightened intuition by literally picking up and gleaning information from the ether. Dr. Lee Sanella wrote, A new center, presently dormant in the average man or woman, has to be activated, and a more powerful stream of psychic energy must rise into the head from the base of the spine to enable the human consciousness to transcend the normal limits. This is the final phase of the present evolutionary impulse in man. The cerebrospinal system of man has to undergo a radical change, enabling consciousness to transcend the limits of the highest intellect. Here, reason yields to intuition, and revelation appears to guide the steps of humankind. This mechanism, known as Kundalini, is the real cause of all so-called spiritual and psychic phenomena, the biological basis of evolution and development of personality, the secret origin of all esoteric and occult doctrines, the master key to the unsolved mystery of creation, the inexhaustible source of philosophy, art, and science, and the fountainhead of all religious faiths, past, present, and future. Julius Evola wrote, Yoga techniques aim at revealing the spiritual corporeity to a clear and alert consciousness. This involves an expansion of consciousness itself and its development into a superconsciousness that replaces those forms of impaired and dulled consciousness. I would like to suggest at this point 
that some absurd psychoanalytical interpretations of yoga are circulated in the West by people who are extremely ignorant of even the most basic principles of yoga. According to these interpretations, yoga is supposed to induce hypnotic or trance-like states, like those experienced by a medium, that are below rather than above the level of ordinary waking consciousness. Exactly the opposite happens to be true. I have personally been training and teaching various forms of yoga, including kundalini, pranayama, and hatha, for two decades and can attest to the myriad benefits enjoyed by dedicated practitioners. Regular yoga practice has been proven to relieve stress, general body aches, pains, and anxiety, and depression, increase stamina, lung capacity, core strength, mindfulness, mental clarity and focus, improve posture, poise, and patience, promote longevity and cellular regeneration, boost energy levels, elevate mood, release happiness endorphins, improve digestion, assimilation and elimination, aid in deeper sleep, and elicit the relaxation response. Beyond these benefits gained by practitioners of all forms of yoga, the pinnacle state and intended achievement of the specific discipline known as kundalini yoga is the rising of this energy from the base of the spine to the top of the head in what is termed a kundalini experience, or a kundalini awakening. At the age of 25, after training in yoga for seven years, and during a particularly diligent stint where I was practicing several hours daily, one fateful afternoon, I had the extreme pleasure and privilege of experiencing a kundalini awakening myself. So what is meant by a kundalini experience, or kundalini awakening? Some signs and symptoms of experiencing a typical kundalini awakening include fiery or electrical sensations rising up the spinal column, internal sounds like a hum, buzz, or ringing in one's ears, body shaking, jerking, or convulsions, severe emotional swings from extreme bliss to inconsolable sadness, personal and interpersonal realizations and revelations, visual and auditory hallucinations or hypersensitivities, and waves of intense joy, contentment, and fulfillment. These initial effects of successfully awakening kundalini are short-lived, however, and generally appear and disappear again within a number of hours. Under proper spiritual guidance and with adequate physical preparation, the entire process should be very positive and beneficial, but without the necessary guidance and preparedness, kundalini awakening too early can have detrimental effects as well. Signs and symptoms of premature kundalini awakening include acute pains, fevers or chills, fits and seizures, migraines, respiratory or heart problems, bipolar mood swings, anxiety, fear, and paranoia. Dr. Lawrence Edwards, founder of the Kundalini Support Organization, stated, The purification process of this energy transformation can bring up latent disease, muscle spasms, joint problems, and digestive problems. People can go through all kinds of things, hot flashes and sweats, numbing sensations, all kinds of things that can happen that aren't the most pleasant. Luckily, nowadays, there are dozens of excellent books and countless trained teachers available to safely and effectively guide initiates in the raising of kundalini, so that with adequate preparation, such negative experiences need not be risked or endured. On the contrary, a proper kundalini awakening can and should be one of the most positive, fulfilling, and satisfying experiences ever, with after-effects that last a lifetime. Tantra teacher Kara Lee Grant wrote that, When kundalini awakens, a person may experience deeper empathy with others, and this empathy can almost become telepathic. There is greater sensitivity, higher energy levels, sometimes psychic abilities or deep knowing. Aging can appear to slow down, creativity and charisma can increase, as can internal peace and knowing. There is a sense of being part of all that is. The greater mysteries of life are no longer mysteries. There are various systems and exercises within kundalini yoga which prepare the body for and aim to induce the kundalini awakening process. Exactly how and when each individual will successfully achieve it depends on several subjective factors, making the journey different for everyone. In general, however, the process takes a number of years and involves advanced stretching, particularly of the spinal column, pranayama deep breathing practices, vipassana meditation, a plant-based diet, water fasting, enemas or colonics, saltwater sinus cleansing with neti pot, 
chastity or complete celibacy, and several other specific austerities and practices. One of the main prerequisites for unlocking kundalini, and the biggest obstacle I have found for most students, is physically stretching, loosening, decompressing, relaxing, and cracking every vertebrae in their spine, and ultimately every joint in their body. In fact, it was through that very pursuit that I personally stumbled upon initiating my own kundalini experience. I had heard of kundalini yoga, and even incorporated some of its techniques into my daily hatha and pranayama practice, but at the time had never heard the term kundalini awakening, or kundalini experience. Thankfully, I actually managed to trigger a complete and safe awakening without any negative consequences and without the guidance of a personal instructor. Since then, I have learned much more about the process and helped many of my own yoga students achieve similar results. During my hatha training, I began noticing that as I stretched and loosened my back through various poses, eventually and inevitably, once each section of my spine had decompressed and relaxed thoroughly enough, I would be rewarded with a new crack or pop. By this I mean the kind of joint cracking or popping which chiropractic doctors perform on their patients. The difference being that when gradually stretched and loosened over time through yoga until each vertebrae naturally cracks on its own, rather than being forced by a chiropractor, the experience feels like receiving a master key, unlocking a door in your spine, because you gain the ability forever thereafter to comfortably crack each vertebrae yourself. Scientifically speaking, the cracking sound results from releasing synovial gases from articular capsules. Synovial fluid lubricates each joint in the body, and through movement over time causes bubbles of synovial gas to form. When the joint is cracked, the articular capsule is stretched sufficiently to release the gas and allow it to return as synovial fluid. After a few hours, synovial gas bubbles will begin forming again, and the joint can be cracked again. If you have never cracked a joint before, and especially if forced, it can be a fairly unpleasant or even painful experience. But if properly prepared through yogic practice, and allowed to naturally pop through specific poses, cracking your joints is incredibly relaxing and simultaneously invigorating. Conflicting with what your mother may have told you, joint cracking is not unhealthy, nor does it cause any permanent swelling or other problems. Quite the contrary, joint cracking is a very healthful and beneficial practice especially when each joint is slowly stretched over time until naturally occurring. Nowadays, I personally cannot not crack my joints because just the act of getting out of bed in the morning causes over a dozen pops sounding like someone setting off fireworks. When I first began practicing yoga, however, I had never even cracked my knuckles before. Once I began receiving the skeleton keys to unlock each joint, I really enjoyed the subtle relaxing energy pulsations that came with every pop and made it a mission to unlock my entire body. It took me several years, but I now possess the master skeleton key to my temple, and can crack every single joint, including every vertebrae in my spine and neck, all three knuckles on each finger, thumbs, wrists, elbows, shoulders, hips, knees, ankles, toes, and my personal favorite, the sternum. The fused cossacks and sacrum cannot crack, but the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar vertebra can, with the partially fused lower lumbar vertebra requiring the most body work to unfuse and unlock. Now, as I stated, during this part of my personal yoga journey, I was unfamiliar with the concept of kundalini awakening, but had simply noticed and enjoyed the energetic sensation of joint popping so much that I made it a personal challenge to sufficiently stretch and loosen each joint until I could crack my whole body. For me, the final and most difficult vertebra to loosen were the lower lumbars, but I found that by hanging upside down using an inversion table, tree limb, or playground bar for spinal decompression, along with perfecting the halasana and kamapadasana poses, allowed me to unlock and crack every unfused vertebrae. Now for some people, kundalini may be triggered and rise without necessarily being able to crack every joint in their body. But for me, the moment I unlocked that final vertebrae of my spine was the beginning of my kundalini experience. I could instantly feel a fiery electrical sensation pulsating at the base of my spine, slowly gaining intensity and beginning to rise higher towards my back. I could instantly feel a fiery electrical sensation pulsating at the base of my spine, slowly gaining intensity and beginning to rise higher towards my lower back. I began to sweat, 
saw visual energy trails, and felt a steady building of euphoria reminiscent of coming up on a magic mushroom or LSD trip. As the electric fire continued rising towards my heart, I had several deep and transformative revelations about myself and my relationships, which caused extreme emotional fluctuations, from sobbing uncontrollably to laughing uncontrollably. When the energy reached my neck and continued ascending, there was a building internal pressure making it feel like my head was going to explode. Finally, the electrical fire engulfed my entire head and torso, and I had the extreme pleasure of experiencing for hours the highest high imaginable without taking any drugs. I laid on my bed euphoric, laughing hysterically, lightly flailing and flopping my arms and legs around, feeling the same kind of body high and hypersensitivity to touch characteristic of the drug ecstasy. The entire experience was like having the positive effects of all the best drugs in the world hitting you simultaneously and completely naturally. After several hours of perfect bliss, the feelings slowly subsided and normal life returned, but something deep within me changed forever thereafter. Within months I committed myself to veganism and ahimsa nonviolence, which led me to voluntarism and ultimately to researching and discovering the conspiratorial control of humanity outlined ever since in my books and videos. It was then that I dedicated my life to exposing the truth and vowed never to stop my activism until the New World Order dies, or I do. Anyone who knew me before and after my Kundalini experience in 2007 would confirm that a radical transformation occurred during this time where I fully came into my own. I felt debilitating pangs of empathy for the suffering of people in war-torn countries and animals in factory farms. It is this compassion for all sentient beings that led me to become the dedicated vegan voluntarist truth activist that I am today. There are theories that kundalini awakening increases endogenous endorphin, hormone, and DMT production, both temporarily and long-term, and that bursts of them could very well explain all the psychedelic, ecstatic phenomena. I also have my own pet theory that compressed vertebra and synovial gas buildup impedes the proper flow of cerebrospinal fluid and the many essential chemicals contained therein, and that this is why loosening and cracking the spine is so important for optimum health and kundalini awakening. The exact science and reasoning remains shrouded in mystery, but hopefully in the future further experiments will enhance our understanding. In the Japanese Zen tradition, the culmination of years of seated Zazen meditation practice is said to sometimes produce a temporary state of extreme bliss known as Kensho, which is precisely reminiscent of yoga's Kundalini experience, as well as ecstatic states achieved on various entheogens or psychedelics. Similar to the latent coiled energy of Kundalini, Zen teaches that ordinary man is unenlightened burdened by ego, and must overcome this human condition through silent stillness. Regularly and intentionally ceasing the stream of incessant thought via meditation allows the brain waking access to the rare cortical theta and delta states usually only achieved during sleep. By quieting the monkey mind of unrelenting thoughts and altering consciousness through deep breathing techniques, a kensho or kundalini experience can be triggered even without the yogic bodywork described previously. This ecstatic, euphoric experience, while incredible and worth striving for, should not be seen as the end goal of yogic or Zen training, but rather like a well-deserved reward along the path, letting the practitioner know they are heading in the right direction. Zen master Katsuki Sakita asks in his book Zen Training Methods and Philosophy, if Kensho was the ultimate aim of Zen training, why not simply take drugs to achieve the same condition? He insists that repeated experience of the state of absolute samadhi is the true essential requirement and ultimate aim of such mindfulness practice, not Kensho. Sakita writes that, Kensho has been presented as the ultimate aim, but Zen training continues endlessly. To cast off the delusive way of ordinary consciousness while sitting on a cushion in a quiet room is only the beginning. For many, perhaps, there has been something unattractive in the notion, not infrequently conveyed, of the Zen student as a person who subjects himself to a prolonged, highly disciplined form of training, usually in the artificial conditions of a monastery, 
in order to undergo some kind of private revelatory experience. The student must learn to live in the ordinary world while yet retaining the quality of his experience of absolute samadhi. So the Kensho or Kundalini experience should not be viewed as the end goal or final product of meditation and yoga, but more like a signpost that the practitioner has reached a certain level, similar to martial arts students receiving their black belt. A black belt does not mean martial training is complete or that the practitioner has reached their peak. Far from it, the receiving of one's black belt simply means they have completed all the basics and are now ready to spend a lifetime perfecting them. On the spiritual path, our main focuses should be the blossoming of compassion, the dissolution of the ego, the refinement of character, and other loftier pursuits than a mere Kensho or Kundalini experience. In Christian esotericism, there are the concepts of seven levels of heaven, seven levels of hell, seven deadly sins, and seven heavenly virtues, which directly correspond with the seven yoga chakras. For Kundalini to rise, the yogi cleanses and opens his chakras through a process of not only physiological, but also psychological self-development, composed of seven steps, each belonging to a physical location in the body. For example, the first root chakra, related to security and survival, when closed, corresponds to the deadly sin of greed, but when opened, corresponds to the heavenly virtue of generosity. The second sacral chakra, related to sexuality and relationships, when closed, corresponds to the deadly sin of lust, but when opened, corresponds to the heavenly virtue of chastity. Thus, a selfless person who sincerely and diligently develops all seven virtues helps open themselves up to kundalini awakening and is allowed access to the seven heavens, whereas a selfish person who completely and unremorsefully indulges in all seven vices conversely closes themselves off from kundalini and finds themselves in hell. The concept of seven heavens and seven hells is nearly ubiquitous in the world's religions. Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism all reference this idea and color it with connotations of the afterlife. In the microcosm, we create our own personal heavens and hells based on our developments of virtues or indulgence in vices. In the macrocosm, these life choices and character traits are then corresponded with afterlife worlds, seven ascending levels of heaven or seven descending levels of hell depending on each individual's karma. For example, in the ancient Mesopotamian religion, earth was presented as a flat disk covered by seven domes each one containing different celestial bodies. These corresponded to the macroscopic seven heavens, whereas the seven chakras within the individual corresponded to the microscopic seven heavens. These also mesh and correspond quite well with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which place upon a series of steps the various physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual necessities for a fully developed, fully realized human being. Just like the yoga chakra system and the esoteric Christian system, Maslow's hierarchy begins with base physiological needs, like food and water at the bottom, then safety needs, like being secure from danger. Near the heart chakra, we find belonging needs, like being loved and accepted, along with esteem needs, like being recognized and respected. As we reach the higher chakras, we find cognitive needs, like knowledge and exploration, as well as aesthetic needs like order and beauty. Then, once all the lower physical, emotional, and psychological needs have been met, finally, the crown chakra of self-actualization, the spiritual work of finding self-fulfillment and realizing one's true potential, can begin. Just as the rising kundalini relates to the seven virtues and seven heavens, Gnostic mystics like Samuel Ann War and George Gurdjieff wrote of the kunda buffer and its relation to the seven vices and seven hells. War posited that just as virtuous practice causes the ascending serpent of Kundalini to travel upwards from the apex of the sacrum, the negative indulgences in vices contrarily causes the descending Kunda buffer serpent to travel downwards into the Cossacks, the tail of Satan. In his book, The Elimination of Satan's Tail, and many others, he details the parallels between Christianity and yoga, and describes the karmic self-development necessary 
to become a fully realized and enlightened human being. John Phillips wrote, The enterprising mariner who ventured first from the shelter of the shore to steer their flimsy vessels out of sight of land were haunted by many superstitious fears. One of those was the legendary Lodestone Mountain that had the power, they thought, to seize a vessel against all the tug of wind and tide and draw it to destruction on its shores. Sin is a Lodestone Mountain. We feel ourselves drawn by that mountain, against all the counter-pull of effort and resolve, until we are shipwrecked on its shores. The Christian seven deadly sins and seven heavenly virtues are just one spiritual system, one set of karmic suggestions, but certainly one well worth considering. There are different ideas about which sins and virtues directly apply to which chakras, but the exact ordering is far less important than the overall moral message. The first deadly sin, related to the root chakra of security and survival, is greed or avarice, which is the inordinate or insatiable desire for material gain, such as money, status, and power, beyond what is necessary or deserved. Greedy people may increase their material gains through such a vice, but they will never make any spiritual gains or succeed in developing the first heavenly virtue, generosity, which naturally appears once one renounces and repents the sin of greed. Generosity, also known as charity or largesse, is the virtue of being unattached to material possessions and sharing selflessly. The second deadly sin, related to the sacral chakra of sexuality and relationships, is lust, the intense sexual desire for people or situations purely for personal pleasure. The wanton ejaculation of our most sacred life-giving substance is ill-advised and a subject too deep to delve into here, but suffice to say, anyone serious about improving both their physiological and psychological well-being should try to abstain from masturbation and promiscuity. By doing so, and effectively renouncing and repenting from the sin of lust, the heavenly virtue of chastity naturally arises. Chastity is sexual purity, achieved either through celibacy, through tantra, and or a loving partner. The third deadly sin, related to the solar plexus chakra of willpower, self-discipline, and self-esteem, is sloth. Also known as acedia or apathy, sloth is the habitual disinclination to exertion, or quite simply, laziness. It is characterized by the neglect of one's responsibilities and related to melancholy and depression. By renouncing and repenting the deadly sin of sloth, however, the heavenly virtue of diligence is able to manifest. Diligence is defined as carefulness and persistent effort in one's duties, a good work ethic. The fourth deadly sin related to the heart chakra of love, compassion, and acceptance, is wrath, uncontrolled feelings of anger, rage, or hatred. Wrath usually reveals itself in the wish to seek revenge. The vengeful, spiteful person, under the grips of wrath, tends to be not only aggressive and violent to others, but self-destructive through things like drug and alcohol abuse or suicide. One who renounces and repents the deadly sin of wrath manifests the heavenly virtue of patience, or forbearance. Patience is the level of endurance one can have before succumbing to negativity, tolerance in the face of provocation, without responding in anger or annoyance, and the ability to endure difficult circumstances without hastiness or impetuousness. The fifth deadly sin, related to the throat chakra of growth and expression, is gluttony, the overindulgence or overconsumption of food, drink, and other consumables. The so-called fat acceptance movement might as well be called the gluttonous entitlement or addiction acceptance movement. Once a glutton renounces and repents their sin, however, they can begin to develop the virtue of temperance. Temperance is moderation, balance, and voluntary self-restraint. Restraint from retaliation through forgiveness, restraint from arrogance through modesty, restraint from excesses through prudence, and restraint from cravings and addictions through calmness and self-control. The sixth deadly sin, related to the third eye chakra of intuition and wisdom, is envy, which, similar to greed and lust, is characterized by insatiable desire. 
Envy is sadness or anger at seeing another's good fortune. Resentful covetousness towards the possessions or traits of someone else. Once fully renounced and repented, however, the sin of envy transforms into the virtue of gratitude. Gratefulness or thankfulness is the feeling of appreciation felt and shown for one's life and to the givers of kindness, help, or gifts. The seventh deadly sin, related to the crown chakra of beingness and karma, is pride or hubris, having an irrationally high sense of one's personal value, status, or accomplishments, failing to acknowledge the accomplishments of others, and believing oneself fundamentally superior to others. Pride can also have a positive connotation, however, referring to an appropriate sense of esteem for one's own or another's choices and actions, which is certainly not a sin, making hubris a more accurate term. Once hubris is overcome, renounced, and repented, the heavenly virtue of humility can be developed. Humility is quite simply being humble. It is the opposite of narcissism, having low self-preoccupation and low self-regard, but without being self-deprecating. Unconsciously allowing ourselves to engage in sinful thoughts and behaviors disconnects us from our higher chakras, prevents us from developing real integrity, and restricts our ability to become truly virtuous human beings. Consciously ceasing sinful thoughts and behaviors, however, connects us to our higher chakras, aids us in developing integrity, and allows access to virtue and veritable enlightenment. Beyond this, all the world's religious systems have some conception and promise of karma or divine judgment, whereby individuals are guaranteed a heavenly or hellish afterlife based on our actions here. Why carelessly continue indulgence in vices and sinful actions at the expense of virtue, integrity, and potentially eternity? Literalist Christians read the Bible, and specifically the book of Revelations, as an ominous doomsday prophecy whereby humanity's highest virtue, and the only answer to evil, is waiting around until a half-god, half-man literally floats down from the clouds to save them and the world. They believe the devil will bring hell on earth for seven years of great tribulation with literal tortures worse than any horror movie, and that it is inevitable. But if they simply believe in Jesus, have a priest dunk their heads underwater, and or say a prayer accepting Christ into their hearts, that these acts are sufficient enough in the eyes of God for them to be timely teleported up to heaven with the other literalist Christians and spared the horrific tortures destined for all non-believers. If read with understanding of the spiritual symbology, numerology, and allegories purposely encoded, however, the true, deeper meaning of revelations is revealed. Once again, the author is imploring for humanity to awaken Kundalini and their seven chakras, to renounce vices and develop virtues, to disassociate with their lower carnal ego desires in order to access a higher level of spiritual consciousness. Revelations 120 states that the mystery of the seven stars which thou saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou saw are the seven churches. The meaning of the seven churches and seven candlesticks certainly remains a mystery for those unaware of kundalini yoga and the chakra system. But for anyone acquainted with this ancient symbolism, the only mystery is why the masses continue to misinterpret these scriptures as literal doomsday prophecies. Revelations 4-5 reads, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. This is another clear description of the fiery electrical force of Kundalini rising through the seven chakras, for those with ears to hear and eyes to see. Revelations 5, 1 and 2 reads, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof? This is a call to action for any who wish to be truly free and saved from the addictions of the lower mind and egoistic desires. The angel with a loud voice is your higher self, calling you to look within and on the backside, and to loose the seven seals, 
for as long as Kundalini remains asleep and dormant, coiled around the root chakra, humanity is doomed to subsisting in a carnal, chaotic, materialistic condition. The chakras are referred to as seals, which require loosening, because in humanity's current condition we are not born with fully open and active chakras. Instead, we are born with original sin and seven seals, and only by awakening kundalini to clean out the emotional baggage and mental blockages from our collective unconscious can we rise above the fallen state. Only by renouncing and repenting from vices, addictions, and materialistic desires can the ego dissolve and break the seven seals. Revelations is imploring the reader to take responsibility for our spiritual growth and not to simply wait for Satan to bring hell in a handbasket. The great and terrible day of the Lord, promised in Revelations, that literalist Christians are so simultaneously dreading and welcoming, both scared and excited for, must be the most grossly misunderstood allegory in the Bible. The seven years of trials and tribulations are not some fatalistic prophecy of humanity's ultimate demise, but rather an epic allegory of the death throes of the ego and the lower carnal mind upon opening the seven seals. Likewise, the great and terrible day of the Lord is nothing but the final dissolution of the ego and the death of one's lower self. According to ancient esoteric thought, each chakra contains spiritual life lessons, and as Kundalini rises, certain trials and tribulations are inevitable. But by inviting and transcending them, we successfully raise our consciousness to progressively more enlightened states. This is the true rapture and second coming, the real baptism of being born again, the awakening of Kundalini by purifying your temple to house Christ consciousness within. Genesis is about the generation of the higher self, a metaphorical manual for spiritual development, and Revelations is only a death sentence for the lower self, an epic obituary for the ego. All the world's religious scriptures are pointing towards and pleading with humanity to awaken this latent power within. From the oldest known mythologies like Atlantis, to the newest New Age philosophies like Theosophy, the repeated symbology, numerology, and allegories throughout disparate cultures and times tells a meta-narrative that only the well-researched or initiated will see. For the ignorant, indoctrinated masses, a combination of pseudoscience and religious literalism has most believing themselves to be either hairless apes spinning on a fantasy cartoon ball, or helpless victims of a vengeful, deterministic god who requires constant praise and submission. For those of us knowledgeable and acquainted with the reality of Flatlantis, however, the very concept of belief becomes antiquated and unnecessary, permanently replaced by common sense, evidence, experience, and endless exploration.